Atlantic City is on the verge of that being flooded, is mentioned included, and alhamdulillah, they, that fortunately that the water stopped short and it didn't get into the mosque. They had to move a lot of the furniture up so that it didn't uh, flood, but uh, may Allah Ta'ala protect him and his mosque and uh, make him a beacon of light uh, for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, solely to bless him in all of his different affairs. So I'll be taking over his class for him today and tomorrow, and then he'll be back on Thursday. But to keep the ball rolling, and to, inshallah ta'ala, and hopefully expose ourselves to the sweet breezes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, we will help in this endeavor of introducing this great work of Imam Abu Hamid Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Ghazali titled Bidayat al-Hidayat The Beginning of Guidance and as is the case with every good title is that it is indicative of what is in the work and so there's two words in the title Bidayat and al-Hidayat Bada yabda'u means to begin something and so what this is teaching us, this title, is that this is the beginning. This is where we start. And this is the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His creation. Is that He has decreed that things have beginnings and they have ends. And not everything that you start do you finish. And one of the, our Lord, He is the Rabb. He is the giver of tarbiyah. He is the one subhanahu wa ta'ala who that brings about a beginning and also that nurtures that thing all along the way until that it bears fruit and it comes to fruition and brings about its end as well. He brings about its end as well, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that this relates to creation as a whole. It has a beginning and it will have an end. This relates to the uh, cycle that we find of the four seasons and things that come back to life and then that they end up dying and then they come back to life and they reach maturity and then they die and then they come back to life and so forth. And this also relates to the cycles of the human life, is that human beings have a beginning and they have an end. But the most important cycle and the most important beginning, the most important end relates to the spiritual life, is that we hope that there is a beginning because not everyone has a beginning, not everyone has a birth of the spiritual life. And then not everyone has a birth in the spiritual life that reaches spiritual maturity. And not everyone who reaches spiritual maturity reaches the fruit. And re not everyone reaches the end of the spiritual path, which is ultimately a knowledge of Allah. Indeed, unto your Lord is the ultimate end. And so this word is significant because this is about the beginning. The beginning of what? The most important thing of all, which is hidayah, guidance. That is something that we ask for in the Qur'an after saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and after praising Allah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. Iyaka na'amburu wa iyaka nasta'in, ihdina sirat mustaqim. We're asking Allah to guide us to the straight path, ihdina, it's a talab of hidayah. You're asking for hidayah, you're asking for guidance. And what is understood from the idea of guidance is that someone is going somewhere, someone is traveling somewhere. There is a path. And just as outwardly we have different courses in our life, in our lives, is that likewise there's a spiritual course. And the nature of the spiritual path is that it is not linear. Is that from our perspective we have all these twists and turns and things that we don't expect to happen. But internally, that if we respond to the twists and turns and the vicissitudes of life in a way that is pleasing to Allah, is that our spiritual path will be linear in the sense that it will that lead to progression and that we will constantly get closer and closer to our goal, which is to attain knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what Imam al that sets out to do in this work is to give us the beginning of guidance, those things that we need while we take the path, the prerequisites for us to achieve the goal at the end of path, at the end of the path. And so hidayah is a word that we should feel very close to, and it is something that we should ask Allah to add a for constantly. And one of the names of the Quran is Al-Huda, 
It is the guidance. Everything in the Quran, every verse of the Quran, every word in the Quran, every letter in the Quran, everything in the Quran is guidance. That ultimately points to the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It points to the knowledge that the human being can attain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after titling his book in this way, is that he's going to begin as that all books of Islam do with Bismillahir Rahman ar Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And then he's going to praise Allah. Alhamdulillahi Hakka Hamdihi. All praise be to Allah as much as is his right to be praised. And the scholars like to praise Allah in beautiful ways, just as they like to supplicate him in beautiful ways. And without takallif, without going to extremes in doing so, is that the best du'as are always the heartfelt du'as. The best prayers are the prayers that we make from the depths of our heart that we're most attached to. Nevertheless, it's still a good thing to do to petition and to supplicate our Lord in beautiful ways. And so when we say, Hakka hamdihi, the right of his praise, that we know in reality that we can never truly praise Allah Ta'ala as He deserves to be praised. Subhanak la nuhsi thanan alik. Transcendent are you, we that never will enumerate your praises. Enta kamathnit ala nafsik. You are as you have praised yourself. We can never ultimately praise Allah Ta'ala as He deserves to be praised. And nor does Allah benefit from our praise. We are the ones that benefit from our praise. In terms of the reward that we get and the atonement that is received for various sins that we commit, but also, and most importantly, from the pleasure that arises from the remembrance of Allah. And this is something that we should all strive towards, is to find intimacy with the remembrance of Allah. I mean, the beginner, when he or she remembers Allah Ta'ala, it's hard for us to do, it's hard for he or she. And that rather we should say us, it's hard for us in the beginning. Just concentrate, it's hard for us to focus and that we find that we drift and that we start thinking about all different types of things which we have to keep bringing ourselves back, bringing ourselves back, bringing ourselves back and fixate, fixate our that minds on the meanings of the dhikr. And then after praising Allah was salatu wa salam ala Muhammad and Rasulihi wa abdihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sahabi min ba'dah. Of course, he's going to send blessings and peace upon Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And then immediately after his introduction, amma ba'd, which is the kalimat al intiqal, it is a way that traditionally the Arabs would move from one subject to another here from his introduction to the initial statements of his book. أَمَّا بَعْدْ فَعْلَمْ أَيُّهِ الْحَرِيسِ عَلْ إِكْتِبَاسَ الْعِلْمِ You who are desirous of acquiring sacred knowledge. So he is directing this towards a particular student, but it has general application to all students of knowledge, rather all people who are existing in the world. So don't think that this is just for the student of knowledge. It is especially for the student of knowledge, but we can take heed, all of us, from what he's going to say. So he says he notices that this student is haris. He is eager, he is desirous, he is well concerned to acquire ilm, sacred knowledge. Al-mudhiru min nafsihi sidgha raghbati fi. Expressing in yourself a sincere longing and a passionate thirst for it. Know that if your aim in seeking knowledge is. So he's saying that you are a mother nafsuhu, you are expressing in yourself, it is apparent to people outwardly, that you really have a desire and you have a thirst for sacred knowledge. But every claim that is made can either be proven or disproven. If you make a claim that you have to prove your claim, and if you're claiming that you're sincere in seeking sacred knowledge and that you're longing to learn, 
there's going to be a test that has to be applied to see if that's really true or to see if your intention behind what it is that you're doing is sincere. So you can imagine, just you think about the way that Imam al-Ghazali is starting his work here. He is that starting his work in a way that shows the gravity of the affair at hand. And this is a trait that is very important to have as long as we're here in this world, is seriousness. One of the things one of my teachers said is that you should be mujid in your lutf and you should be latif in your jid. It's a good thing to be serious. But you should be gentle in your seriousness and you should be serious in your gentleness. And that is the balance. Is that there are some people who are not serious at all. And there are other people that are so serious is that they're brash. And they don't know how to properly interact with other people. The balance is between those two things. Is that you're serious, but you're gentle in your seriousness. And you're gentle that in that and you're serious in your states of gentleness and so that you always have something to restrain you you're being gentle in your state of seriousness prevents you from being brash and bah, that coming into conflict with people and your seriousness in your state of being gentle prevents you from just letting the reins loose and doing whatever it is that you want to do and that is difficult for us to maintain balance. Actually, balance is the hardest thing of all. Balance is the hardest thing of all. It's very easy to be off balance. It's very difficult to remain balanced. And the whole spiritual path, ultimately, is about balance in all of its manifestations. And the times that we have to go to that one extreme or the other is only in the end to attain balance. But this is really what we are striving for in our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that his way was a way of balance and he was the most balanced person in human history in all of the praiseworthy ways of being balanced Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's only when we reach the end of the spiritual path which in reality that it doesn't really have an end that it goes on and on and on even when you attain its fruit which is to know Allah is that you will find it is only then that you're able to do what it is that you know you need to do in your everyday life in the way that is most pleasing to Allah. And so sometimes that you have to that put in a lot of effort so that then you can maintain a balance. And that this is a principle that pertains to the spiritual path. So Imam al-Ghazali that is presenting this affair as very serious which indeed it is. And this is, you know, this tone is present in so many of his works. Because he is someone who reached the heights of success in the world, but he realizes that it's not real. He realizes all of that is going to end. And what is going to last is going to be that which is done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Everything is perishing except that his noble countenance, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we can extend that meaning to every act that we do. Every act that we do will be useless unless it is done solely for his sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, that there has to be a real sincere intention behind something in order for it to really matter and benefit us. So, he's going to get right to the point and say know that if your aim in seeking knowledge and again by extension anything that it is that we are doing in our life is to compete show off outdo your peers garner attention and amass the debris of this world then you are on your way to rendering your religion null and void destroying yourself and selling your eternal life for this present one and the effect that this is supposed to have on us is like someone who's about to walk off a cliff or fall into the, a hole and someone tells them, hey, stop, wait, watch out, careful. 
the point of that this rhetorically is for someone to like wake up and recognize the reality of the affair at hand. And this is what he's saying, if, the, if your intentions are restricted to those that were mentioned, you're seeking this knowledge to compete, munafasa, to show off, mubaha. You just want to outdo your peers. You want to be better than the person that is next to you. You want people to look at you, and you want people to notice you, and you want to just gather the debris of this world, dunya. He says, you are destroying your deen, even if you're successful in the world. You are destroying your deen, which is the most important thing uh, that we have. You are destroying your deen that we have, and the only thing that we really have. And you are destroying yourself. And you are selling the next world for this world. You're selling the next world for this world. And that the, the, it is, there is a tijara. There is a buying and there is a selling. And what we want to do is we want to sell this world for the next world. We want to sacrifice in this world so that we can attain in the next world. And he's going to further his diatribe. Your transaction is empty your business profitless and the person who teaches you in this case is nothing less than an accomplice in your transgression a partner in your loss he can be compared to one who sells a sword to a highway robber for as the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi is reported to have said indeed whoever helps with a sin by even half a word is a partner in it we don't want to assist anyone in sin of any type. We want to do our best to avoid sin and to help other people that avoid sin. And it's a good thing for us to be aware of this and to be wakeful in relation to this. And if you apply this principle to the various types of careers that people, that, uh, uh, that people have, is that it really requires in our time that we have in-depth knowledge of the sacred law and we have a little bit of zuhud, asceticism and renunciation of the world along with that and that we have a trust as well in our Lord knowing that he is the razak and the provider in order for us to truly find a way to earn a living that is not outright impermissible and there are always ways out for people of taqwa and that Allah Ta'ala will that give a believer who relies upon him a way to earn a halal income as long as he does his part in some of the ways that were previously mentioned. But if we look at this for instance that this idea of helping other people sin whether it be a teacher who doesn't scrutinize the students that he teaches or whether it be anyone else, someone that works for a company that is that a source of destruction in the earth, is that we have to, to the extent possible, that find the best way, right, to that help Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's creation, that rather than destroy it, or rather than to bring about that harm to it, he says. The angels will spread their wings for you as you walk, and the fish in the sea will ask forgiveness for you as you strive. Excuse me. But if in seeking knowledge your intention and aim between Allah Most High and yourself is to gain guidance, is to gain guidance, you want al hidayah. You are setting out on that path in order to attain hidayah. And by extension, Everything that it is that you do in your life is that you are doing it for a good reason, with a sincere intention. And that even though outwardly that you might think in the career that you have or the employer that you work for, there's no way for you to attain Hidayah. Make the intention to seek Hidayah from any situation and you'd be surprised that you might even learn from inanimate objects. There are people before that learn from inanimate objects. 
There are people before that were taking a path of study and they were trying and trying, reading and reading, studying and studying, didn't seem to be reaping any of the fruits. And there was a particular book that one scholar was reading multiple times, time and time again, and each time that he read it, he couldn't understand it. It wasn't clicking. And he was about to give up, and then he noticed as he was walking one day that there was a well, and it had a rock base, and there was a rope that was acting as pulley that was attached to the bucket that you would that reel in in order to bring up the water. But he noticed that the rope had made an indentation in the rock. Now, what's stronger, rock or rope? Obviously, rock. But the rope had moved so many times over the rock. Is that it caused an indentation? Maybe there was multiple ropes. But the point was, is that the consistent motion of the rope moving over the rock left an indentation. He took a spiritual meaning from that saying that if I keep going and I keep trying, eventually that the door will open and I will benefit. And then he did, and that was a means for him after that to read it the next time, and Allah Ta'ala gave him an opening. That Another story that they mention, and you hear different versions of these, and it doesn't really matter whether they are true or not, but perhaps they were true, is that there was a man who had read a book seven times, and he was... He became disillusioned because he didn't understand the book. And then he saw that there was a morsel of food that was stuck in a little crevice in the wall. And an ant had, was going up that wall to try to get that food. And every time they get close, it would fall. And he just kept watching that ant first time, second time, third time. To the seventh time, the number of times that apparently in the story he had read the book, the ant fell. And then on the eighth time is that it reached its goal and it picked up that morsel of food. And so as he's witnessing this, he said, "Is am I going to let an ant have higher spiritual aspiration than me? And he took it seriously and studied that earnestly and that it was a means for him to get an opening in the book. That the point here is, is that putting in that effort and making the intention that especially when we seek sacred knowledge is that we want Hidayah. Whenever we attend gatherings of learning that we want Hidayah. Whenever we, that anything else that we do in our life is that we want it to be a source of our guidance and that somehow a means for us to learn and to benefit from our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he says that if your aim is, is to gain guidance, and not simply the transmission of information, then glad tidings be to you. It's not just mujabbara riya. We don't just want knowledge. It's that we want knowledge to lead to guidance. We want it to be a means for us to benefit. The angels will spread their wings for you as you walk, and the fish in the sea will seek forgiveness for you as you strive so that there will be cosmic repercussions to the various things that you do. And in the end, that we don't know how that happens, that we don't see these angels that are spreading their wings, nor do we that see the fish in the seas and understand how it is that they seek forgiveness. But what we're understanding is, is that in general, everything in Allah Ta'ala's creation has been subjugated to the human being. And we are the caliphs, of our Lord on earth and that we are required to be custodians in relation to how we interact with all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. And so we know that Allah ta'ala has subjugated his creation to us, but when we are doing what it is that we're supposed to be doing is that Allah ta'ala places a special blessing in relation to those things that have been subjugated to us. And so that the angels is that the idea of them spreading their wings for us as you walk is that it will bring about blessing and mercy in our lives. Is that there will be facilitation in the things that you do. And that is one of the constants that you see around righteous people. Is that you see things facilitated for them. Oftentimes, without their even attempting to do something that would 
have that thing be facilitated for them. Things are just facilitated for them. You'll find other people that are trapped in the means of doing everything it is that they can to achieve a goal about a particular something, and then someone else places much less effort, and it just comes together with much less planning. It doesn't mean that we don't have a balanced level of planning you're supposed to, but this is one of the fruits of having a relationship with Allah Ta'ala is that things are facilitated for you. And what else would you expect of someone that the angels are lowering their wings as they walk? Or if they actually have fish in the sea seeking forgiveness for them? And we shouldn't think that these are, you know, just, you know, you know, just fairy tale type things. Allah is qadr ala kulli shay. Once you believe in Allah, and you, be you believe in Allah, it's easy to believe that He can make a fish seek forgiveness for you. It's easy for you to believe that He could suspend the way that we normally experience the world. You believe in Allah. And part of your belief in Allah is that you realize is that He is the Khalq. He is the Khalq. He is the one who brings into existence things that were previously not in existence. And He creates from nothing, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the Khalq, and He can do whatever it is that He wants to do. So when you believe in that, it's easy to believe in these things. And it's not a prerequisite that someone has experienced it for them to that know it to be a reality. Is it how many things that are true that we're unaware of their existence? And our lack of awareness doesn't mean that those things are not true. He says, though, you should know before all else. And ta'alim qabla kulli So this has got to be important. He says, if you should know what I'm about to say before all else, that guidance, which is the fruit of knowledge, has a beginning and an end, an outward aspect and an inward essence. So by now, we should be convinced about the importance of guidance. And we should be intent on making the intention to seek guidance in everything it is that we do, especially when we're taking a path to learn. But he says here is that guidance, it's coterminous with the fruit of knowledge. In other words, it is the fruit of knowledge. So if we really want to attain guidance, is that we have to seek sacred knowledge. And the fruit of seeking that sacred knowledge will lead to guidance. So it's coterminous in the sense that, is that if you do your part, is that it will lead you to what comes as a result. And that's what you're set out to seek. That's what you're seeking in the first place. And so guidance is the fruit of knowledge. But guidance has a beginning and it has an end. It has an outward aspect, and it has an inward essence. And so, you can't attain something at the end without first starting at the beginning. Is that no sane person is going to decorate their home if the drywall hasn't been put on yet? Are you going to bring furniture, brand new, beautiful furniture into your house, when the house is not painted yet? No, there's a way that things are built and that people that know about construction know what it is that you put in when and the doors come in at a particular period and the tiles come in at another time and the granite comes in at its own time and the drywall comes in at its time, you paint at a certain time, at a particular time that you put in the carpet and all of these other types of things and then eventually you come in and the house is ready and once the house is ready then that there's various things that you then go about doing in order to prepare the house for yourself. The deen is no different. There's a beginning and there's an end. And one of the biggest points of confusion in our community relates to this. What is done in the beginning and what is done in the end? Confusion. People don't know what to do and when to do it. What he's given us here is a manual for us that is the beginning of guidance. He's giving some overarching statements here so that we can understand that yes, what we should be seeking is Hidayah. And then that Hidayah, once it's achieved to the very to the degree that is achieved, that there will be various manifestations that appear within us as a result of us attaining Hidayah. 
But he says in order to attain it, that there's certain things that you have to do, but you have to first know in terms of your worldview conceptually that it has a beginning, it has an end, and it has an inward essence just as it has an outward aspect. But he says there is no way to reach the end without mastering the beginning. Just as there is no way to discover the inner essence of it until you have arrived at an understanding of its outward. And so everything has to be put in its proper place. You can't jump to the end if you haven't done the necessary work in the beginning. And when I was recently in Turkey, I was uh, speaking to a friend of mine who's a seasoned student of knowledge. And he was telling me some of his experiences that he had with new students of knowledge that came. And how they want to study very advanced books and they haven't studied the beginning books. And like anything else, you'll get lost in advanced books. That if you try to study that a complicated procedure in medicine and you don't have any memorized basic anatomy, that how are you going to understand what is taking place? That it's all the same. Why is it that even in universities that you take Economics 101, right? Poli-Sci 101, you take general courses to give you general knowledge to learn the Mustadahat, the technical terms of that science, and then that there's graduate, there's undergraduate courses, there's prerequisites for other courses, there's postgraduate that courses. And that's for a reason, because you can't just jump to the top and study what is complicated if you haven't spent the time building the foundations. This is for everything that you do. Whether it's the metaphor of building something, whether it's the, in your own profession, why, why do we have gateway jobs? There's certain that there's an experience that you need before you move on to something else. And so this is, this is the way life is. And it's just always amazing how people think that, think that that applies to everything else except the religion. It applies to everything else except to the religion in people's minds. And until our community realizes there is a beginning and there's an end, and that they move out of this utter state of confusion, is that, well, that we're going to probably just remain in the state that we're in. And even saying that is being generous because in reality there is no neutrality. You're either the ascending or you're descending. Is that there is no neutrality. And so that if we're not moving forward, we're likely taking steps backward. But another very important thing here that he says is that there's no way to discover the inner essence of it until you have arrived at an understanding of its outward. And from here that we can understand how the out, outward knowledge relates to inward knowledge. And you could say exoteric knowledge relates to esoteric knowledge. And from our perspective, from our dean, is that there's no access to the inward knowledge except from the vantage point of the outward knowledge. And so when our Prophet said, وسلم, in reference to the meanings of the Quran, that every verse has an outward meaning, an inward meaning, a limit, and a vantage point or a rising point, depending upon the narration. The idea of the vantage point is is that the outward is the casing, the mold, the vantage point for the inward. And so inward knowledge without the outward to protect it, to be a case that ensures its authenticity, is that someone could go astray with that esoteric inward knowledge. It needs to be approached from the outward. And this is why, generally speaking, that we start with the basics of the deen, the outward dimension of the deen, and then that over time, when we learn that and we becomes a little more nuanced, we put it into practice, it opens up the inner aspects of our religion for us. But that is the beauty that we always have the outward there. And this is why some, some have likened sharia, the sacred law, to gravity. It's what keeps things grounded. It's what we know, it's, it's what enables us to know 
whether something from what is experienced from spiritual realities can be accepted or rejected. And this is why it's very important that we ground ourselves in the sacred law. And Imam al-Sha'arani explicitly mentions that it is one of the delusions of the Sufis who become so preoccupied with spiritual knowledge that they neglect outward knowledge. They neglect that fiqh especially. And they <clears throat> refrain from the continuing to read the books of the fuqaha, of the scholars, is that this helps us in more ways than one. There's even a spiritual benefit of reading the books of fiqh, is that it actually helps you to be able to bear that spirituality is better. So even if they try to argue around it, there's no arguing around it any way that you look at it. It helps that preserve the authenticity of what it is that one experiences just as, as well, that it enables someone to be able to bear more spiritually. And so that the outward is where we begin, and then from the vantage point of the outward that we move to the inward. And then the final line that we'll take today is, here I'm going to point you to the beginning of guidance for you to see where you stand and determine what your heart intends. So this is someone who has traveled the spiritual path. This is someone who Allah blessed with realization. And one of the reasons Imam al-Ghazali is called Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam is because that he put the Quran and Sunnah into practice and attained realization, and thus that his life story is a testimony to the truth of the teachings of Sayyidina Muhammad bin Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he was given permission to tell us about it so his life story becomes a source of inspiration for generations after him until this very day and age that we can then know that just as he attained we can attain and from the blessing of Allah Ta'ala we have people in our lives that we know People that converted to this religion or people that grew up in the religion but weren't always that fully practicing in it but came back to it, repented, and then attained. We have these blessing, we have this blessing of these examples of these people in our lives that is an, and again, it's a source of inspiration for us that we know we could have had a jahiliya, we could have had a past, and we can repent from that past and we can believe and that we can practice and we can attain as a result. And one of the wisdoms that Imam al-Kushayri in his famous treatise, the Risad al-Kushayriya in Tasawwuf, is that he mentions numerous stories of terrible people. That they were horrible people. That they were drunkards, and brigands, and thieves. Multiple stories. But then they had a moment where they repented. And they became from the elect of the righteous. Part of that relates to that creating a sense of hope in all of us is that there, it's never too late for us to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that if we do so, that, that Allah ta'ala will open up the doors. But he's saying here that, and this is again someone who's seasoned and knows the spiritual path, the type of knowledge that I'm going to give you right now is going to test you. Are, are you really sincere? Do you really want to tread the path? Do you really want to take a path of learning? Or is it just your nafs? being enticed by shaitan to do this for ulterior motives. You will know in relation to your response to what it is that I'm going to say. If you find your heart inclining toward it, and you find yourself compliant and receptive, then look to the ends of it and immerse yourself in the oceans of this knowledge. If, on the other hand, you find that in taking stock of it, your heart puts off starting it or ask for more time in responding to its demands, then know that the part of your lower self wanting knowledge is the self that commands to evil, which has risen up out of obedience to the accursed Satan. So we'll stop there and pick up on this particular point, and inshallah ta'ala, that one of the intentions that we should make when we read the books of Imam Ghazali is that we be that gifted a bath which is a strong urge that propels us along the spiritual path and is a that means for us to take this affair seriously 
and to take the first steps in the right direction so that we can then uh, embark upon a lifelong quest of drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that after the blessing of Islam that this is one of the greatest blessings of all that you could really say if you want to sum up the greatest blessings of all after the blessing of Islam it's to that learn sacred knowledge it's to sit before rightly guided scholars in shuyukh of tarbiyah who spiritually train you and is to be gifted this bath that this powerful urge that motivates you along the path that enables you to do what other people find difficult what enables you to do what other people dread doing and that this is what we hope that from the blessing of reading these books is that that are 900 plus years old nevertheless that Imam Ghazali is still speaking to us directly and alhamdulillah that there are people that Allah Ta'ala inspired and that realize the importance of writing these works for the generations that came after them because they realize this is one of the ways to preserve that these great experiences that people that are blessed with may Allah Ta'ala bless us in this path and bless us with to benefit from this book may Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq and all of our different affairs and to place immense blessing for us in this 40 day program may be a means for us inshallah ta'ala to that ascend the in degrees of closest to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to shed many aspects of our soul that we need to let go so that we can then to transform ourselves and attain closest to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wasallam wa alhamdulillah Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala nawina ta'allama wa ta'lim wa nafa' wa intifa' wa tadhakkara wa tadhkir wa lifada wa istifada wa hatha ala tamaskil kitabillah sunnat rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa du'a lil huda wa dalala ala khair ibtigha wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa mardatihi wa qurbi thawabihi subhanahu wa ta'ala Alhamdulillah, we were able to take the first part of the introduction of Hujjat al Islam and Imam al Ghazali's book, The Beginning of Guidance. And for those of you that are following along with the book, this is the version that, that I recommend. And um, this is the translation of Mashhad al Alaf, and that has been. That reviewed by Mufti Abdul Rahman Yusuf and is printed by White Thread Press. And if you have this edition, that we are still towards the top of page 18. And up until now, that Imam Ghazali has introduced this idea that Hidayah, guidance, has a beginning and it has an end. It has an outward aspect, aspect and an inward essence. And he said so eloquently. And so foundationally that there is no way to reach the end without mastering the beginning just as there is no way to discover the inner essence until you have arrived at an understanding of its outward and it's only with rare exception is this rule ever this rules in place only in always except with rare exception and so he, he says, here I'm going to point you to the beginning of guidance. For you to see where you stand and determine where you, your heart, what your heart intends. If you find your heart inclining toward it, and you find yourself compliant and receptive, 
Then look to the ends of it and immerse yourself in the oceans of this knowledge. And so that the Arabic word here is ma'ilan, which ma'la yamilu is to incline towards something. Umutawi'ah, which means to that obey or to be compliant and receptive. And so that this is really what we want the state of our heart to be in. Is that we want to our heart to incline towards what is good. And even though the nafsad and marabisu, the soul that incites to evil, in its rudimentary state, in its untrained reality, that you find that it will encourage you to do evil. Your soul could incline towards evil. However, this is why if you put in spiritual struggle, as that it will move slowly, slowly, slowly towards a higher degree. And then the more and more that you take it to task, is that the more pure that it becomes. And so what he says here is so important because he's testing us to see whether or not we are sincere in the pursuit of knowledge. And by extension, in the pursuit of wanting to draw near to our Lord. There's a sign, and this sign is the knowledge that he's going to mention in this book, do we find ourselves inclining towards it or not? If we find ourselves inclining towards it, if we find ourselves receptive towards it, to it, then it's a sign that we're sincere. And if we find ourselves that unreceptive, or we find ourselves having an aversion to it, if we're ready to put in the work still and to go against our lower soul, that's still a good state. That's still a good state. But the danger is, and this is where we left off, if on the other hand you find that in taking stock of it your heart puts off starting it or asks for more time in responding to its demands, then know that the part of your lower self wanting knowledge is the self that commands to evil which has risen up out of obedience to the accursed Satan. And so there's Satan, Shaitan, that uses our lower nafs, our lower soul. And this is his greatest tool of all to use, is our nafs, especially in its unrefined state. Shaitan uses our nafs to lead us astray, because the nafs and amar of su might have a desire to do something that is impermissible in shaitan that uses that to his advantage and so if we're sincere that the motivation for study will be to draw near to Allah to seek his noble countenance and all of the other that beautiful intentions that we can make whereas the nafs is that it wants the fleeting passions of this world. It wants instant gratification. It wants the things of this world. It wants to be praised. It wants to be respected. It wants to be on top, and on and on and on. So he says, Satan's strategy is to throw to you the rope of deceit, then pull you in by it to the abyss of destruction. His intention is to present evil in the form of good, until he succeeds in making you of those who lose the most in respect of their deeds, whose efforts have been wasted in this life, while they reckon that they do good work. And that their Nasal Ta'ala Asalamu and that um, that the Aksarina Amala Nasal Asalamu Afiyah. Those who lose the most in respect to their deeds. These are people whose efforts have been wasted in this life. And this is these are uh, this is in Surah Al Kahf, that and that while they reckon that they do good work, and that there are people who don't realize this is this is their state. They think outwardly everything is fine. And were you to really look that as what is happening is that in reality that they that have their internal state is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
He says, at this point, Satan will recite to you the excellence of knowledge in the high rank of the scholars and all that has been related about it in hadith and other narrations. And by extension, that anything else that we do for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, like we said, is that this applies as well to anyone who's doing anything. And so that there might be merit in doing these other things, but as we're reminded of this merit, that if we forget about the danger, this is that where the problem that arises. So he will divert you from the warning of the Prophet وسلم, who said, He who increases in knowledge, but not in guidance, increases only in distance from Allah. Man is dad ilman, wa lam yazdad hudan, lam yazdad min Allah illa burda. And so we have a relationship here between an increase in knowledge and a lack of guidance. So the ideal state is, is that the more we increase in knowledge, the more we increase in guidance. So keep in mind the name of the book is Bidayat al Hidayah. And here that we can understand the relationship between knowledge that and guidance. As he says, that the thamara of ilm is Hidayah. And so this hadith is a proof of that. The fruit of knowledge is guidance. And as our Prophet said, if there's an increase in knowledge, but you haven't increased in guidance, then what? You're only increasing in distance from Allah Ta'ala. And so, that hidayah, that equals what? Closeness to Allah. Because what is hidayah? A dalada to al musila ila al haq ila al maqsud. And so the idea of, of hidayah, that if you want to take the metaphor of being on a path, if you're going somewhere, and you take a wrong turn, that we've all been driving and we're using some form of a GPS on our phones or whatever, and you make a wrong turn, and then it recalculate, recalculates, Ya Allah. And then all of a sudden, that additional three or four minutes has been added to your trip. Or that if you're traveling a longer distance, you miss the turn off and all of a sudden, another 20, 24 minutes. Or we have these turnpikes in Pennsylvania, if you miss the turnoff, one time I was driving, there's a turnpike, the 476, which from where we are on Allentown, it takes you directly south to Philadelphia, or you can go further north. And I missed it one time, and the next exit is 17 miles. So you have to drive 17 miles north, exit, and then you have to get back on the interstate, the turnpike, and drive 17 miles that south. So you added another 30 plus minutes to your trip. So sometimes that mistakes that we made when we deviate, we go astray. Sometimes they're minor. And you know, okay, you can just get on the next street and it you know, didn't really increase. Sometimes it didn't increase the distance. Sometimes it by a minute. Sometimes how could it? But, um, you know, along the path is that the people, the rightly guided scholars who have insight. They tell us whether there's an accident ahead. They tell us whether or not that there's a road that is quicker. They tell us whether or not that a road is closed. So that we can get to where we're going in the closest, in the shortest amount of time. This is what the spiritual life is about. And it's, it, there's a beautiful metaphor in it, in outward travel. If you know where you're going and that you're experienced, then you can also help other people get to where they're going. If you've never traveled a road and you want to explain to someone how to get somewhere, well, how are you going to really know? I mean, there's only so much you can know if you've never actually done it yourself. But if you've driven to a place that 20, 30, 40 times, and you know the back roads, and you know what to do, and you know when there's traffic, and that you know what to do when there's an accident, and you, you know the exits and so forth, and you know the way stations along the way and when you need gas and when you need some coffee or whatever it might be is that you'll be able to explain to other people that what the path is like and so that this hadith is a proof of exactly what Imam Ghazali said is that an increase in knowledge should lead to an increase in hidayah and what hidayah really means is moving along the path and getting closer and closer to your goal, which is closeness to Allah Ta'ala. So this is a hadith that we should be familiar with and try to memorize in Arabic and English, but at very least in English, 
من ازداد علما ولم يزدد هدى لم يزدد من الله الا بعدا and that he who increases in knowledge but not in guidance increases only in distance from Allah most high and then in this one and then he will also that divert you from the warning of the Prophet and when he said of those most severely punished on the day of judgment is the knowledgeable person whom Allah did not benefit through his knowledge for the most severe of people that are punished on Yom Al is a scholar a person of knowledge who Allah did not benefit through his knowledge and so think about how many people that that could potentially apply to and what I mean by think about that is that think about it that a tafakkur of that fikr itibar where we can take a lesson not that we necessarily point fingers to particular individuals but let, let, just think about that how many people that have an enormous amount of knowledge whether it be religious knowledge or even worldly knowledge people have an enormous amount of knowledge but if it's not benefiting them and Allah is not benefiting them through that knowledge what use is that knowledge? What use is that knowledge? Is that people that are exposed to incredible signs of Allah Taala in the earth, and at the same time, they deny the blessings of Allah, and they deny those signs? That's going to be much more severe than the person who that wasn't exposed to what they were exposed to. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That he used to say, "Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilm la yanfa' wa qalb la yakhsha wa amal la yurfa' wa du'a la yusma'." He used to seek refuge, and we have a large number of prophetic supplications that are that isti'adat that the Prophet said, "I'm seeking refuge in things." And this is a good thing to memorize: is that at least a few of these types of supplications. Because we know that if our Prophet himself sought refuge from in that from Allah Taala, that in Allah sought refuge in Allah from that particular thing, is that there's a reason behind that. These things are going to harm us. So here, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge that does not benefit, and from a heart that does not fear, and from a deed that does not ascend, and an invocation that is not heard. So again, it's conceivable that there be knowledge, but it doesn't benefit one. Or it's conceivable that someone have a heart, but there's no khushur, there's no fear, there's no reverential awe. These manifestations at the heart level of deep faith, they're simply not there. Or someone could do deeds, but la yurfa, they're not accepted. And when we talk about ascension, la yurfa, they don't ascend, meaning in other words that they're not accepted. Oh, dua la yusma, there are people that make dua, but it might not be answered, or it might not be that that heard. And then also another hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We, that he said on the, on, my, on the night of my ascension to the heavens, I passed by people whose lips were being cut by pincers from the hellfire. Right? Scissors. So I asked, who are you? They replied, we used to order people to do good and not, and not do it ourselves and advise people against evil, even as we were doing it ourselves. So in other words, is that this affair is serious. Heaven and hell is real. And things don't happen just according to what we want. Does man have that only what he wants? Is it only about what we want? If it was about what we want, then every person in the world wants something different. And every person in the world will think something else about what's going to happen in the next world. But this is Allah Ta'ala's affair. Allah Ta'ala has decreed things to be a certain way. And so, that we realize that according to our Prophet Wasallam, that this is a punishment of people who used to not practice what they preach. 
as they would tell people to do good and not do it themselves. They would prevent them and that advise them against evil and do it themselves. And Salat Ta'ala Salam and Afiyah. So Imam Al Ghazali mentions this to say, yes, normally we speak about knowledge because we want to in, in a way that encourages people to seek it. But while we encourage people to seek knowledge, we also need to that warn people to be aware of some of the pitfalls of knowledge or what could happen to someone if they're not sincere in their intention. And what we really want to come out of this is with a balance. Is that we recognize where we're at, we might not be fully sincere. And we recognize knowledge is that purifying because in it is light, it's packed with light. And so the balance is, is that we try our best to be sincere and we constantly scrutinize our intentions and we make a commitment to working on ourselves and we have hope that we're going to be accepted and that we're going to rise in ranks of closest to Allah Ta'ala but we also fear that we're insincere we fear that our nafs is going to get the best of us we fear that our desire might pollute the work that it is what we're doing so that's the balance and we don't want to be have excess in either way to the point where we're just so optimistic that we forget to scrutinize our own ourselves and that we fall heedless to some of these potential that negative aspects of our soul <coughs> and at the same time is that we're not so fearful is that we close the door upon ourselves to setting out on a path to the attaining that closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through seeking sacred knowledge balance is really what we want to strive towards but again this is why this knowledge is so practical is that a good percentage of the people in the world are completely heedless to this are completely heedless to this and even though knowledge is very pleasurable whatever type of knowledge that might be if it's not benefiting us if it's not increasing us in hidayah in guidance then what use is that really? What use is that really? When it's all said and done, is that people see the repercussions that for the knowledge that they had and their lack of the benefiting from it. And so Imam Ghazali says, then beware, O destitute one. Fi'iyaka <laughs> ya miskeen. We're all poor, impoverished, and destitute. That's our reality. Beware, O miskeen of following Satan's disingenuous advice and being roped in by his deceit Habli Hurur the rope of his deception and then he says woe to the ignorant man because he did not seek knowledge and woe a thousand times to the knowledgeable one who did not act upon his knowledge And the state that we really want to be in is one of that seeking sacred knowledge and acting upon our knowledge. And it is for knowledge in action that Allah Ta'ala created the heavens and the earth. This is what it's all about. Remember, Al-Ghazali mentions this in the book, his book, Minhaj al Abidin. Ilm al Amal. This is really what it's all about. Knowledge and putting that knowledge into practice and everything else is a fruit that comes after that and that's why intelligent people is that they make that a priority in their life ilm and amal and to the degree that we make that a priority in our life that everything else in our life will be put in its proper place one of the things that you find is that if you're paying the five daily prayers on time if you're doing your orad and the invocations in the morning and the evening at specified times, on a weekly basis you have certain things that you do, you will find immense blessing in your time. And that you will find that, wow, that I'm benefiting from my day much more than previously, that when I'm running around doing this and this, praying at the last part of the time and so forth. There's a special blessing in having that the five daily prayers determine how it is that you spend your time during the day and this is possible for people to do people can if they need to go out and run errands that's fine but what they can do is they say okay I'm gonna run errands at this specific time 
so I can be back by Dhuhr, or so I can be back by Asr, so I can be at such and such a place to pray Maghrib. And um, one of the last things was as I was transitioning from Mauritania to Yemen, that one of the teachers there told me several lines of poetry, but the first says, Ij'al al ilma udhran lil ashai. Make knowledge an excuse for other things. Wala taj'al al ashai udhran lil ilm. And do not make other things an excuse for knowledge. Make knowledge an excuse for other things. And do not make other things an excuse for knowledge. And that's obviously within limit. We all have responsibilities, of course. But outside of those things that you have to do, there's always times that you can still get the mail, you can still do this, you can still do that, you can still arrange this, you can still arrange that, you can that go by the store, you can maybe postpone it one day, or postpone it a few hours. Is that you want to make knowledge an excuse for other things. And that felicity is in trying to minimize to the extent possible these other things so you can increase more knowledge and by extension other things that you want to do like worship and that we should be doing like worship and so forth as opposed to the opposite because those other things will suck you up and if you give them priority is that we crumbs left over for knowledge so he says understand May Allah, most I have mercy on you, that there are three classes of people who seek knowledge. And this will be what we take today, is just understanding these three categories of people. He says, first is a man who seeks knowledge to make it his provision on the way to the next life. And intends by it nothing other than the countenance of Allah Most High in the home of the hereafter. He is from the winners, the Fa'izin, the truly successful. Second is a man who seeks knowledge to assist him in, the, in his present life and to attain by honor, good standing, and wealth. He is aware of what he is doing and feels in his heart that his state is not good and his intention is not right. He is of those who put themselves in jeopardy. If he dies before making repentance, it must be feared that he will come to a bad end and his fate is under the divine will. But if such a man is divinely guided to repentance before the arrival of his appointed time, and if he adds good works to his knowledge and redeems himself from his past shortcomings, he will become one of the winners, successful. For truly one repents who repents of a sin is like one who has no sin, narrated by Imam Ibn Majah. So this is an in-between state. We don't know how this person is going to end. What state of heart is going to overcome him? And so obviously there's a danger here because if someone dies, not having repented, dies, not having striven for the first class of people, he's fi mashiyatillah. Allah Ta'ala wants he can forgive him and if he wants he can punish him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this does not just apply to knowledge, this applies to life in general. Anyone that's doing anything. As that how seriously are we taking our deen? Is that we should take our deen seriously. And there's people that are devoted, they take their deen seriously. And there's various degrees of people who devote themselves to the deen. And then there's people that are in between. Sometimes like this, sometimes like that. Sometimes like this, sometimes like that. And again, you don't know what state they're going to be in when they take their final breath. Our state when it's like that is somewhat dangerous. But third is a man who has fallen completely under Satan's sway. This man uses his knowledge only to increase his wealth, boast of his rank, and take pride in his large following. With his knowledge, he explores every avenue, hoping to gratify all the desires he has for this world. In spite of all this, he still secretly believes he has a high place with Allah because he adorns himself with the outer characteristics of the learned. Following in their footsteps in dress and manner of speech, all the while rushing with frenzied desire toward the world, inwardly and outwardly. 
What does Imam Ghazali say about this person? This person is irretrievably lost. This person is irretrievably lost. In other words, that the word in Arabic is halikin, he's destroyed. He's one of the foolish, deluded ones. This is because there is no hope for his repentance, as he is convinced that he is one of those who do good. Such a person is heedless of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya O you who believe, why say you that which you do not? Kabara Muktan and Allahi in Takuru Ma La Tafadun. Most loathem is it in the sight of Allah that you say what you do not. He is one of those about whom the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi was speaking when he said, There are some that I fear more for you than I do the Antichrist, the Dajjal. People asked, Who are they, O Messenger of Allah? He Sallallahu Alaihi said, Evil scholars. He said, Evil scholars. And this is because that they lead people astray with their words, with their real they lead people astray with the reality of their state, even though that it appears that they are guiding people with their tongues. And he says, this is because the aim of the Antichrist is to misguide people. And if the likes of a scholar urge people away from this world by their speech and statements, they actively invite them to it through their actions and state. This is because actions speak louder than words, and human nature is such that it is inclined more to take part in what is done than to obey what is said. How much more corruption indeed will the actions of this deluded man cause than any good brought about by his words, since the ignorant man only throws himself into pursuit of worldly things after he sees the scholars doing so? Thus the deluded scholar's knowledge becomes the very cause of the servants of Allah daring to disobey him. Despite this, his ignorant lower self gives him assurance, filling him with hope and desire, calling him to expect favors from Allah as a result of his knowledge. And his evil inciting soul makes him believe that he is superior to many of his servants. He's describing intimately the state of this archetypal person. And we have to be very careful of these things. This, these books aren't about how fast you read them. These are books that you have to carefully examine the things that he's saying and to ponder them and to reflect upon them. It's not enough to just go over it in class. We have to read it before so that we know the, what is going to be spoken about during the class, but then we have to review it after. And these are books that we have to read once, and then we have to come back to it sometime later and read it again. Come back to it sometime later and read it again. Sometimes we have to pause and focus on a particular section. This requires deep thought and careful consideration of what is being said. Therefore, O seeker, be among the first class of seekers. Dare not to be of the second class, for how many are procrastinated and dies before he repents and forfeits everything above all. Beware to not allow yourself by any means to be of the third class and end your life wretchedly, utterly bereft of hope for success or salvation. If you then ask, what is the beginning of guidance, that I might test myself thereby, know that its beginning is the outward form of God consciousness, taqwa, and its end is the inward reality of God consciousness. Hence, there is no ultimate bliss except through God consciousness, and guidance does not come but to those who are conscious of Allah. That I will let uh, Imam Amin, inshallah ta'ala, as of tomorrow, you'll be here with us, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, that pick up from this point on towards the bottom of page 22, speaking about taqwa, and then introducing that the various chapters of this work, and inshallah, that uh, he will go through the entire work, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, in the time that we will be spending together uh, over the, in, in the upcoming days. May Allah wa ta'ala give us tawfiq, bless us to be people of taqwa, and may Allah ta'ala bless us to be from the first class of people, be completely sincere, who do everything that they do solely for his sake, wa ta'ala. may Allah ta'ala reward off from us anything that will harm us in this world and the next, and give us tawfiq in all our different affairs. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا إنا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جاءته سهلا وأنت تجل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا I praise Allah تبارك وتعالى I thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for all the endowments that he has given us and among those endowments is the endowment of being seekers of knowledge seekers of the path to felicity in this world and the hereafter. And among those favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being connected to the great scholars of the hereafter who have tread the path that leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most excellent manner and who have laid the foundations for the succeeding generations of seekers to know the right way, to know the way of guidance, to know the way or the path to the paradise of the Lord of all the worlds. And among those great scholars who laid the foundations of this way is our Imam Hujjatul Islam Abu Muhammad al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala and we are continuing in his book Bidayatul Hidayah or the beginning of guidance and we will pick up where our teacher Sheikh Yahya may Allah benefit us from him and his knowledge in both this world and the hereafter where he left off talking about Maratibu Tulab al ilm or the levels or the different types of the seekers of knowledge or the students of knowledge. And Imam al Ghazali, in this book, he said that the people. الناس في طلب العلم على ثلاثة أحوال that the people in seeking knowledge they are of three different states three different levels he mentioned one that the person who seeks knowledge and by that he makes it as a zad or as a provision, a provision for his akhirah. So that person, he only seeks by the knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And he said, فَهَذَا مِنَ الْفَائِزِينَ This person He's among those who would be saved. He's a winner in the hereafter. Meaning, he's among those who are al-najin min adab Allah ta'ala al-lahikin bil khair. That these are people whom are rescued from the punishment of Allah. And we should think about that. What does it mean this person is a winner, a successful? The winner Truly the winner, and we should keep this in our mind in all of our matters, the winner is the one who is pushed away from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and drawn close to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a winner. If you really want to be a winner, then you need to do everything that's going to remove you min adabillah. 
from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything that's going to bring you near to the ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that regard, the student should try to re resemble the scholar or emulate the scholar. And Imam al-Ghazali, when he looks at scholars in his works, he looks at them as two types. Ulama al-dunya wa ulama al-akhirah. The scholar of this world and the scholar of the hereafter. And the ulama or the scholars of this world, he called them ulama su, evil scholars. Wretched scholars. And then he gives the ulama, they give signs of what Imam Al Ghazali mentioned. And the student should be Am I a student of this world? Then I am a bad student. Or I'm a student who's like this first class he mentioned, or this first level. I'm seeking the akhirah. I'm seeking what's Allah. I'm seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So he gives alama, he gives a sign of alam al-akhirah, he gives a sign. And the sign that the ulama mentioned in explaining that, they said, the first sign of someone who is seeking knowledge, or that scholar who is a person of the hereafter, is they don't see this world by way of their knowledge. So they learn, and with that knowledge they acquire, they don't seek just worldly matters. So they're not learning to get a job. That's not the purpose of why they're learning. They're learning to get beneficial knowledge, to practice it and spread it to others. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu sought refuge in, that knowledge that doesn't benefit. Knowledge that doesn't benefit. And that knowledge should benefit you in your world and in your hereafter. So the first sign of that one who's seeking the Akira by that is knowledge is that they don't seek the dunya by it. And the second sign is that that person, his intention in seeking knowledge, in getting busy with the Islamic sciences, is to achieve a sa'adatul akhirah, or sa'adatul akhirah, seeking success or felicity in the hereafter. That that person, the purpose of that, I want to have a sa'ada, happiness, felicity in the akhirah. So that means really their focus is on what? The hereafter. And this indicated by the Prophet Wasallam. that we should not be attached to this world, that our focus should be on the Akira. Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib. Be in this world like you are a stranger. Right? The stranger never gets comfortable in that location. They're looking for their home. And the dar, the true dar, for the believer, is the dar of the Akira. The dar of the Akira, the hereafter. Because at dunya, this world is a, an abode dar biman la darana for the one who doesn't have an abode. If the person focuses this dunya, it's a sign this person doesn't have a real home. But the best home or abode is the abode of the akhir. So the person's knowledge, getting busy with the knowledge for the akhirah. So since that is the case, 
that person is going to be concerned with al ilm al batin the knowledge of one's inward state. That's going to be the concern of that person. Not just the outward matters, but the state of the heart. Right? The state of the heart. The state of the soul. And how is he going to do that? So he's always going to be working on himself by mujahadat al-nafs. Struggling with the nafs. Waging war against the nafs. And that is related in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said we return from the minor jihad al-jihad al-asghar to al-jihad al-akbar to the major jihad. So not fighting the enemies, you consider it al-jihad al-asghar the minor struggle. But the real struggle is with the nafs. And the person who wants to be successful, to be happy in the hereafter, the way to do that is to wage war on one's nafs. To put one's nafs in line with the rules of the sacred law. And the third thing, when that person wants to rely on something in seeking the knowledge, it is in following Sahibu Sharia, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the companion of the sacred law. Fi Athalihi wa Akwalihi, and his statements and in his actions. That person is going to be concerned with following the Prophet. So when you're learning. You want to learn what the Prophet ﷺ emphasized. What the Prophet ﷺ emphasized, you want to learn that. And there are signs that the person is not seeking dunya by the knowledge. There are signs of that. And among those signs is that the person who is sincere in their pursuit of knowledge which is that first category, the one who's seeking knowledge for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that that person is the first one to practice the orders of Allah and to refrain from the prohibitions. So there, as soon as they hear, they fulfill. So you have two aspects of that. Al-fa'il wal tark You have the performing, Right? And you have the leaving off. So the person who's sincere, whenever there is an order, a command, they're the first ones to do. And whenever there is a prohibition, they're the first one to refrain from it. And that person also doesn't go into excess in relation to their food, or their housing, or their clothing, because they have this aspect of a zuid for dunya. They refrain or abstain from the matters of this world. So in their food, there is no excess. In their houses, there are no excess. In their clothing, there are no excess. And if you notice, our pious scholars before us they lived in modest homes. They had modest clothing. They ate little. And they were people who left this dunya for the sake of their akhirah. They renounced the dunya for the sake of their akhirah. They knew that the dunya was the place of delusion. It's not a place for the living to want to be. It is not a watan for someone who is high, someone who's really alive. This is not an abode. They understood that. Sheikh Al-Buti, 
Rahmatullah described it beautifully. When he said that this world, in reality, for the person who is traveling on the path, is like the one who sees a magazine or brochure of a beautiful, luxurious hotel, five stars, with all of the amenities that happen, a nice bed, and a pool, and nice landscape, and everything, heat, and air conditioner. And then when he finally arrives, the heat and air conditioner unit doesn't work. The bed has dirty sheets under the cover. The landscape is not so pretty. And he says, I wasted my money. I brought this vacation. It was all an illusion. It was not real. And this is the reality of the dunya. It looks so luxurious, but in reality, it doesn't contain that. It's something we should think about. It doesn't really contain that. That's how the dunya is. So the appearance is one thing, but its reality is something different. And another sign of that scholar is that they refrain from mixing with rulers and leaders except to advise them or to return injustices to people who injustices happen to or to intercede for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But other than that, they're not mixing with the people of the dunya. And this is something, if you want to be safe in your religion and a real seeker of knowledge, have little mixing with people except for beneficial matters. Don't spend your time mixing with people. It will distract you from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that second person so that's the first class of people, and they have these characteristics. Because these are the characteristics of the scholars of the hereafter. So the student should try to emulate those scholars in those behaviors. Because it is said, emulate if you are not like them. Try to be like them. Because in emulating the successful or the pious people, there is success. Emulate, so try to be like them. So when you learn about the scholars, as a student, these are traits that you need to have in you. And Imam al-Ghazali mentioned them. And the second class of the student is the student who is seeking knowledge to assist them in their worldly matters in this life. That person is in a dangerous situation, but they always have the door of repentance to turn to what is right. And you should take this hadith that Imam al-Ghazali mentioned and you should make it something that's always in front of your eyes. When you're falling short and not attaining the high rank that you should in striving for seeking sacred knowledge, turn to Allah and ask Allah to give you Tawfiq to become better in your pursuit. And never get discouraged that you're falling short. And remember, A golden rule for someone who falls short. The one who repents from the sin is like the one who never sinned. The one who repents from the sin is like the one who never sinned. And definitely do not be like the third class that Imam al-Ghazali mentioned as that one who shaitan has overwhelmed him and they take their knowledge to get money and fame. And This one is a loser. Then we reached up to the point where Sheikh Yahya left off and I begin, but I wanted to remind you of these things. 
because they're important. And we should keep in mind that the knowledge is for practice. That's what the knowledge is for, to practice, to implement. You can learn a lot, but if you don't do anything, how is it benefit you? You have to practice. Because the one who does not practice his knowledge, some scholars said they will be punished before the idol worshippers. The one who learns and does not practice by their knowledge would be punished before the idol worshipper. And that should be something that we are concerned with. There is one thing I forgot. That the one who is really seeking the hereafter, they don't rush to give Islamic answers. They don't rush to give fatawa, make legal rulings. They like to indicate to the person to go to someone who is more knowledge than them, more knowledgeable than them. And there is the example of one of the scholars from the Tabi'een. He said, I went to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and I asked her about wiping over the footgear, Masal al Khufayn. I asked her about that. And she said, Alayka bi Ali ibn Abi Talib. Go to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And ask him, because he used to travel with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They went to him and they asked Ali. Look at it. She said, it's Aisha, the wife of the Prophet. They asked her about wiping over the footgear. Easy matter. What we say, right? She said, go ask Ali. Go ask Ali. He used to travel with the Prophet sallallahu She didn't rush to answer. Go ask Ali. And it's also related that one of those followers came to Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and asked Ibn Abbas about the witter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa about the witter and Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma he said may I show you the most knowledgeable on the earth about the witter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa may I guide you to the person who among all the people of the earth, the most knowledgeable about the witter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They said, who's that? He said, Aisha, go ask her. It's Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said, Aisha, go ask her. And one of them, he asked Aisha about silk. And she said, go to Ibn Abbas and ask him. So he went to Ibn Abbas to ask Ibn Abbas. He said, go ask Ibn Ibar. MashaAllah. And when he went to Ibn Umar, he said, go ask Umar ibn Khattab. He, he has the answer. And he gave the answer that Umar ibn Khattab gave. So we see it was the habit among the Sahaba not to just rush to judgments. Rather, they would seek the one who had more knowledge than them. So that's a, that's a quality. Of the scholar. So the student, if should follow that scholar, shouldn't be quick to want to give religious judgments. So we went to we reached up to the point where Imam al-Ghazali mentioned for in Kutta. So if you say, Fama bidayatul hidayah, li ujarriba biha nafsi. 
So if you ask me, what is the beginning of guidance? That I may test myself thereby. <coughs> because he mentioned this book is about the beginning of guidance. So he said, no. And who is he referring to? The questioner and murid lil khair. That questioner who is a seeker of things that are good. And that you should know by that. Whenever you're seeking knowledge or you're seeking things, make sure you're seeking that which is good. It's the indication. The seeker should be the one who seeks out good. And among the signs of Allah wanting good for you is that he gives you an understanding of the religion, a desire inside of you to seek the religious knowledge. He said that the beginning, its beginning of guidance is the apparent aspect of a taqwa. It is the outward form of God consciousness, taqwa. And its end is the inward reality of a taqwa, God consciousness. And the real prophet, the real ultimate bliss, no one would have it except the people of Taqwa. The people of Taqwa. And we read that in the Quran, that the people of Taqwa, they are the real successful ones. That the final abode, the end result, the real victory, the real success is going to be for those who are people of taqwa. And real guidance is for the people of taqwa. That's what we read in the Quran. It's the Quran is a book. No doubt in it, it's a guidance for the people of At-Taqwa, the people of God consciousness. So, what is At-Taqwa? We should ask ourselves. So, Imam al-Ghazali, he said, وَالتَّقْوَى إِبَارَةٌ أَنْ إِمْتِثَالِ الْأَوَامِرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَاجْتِنَابِ نَوَاهِي that a taqwa is an expression about fulfilling the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and refraining from his prohibitions. So a taqwa means carrying out the commands of Allah most high and turning away from that which he forbidden. He has forbidden. So in other words, you're going to follow the commands of Allah. Why is called a taqwa? It's because it protects the one who has it from all the ruinous things in this world and the hereafter. It protects its possessor from all of the ruinous things in this dunya and the hereafter. Now you should think about that. If you want safety from everything that is going to ruin you in this world and the hereafter, you need to acquire a taqwa. And when he said a taqwa is an expression of Fulfilling the commands of Allah and refraining from the prohibitions. And that is with knowledge. Because once you know the commands of Allah and you know the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
then you're able to do it or refrain from them. So no way to be a person of a taqwa until you're a person of knowledge. And now you must look at several matters because you need knowledge of the outward aspects of taqwa and the innermost realities of taqwa. You need both. Right? Because prohibitions and commandments relate to inward and outward matters. So you have those outward commands that relate to the body and those outward commands that we, I mean, those commands that relate to the inward state. And then you have those commands or prohibitions that relate to the outward parts of the body and those prohibitions that relate to the inward state of the human being. So you have both. So, the orders and the prohibitions are of two types. And he's going to indicate to us those two types in a brief way, using brief expressions. And this is important because you have two types of works. Those white works that are extensive and, and very expanded and those which are summarized. And you should keep in mind that whenever you hear that something is summarized, the purpose of it is to make it easy for you to memorize. So we should thank Imam al-Ghazali that he said that I'm going to indicate these to you I will expound to you briefly the outward manifestations of God consciousness in both its parts. I'm going to summarize them. Now here, remember, when something is summarized, the intent is to make it easy for you to memorize. So, as Sheikh Yaya mentioned yesterday, that we don't, this is not a book that you just rush through. Even though our intention is to cover it briefly through the whole 40 days, but actually each one of these points we need to concentrate on. Right? We need to preserve it so that when you finish, you are actually the book, Bidayatul Hidayat. You yourself become the book. But one of those pious people, the student came to him and he said, I want to read to you this book. I want to study with you this book. He said, put down the book and read me. You will find all you need in the book. Put down the book and read me. You will find all you need in the book. And some of our teachers, we used to just watch them, and we learned without the study. Just watching them, because they were living the book. Isn't that how Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, described the Prophet, Quran, that his character was the Quran. In other words, he was the Quran walking. You look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you saw the Quran. And that's how we should be with these texts. That if we study these books and we study them well, we are the manifestation of the book. Right? And one can look at you and get an indication of what's in the book. So, he talked about it. It's parts. Both its parts. Now, what are both its parts? What does he mean by that? Of the outward aspect of taqwa. Zahiru and the taqwa. The outward aspect of taqwa. Number one, huwa adab fi ta'at wa adab fi tarkin ma'asi. Two aspects. The manners and behaviors relating to acts of obedience, a ta'at. So that's the first part. So Imam al Ghazali is going to talk about in Bidayat al Hidayat. 
the manners and courtesies related to acts of obedience. And you got to remember, as we mentioned, this world is a brief moment. At dunya sa'a, it's a brief moment. So make that moment a moment of a ta'a. It's brief. Make your time in this dunya a time of obedience. A time of obedience. A brief moment, a time of obedience. And the second, adab fitarkil ma'asi. The manners related to leaving off sins. Because the sins are things that's going to ruin you. And the acts of obedience are the things that's going to save you. And you should look at sins like that. Had people considered sins and their real value, that these are ruinous things. They're going to make me a loser, not a winner, in this world and the hereafter. How about if we just look at that? <coughs> right? No one likes to lose. Everyone wants to be on the winning team. So the one who falls into the sins and does not fulfill all of the acts of obedience, that person runs the risk of being a loser. And no one wants to be a loser. So we should engage diligently to refrain from the sins and engage diligently to do the acts of obedience. Then, Imam al-Ghazali, he said, that I would put Your text is missing something, so let me add it for you. At the end, he says, these are thus two parts to it, and in what follows, I will expound to you briefly the outward manifestation of God consciousness in both its parts. So Imam al-Ghazali said, وَالْأُلْهِكُ كِسْمًا ثَالِثًا لِيَسِيرَ هَذَا الْكِتَابِ جَامِيًا مُغْنِيًا وَاللَّهُ مُسْتَعَانٌ He said, I'm going to attach to it a third section. So he mentioned two. He said, a third section. So this book would be comprehensive and you won't need anything else. And our assistance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is a third aspect of this book. And it is Adabu Suhbah. It is the manners and courtesies of companionship. So you have these first two parts. So it's three parts. The first two, the part of obedience the manners and courtesies of obedience. The second, the manners and courtesies of refraining from the sins. And then the third part, the manners related to companionship. And you need to have good companions. So you need to know the difference between a good companion and a bad companion. Because we call the Sahaba the Sahaba because they were in the Suhba of Rasulullah sallallahu The companions are called the companions because they were in the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu And that companionship was a benefit. And this is one of the things that you have in these sessions is that you're in the companionship of your teachers. And I, I'm telling you, there is nothing like the company of a teacher. 
irreplaceable. And I know we, though we reach out through modern technology and internet and all of that thing, but nothing like the suhbah to sheikh, nothing like companionship with your teacher. Even the feeling close to close, seeing, feeling the vibe, getting the breath from one teacher to another, is a secret in that. Because it may be that this is a connection of breaths. That this person looked at his teacher and got the breath of his teacher. Who got the breath of his teacher. Who all the way got that breath from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Imagine that. That, that. And even if the teacher is not as strong as the one before, the breath of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is stronger through all of them to reach you. That's a good thing. That if you imagine the connection that this teacher touched one of those great scholars, and that great scholar touched the scholar who touched his teacher, who touches who actually touched Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Or that one looked at his teacher, who looked at that teacher, who looked at the teacher, who looked at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who looked all oh, this even to Imam al Ghazali. Right? That we get in this book from someone who received the book to someone who received the book to someone who received the book. There's a benefit in that. So that's why Imam al Ghazali mentioned that. Because that companionship has its traces on the student. And they have a saying that being informed of something is not like seeing it yourself. Being informed is not like seeing it yourself. So this book divided into three parts, and we must take each part. What about acts of obedience? What, is the ma what are the manners related to that and the courtesies related? Because it's not just doing something, it's how you do it. And what about refraining from the sins? There's ways you do that. And how do you accompany? How about your companionship? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that the person is on the way of their companion. So look well who you befriend. Look well because a sohbah has its effect. Who you accompany will have its effect. Because if you have a good companion, it's like being with the seller of musk. You know, earlier today, you... You smell the here, some oil was dropped. And 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 Sayyid Abdul Fatah would rub this thing. And you can smell it. Everyone benefited. It didn't get any, but we benefited because of the sahba. Right? And that's that's a prophetic saying. That that one good companion is like the son of us. Even if they don't give you none, you're gonna get the scent. So here, get these three parts of this book and concentrate on it. Obedience, refraining from the sins, and good companionship. Well, how we should, who we should accompany. And Imam al-Ghazali has this wisdom in his writings, how he classifies things into sections. Like in Al-Ihya, he does the section of Ibadat, the section of Adat, the section of Muhlikat, the section of Munjiyat, the section of Acts of Worship, of customary practices, of this ruinous traits, of savings. You should notice this aspect of it. Right? We have tomorrow and Saturday off. So Sunday, we're going to talk about al kismul awwal fi ta'at, the first section in acts of obedience. And pay attention. How Imam Ghazali, Rahmatullah, discusses. First thing he talked in the introduction was what? How you're supposed to be as a student. What you should intend. And go back to, we talked in our hadith class, the first hadith, إِنَّمَ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَلِكُلِّ مْرِيَ الْمَانَوَىٰ The actions are by the intentions, and everyone will be judged by what they intended. So Imam Ghazali started this book off talking about what? Why are you doing this? 
you want to be guided, first figure out what you're doing and why you're doing it. And straighten your objective. And the reason why you're trying to reach that objective. Is your objective dunya or is your objective Allah? And each has an intention for it. So you want your intention to be pure for Allah, so direct it for that. And then constantly evaluate yourself. All the time you're here, start to check yourself. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Because don't think that the shaitan won't come in the middle of your studies and change your intention. You might start off in the morning, good intention. And then in the afternoon, here comes shaitan with his whispers, and the attention is deviated. So you must be all the time present in your acts. You know why I'm doing it, why I'm doing it, what I intend. And that's what Imam al Ghazali. And then he gave you the signs to show you if your intention is correct. So pay attention to that. Go back and read this introduction. Read it ten times. Don't just read it once. Read it. Read it. Reflect. Take one line. Take one word. Reflect on it. You want the maximum benefit out of your study? Dig deep in the ocean of these sciences. And he mentioned that this would be mughniyan. It would be sufficient for you. You won't need nothing else. And look, the ulama, they explain that if you take this and you take it with such seriousness, you won't need other books, right? Because some books don't mention these matters like that. Or you don't need detailed books. If you just do a little, you can attain a lot. If you do a little, you can attain a lot. Because sincerity is a sword that is never placed on something except that it cuts it. So you just do this with Siddiq. Be sincere. And Allah will open up things for you you can never imagine. And you will be one who right in this place, right in this location, Allah gives you the opening of places where people would have to study 20 years if you're sincere. It's not a whole lot of knowledge. It's truly a whole lot of sincerity. And with a lot of sincerity, Allah can turn a little in knowledge to make amazing benefits. Amazing. To open doors by you but cannot be open by people who have 100 times your level of knowledge, if you are sincere. That's the most important thing. And your proof of your sincerity is your good intention. So always pay attention to what has entered your heart. And train yourself. And we should have like supplemental reading like Habib Sa'ad Eidarus' book, The Book of Intentions, Kitab al Niyat. You should learn how to make good intentions for everything. You train yourself for that, you will always be sincere through everything. And make your intention, I'm going to benefit from every word in this book. I'm not just going to brush through it, go fast. No, every word that is a benefit. And you know how we know every word is the benefit? Because in our texts, in our explanations, you'll notice that the scholars, they stop at every word. And they would try to explain those words. Why? Because in each word that Imam al-Ghazali selected, there is a benefit there. There's a benefit. So we should train ourselves to grasp it. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, may Allah make this session a benefit. Give us to benefit from this knowledge and make, those, make us beneficial to others by this knowledge. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanata wa fi al-akhirata hasanata wa kina dhabi nar. Allahumma inna nasalaka bi jahannabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at-tawfi fi kuli umurina. 
اللهم إنا نسألك بجاه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الآفية في الدين والدنيا والآخرة إلى حضرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين الحمد لله We are going to move on insha'Allah ta'ala in our discussion and study of Imam Ghazali's foundational work Bidai Tal Hidai, the beginning of guidance and Imam Amin Muhammad was unable to make class today so insha'Allah the Abdul Faqir will be filling in for him and as I understand it that we have finished the introduction up until this point and we are ready now to begin part one and keep in mind that Imam Ghazali defined for us taqwa this ever so important concept or reality of the deen and we should always be wary of presenting taqwa in a superficial way is that yes you can summarize taqwa in a simple way yet it is never simplistic because even when you present it in a simple way it is not simplistic because that it relates to every aspect of the religious life and that when you really that dig down deep to understand what taqwa is there are a lot of things that you have to know to really be a person of taqwa. And in the end, what's more important is that we put it into practice as, to, as opposed to knowing the theory, but the ideal is to join between two because when you gather the knowledge base or the theory and you have the ability as well to put it into practice, then you're in a position that you can teach and help others. And what I mean by that is that if you look, for instance, about what taqwa is, you have to know a little bit about the decision-making process. You have to know a little or a lot about the state of the heart and about the thoughts that come to the heart and about how, depending upon your state of where your nafs is, you might respond to those thoughts that come to the heart, whether they're of an angelic nature, an egotistical nature, or a demonic nature. And then you have to have the knowledge to discern what you should do and what you shouldn't do and there's that steps that you can then take to determine whether you should act upon a thought or not and then at an even deeper level how do you motivate yourself to begin with to even put your knowledge into practice and to be that someone who that lives according to that the sunnah of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that living its realities all of this relates to taqwa and so taqwa is a very sophisticated, nuanced, deep reality of the deen. And this is ultimately what it's about, is to be a person of taqwa. And there are so many Quranic that verses that pertain to taqwa. Imam al-Haddad, in one of his works, is that he mentions that many of those verses and all of the merits of the people of taqwa. And I remember that whenever you used to part from a teacher in Mauritania, they were known as a Morabit, and these are people that are in a sense guarding the frontiers of knowledge, and they would have a mahdara, which is like a little school. And when you would leave them, is that they would always enjoin you to have taqwa. And they had this beautiful way of doing so, is that they would shake your hands in the way that the Mauritanians, that customarily shake the hands is beautiful. They kind of ga gather, grab your hand and, and move their hand up and down and you do so with them. And then the shuyukh would that quote the verses of taqwa and remind you to be a person of taqwa. Yeah. And then they would make dua for you and they would bl then blow in your hands and then you'd go on your way. But it was a powerful interaction that you left as you embark upon your journey having firmly rooted in your mind that I have to be a person of taqwa. And th their mercy and their presence is very impactful on the heart. And so he, 
spoke about taqwa and talked about its uh, different breakdowns. And so part one of this book is going to deal with obedience and how it is that we can obey our Lord inwardly and outwardly. And then part two is about refraining from disobedience inwardly and outwardly. And then part three, he's going to sum up for us some of the most important etiquettes that relate to us and the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala, the etiquette of the scholar, the etiquette of the student, excuse me, and the etiquette that we have with other people. And so this is a comprehensive book, although it is small and brief and concise, it is at the same time comprehensive. Is that anyone who takes this book seriously and puts it into practice will see wonders. If you take this one book seriously and you read it as we all should with the intention of putting it into practice and making it a reality in your life, you will see wonders. Doors that open up for you that you thought would never possibly open. Your perspective on life completely changing. You experiencing the beauty of practice in ways that you never did before. And so that we have to have a good opinion of our Lord is that He didn't guide us to a study of this book except that He Subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to be able to reap its fruits. So let's look at what Imam Ghazali says. And the, again, for those that are following in the book, this is on page 24. Part 1 on obedience. That he says, Know that the commandments of Allah Most High pertain to the obligatory and the voluntary. So these are the awamr. The word awamr is the plural of the word amr, and it's a command. And yes, even the recommended, which each <coughs> translates here as voluntary, they are a division that relates to the command of Allah. It's just that the obligatory is an emphasized command of something you have to do, whereas the voluntary or the recommended is still a command, but it's, it's not reach the point of emphasis that it becomes an obligation upon you to do. And so we do have to be careful in just breaking down the deen into kind of a halal, haram, permissible, impermissible type dynamic. Yes, at the base level, that's important. However, that this is a book of Ihsan. And we should have a different perspective that follows the dictates of Ihsan. And that is is that we see ourselves as traveling a path. And far from the methodology of the general folk, which is, okay, I'm just going to do the basics and only do what I have to do. The seeker is someone who sets their eyes on their goal, and anything that helps them reach their goal, they do it. Anything that's going to take them away from their goal, they leave it and abstain from it. That's a seeker. And so what that means is, is that they will hasten to not only perform the obligatory, everyone has to do that, they will also hasten to the best of their ability to also perform the voluntary, the nawafa, the, the acts that are recommended, just as they will hasten to refrain from anything that is haram, they will also that do their best to avoid everything that is makru, offensive. So he says, know that the commandments of Allah Most High pertain to the obligatory and voluntary. And just one other point on this, it's from the blessing of Allah. Because of the diversity of the Prophet's Ummah, because he is a universal Prophet, he is for all people in all times and all places, that we have within the sacred law that which caters to people at all different levels, the most basic and the most advanced. So what a blessing to think about that, is that everyone has to do the obligatory, which actually if we would divide the acts that are obligatory upon us compared to the choices of the possible things that we could do, it would only be a tiny fraction of possible things. The obligations are not many. And it's unfortunate some people, even Muslims, see Islam as having a lot of rules. Yes, it does have regulations. Everything that can be done 
has a ruling that is associated with it, and that's from the blessing of Allah. But if you look at it from the standpoint of obligations, they're actually very few compared to what are all of the possible things that one could do. But it allows for not only those people to fulfill the basic level of obligations, then there's degrees after that of what it is that people do from the supererogatory. So this is a great blessing to have in our deen a mechanism whereby it allows for different people to strive at different levels in all that still be from the community of our Prophet Now what is he going to say? The obligatory acts, the fara'id or the fard, constitute the capital. This is your ratsu mal. This is your capital by which salvation is attained. You have to do this in order to attain salvation. This is what our Prophet said in the famous hadith which we've all heard multiple times the man that came to the Prophet and he said that he was only going to do the basics of the deen and that was it and the Prophet said is that he will be successful if he is sincere. So there's no doubt if you perform the basics you will be successful. قَدْ أَفْلَحْ He will be successful and you will let attain bliss in the next world as, as a result. And now it is important to note as well is that the closer and closer that one gets to the end of time the harder it becomes to even perform the basics. So actually we live in a time where people just to perform the basics there's much more reward in doing so in times of fitna in particular the time in which we live than it was in times when it was easier to perform the basics because society was there to help, your family was there to help and so forth and so on. Except in the scenarios where people actually didn't have that because they grew up and were raised in places far from the centers of the Muslim world. <coughs> and so the obligatory acts constitute the capital by which salvation is attained. The voluntary acts, the supererogatory, it is your ribih, it is your profit, by which are reached the high levels of success. Okay, and the word he uses here is foes, foes, bidarajat, the various degrees of success. And he's going to quote to us a very important hadith Qudsi now, a divine saying. And so just as a businessman, if you want to go into business, you have to have capital or else how are you going to go into business? How are you going to open up a store? You either have the money or you have to borrow the money. And in order to make money, you have to have money. Now, we're not talking about working for someone and getting a salary here, but if you want to open up your own business, you have to have money. And you're not going to be able to make profit unless that you have capital. And then, the more capital that you have, the more investments that you can make, the more merchandise that you can then purchase and then resell. And then your capital grows, your capital grows, and the more, generally speaking, that your capital grows, the more opportunities that you have for profit. So with this is the way that we have to see in relation this the g obligatory acts in relation to our tijara with Allah. It, because this is something that Allah speaks about in the corner. It is a tijara, is that you are that doing things to draw near to Allah Taala, and as long as your intention behind it is that seeking other worldly reward and closest to Him, it's not blamery. That's what you're supposed to do. So he's going to quote a hadith now that says the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Allah Most High says, those who draw near to Me do not draw near to Me with anything better." than the acts that I have made obligatory upon them. That should be our perspective of the obligations. Not this is something oh, I have to do. This is the ultimate opportunity to draw near to Allah. And it's much more difficult to perform an act that is an obligation as opposed to an act that is just recommended. Why? It all relates to our nafs we do not like to be told what to do. If someone told you right now, you have to pray 20 raka'ahs of tarawih, okay, it might be heavy on you. But if someone told you that you had to pray 
that five Lohar prayers over because you prayed them outside of the time or you didn't have tahara and try praying 20 rakahs of qada, of make up prayers. It's much more difficult. And that relates to the way that we respond to knowing something is imposed upon us. It's heavier on the nafs. As a, and it should be, as opposed to something that is recommended. It's much easier just to stand up after the Isha prayer and pray two or four rakas than it is to that make qala of a prayer, for instance. And so the way our perspective of the obligations should be one of this is the greatest opportunity for us to draw near to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a servant continues to draw nearer to me by voluntary acts of worship until I love him. MashaAllah. This is such an important hadith. We all have to memorize this hadith. Everyone should memorize this hadith. If you can, in Arabic and English, and if not, at least in English. <laughs> and so, the Prophet Sallallahu that is conveying to us a hadith, and this is a divine saying. Allah Ta'ala is speaking in the first person. A person of how we draw near to our Lord. The obligatory acts are the capital, that's the foundation. And then to the degree that we perform the supererogatory, the more that we perform in general, the better, as long as we're not sacrificing quality. What does it lead to? Hatta. And this is a very important particle in the Arabic language. And one of the meaning of hatta is that it's the raya, it's the final outcome, or that it's the end result of something. Hatta uhibba. The result of all of this, after you go through the process, of performing the obligatory and doing what you can from the supererogatory, it leads to becoming beloved to Allah. And this hadith, one of the reasons it's so important, is because it gives us the goal of worship in the religious life is to become beloved to Allah. And what that enables us to do is to have the correct perspective when we go through our worship on a day-to-day -day basis and sometimes we get bored unfortunately and sometimes that it's hard on it hard on us sometimes that we fall short in it this motivates us to know that it's not just about those outward motions it's not just about struggling to concentrate therein if you do this and go through this process it will lead you to becoming beloved to Allah and what greater thing could you possibly want? In other words, that this will help us, help prevent us just going through the motions. Is that we're struggling, we're doing all of this to become beloved to Allah. And this is the goal of the religious life, is to become beloved to Allah. And this is the greatest honor of all, and the greatest thing that you can attain. It's greater than you even loving Allah. It's greater than you having contentment for Allah and being content with Allah. This is the greatest thing of all. Just as it's greater to be remembered by Allah as opposed to you remembering Allah. We're supposed to do all of those things. And there is someone who is in a state of tahabbub, which you're striving to get close to Allah. And then there's someone who's mahbub, they're beloved to Allah. And we know that when someone becomes beloved to Allah, Allah informs Gabriel that so-and-so has become beloved to me, so be love him. And then Gabriel will inform the angels in heaven that so-and-so is beloved to Allah, so love him, and they will love him. And then the effects of that in the earth will be, well, He will be given acceptance in the earth. Think about that. That is extremely powerful. That you can do something and then do it over and over again and you can become beloved to Allah. La ilaha illallah. And everything else in the hadith is just going to inform us what happens once you reach the state of becoming beloved to Allah. And so, not everyone who loves Allah is beloved to Allah. 
and this is why there's a difference between a state of tahabbab where you're striving to become beloved to Allah in a state of being mahbub, where you're beloved to Allah. And there's a story that they mention about Imam al-Haddad, that there were two brothers, one of them was a scholar and one wasn't. And they came into the presence of Imam al-Haddad, Imam al-Haddad outwardly was blind. And when they entered into his gathering, the, the Imam al-Haddad gave a warmer welcome to the brother that wasn't a scholar. And so something came to the heart of the scholar. Maybe because he's blind, he didn't know that that was me. He thought that the brother was me. And so that when they were getting ready to leave, is that he went first this time. And again, when he bid them farewell, he that paid more attention to the brother who was not a scholar. And then the man had a thought come to his heart. And Imam Haddad turns to someone so that they could understand indirectly. It says, what is the difference between two people? That one of them is already beloved to Allah and the other is still trying to become beloved to Allah. And so, I mean, you were asking about that earlier, but it, it's, that shows you there could be someone who's not a scholar that is more beloved to Allah than a scholar. And in this case, his brother, he was beloved to Allah. And even though his brother was a scholar, he was still that going through that the process in order to become beloved to Allah. And so this is, this is really the essence of this whole affair. And this is why he mentions this in part one right after, right after his introduction. This hadith is very foundational. As it's laying out the path to show us what it is that we can attain in everything that is that we can do, that we do. And if we don't think be beloved, being beloved to Allah is something great, then you have to distrust the people who are. And I remember our teachers saying about this, that if someone becomes beloved to Allah, there's no way for the tongue to articulate the greatness of what they will experience. And we just get snippets and we get little tiny glimpses and flashes of what the people who experience who are beloved to Allah. And that's a great thing in and of itself just to get a glimpse from someone who's experiencing that. Let alone if they're from the elect of the inheritors of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi they're experiencing that in a way that most people on the face of this earth aren't. And so, Hatta uhibba Until I love him. And then, and when I love him, I become the hearing with which he hears, the sight with which he sees, the tongue with which he speaks, the hand with which he strikes, and the foot with which he walks. And there was a story about this many years ago. I was in Virginia and I was in a masjid there. And we were waiting for Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad to come and deliver a lecture. And I think he was coming from Arizona. His flight was late. And I believe it was on a Monday night. And it was getting late. So the faqir was just trying to fill in for him until he came. And, and one of the things that I mentioned was this hadith. And I translated it somewhat along the lines of the way that we have it translated here. And there was someone present who that noted after the Fakir had spoken that there was a danger in translating the hadith like I did because someone might th think that somehow that Allah is in that person or something like that like they are there's incarnation implied mm -hmm. and they actually ended up leaving and so what was interesting is that sometime after that when Sheikh Abdul Hakim said, came, and he was speaking, he also quoted the hadith. And then he paused right before quoting the hadith. And he said, if there's any literalists here, they better get up and leave before I translate this hadith. <laughs> and then he translated it almost exactly the way that I translated it. And I, I looked at one of my friends who was there, and I was like, subhanAllah. Like, that's like, he didn't know that it happened, but that's, 
is essentially what happened. Someone was uncomfortable with the way that I translated it, and she ended up leaving sometime after that. And then he translated it almost exactly like I translated it. Yeah, but he said that just before, if there's any literalists here that are worried about that, they better um, get up and leave now. How else are you going to translate this? Kuntu sam the I become the hearing with which he hears. It doesn't mean that Allah exists within us. Hasha. It means is that now your hearing is different. Allah Ta'ala, that if you become beloved to him, he takes over your affairs. And you will be able to hear what other people don't hear from the power of Allah. And that you will benefit from your hearing in ways that other people don't benefit. Likewise, you will be able to see what other people don't see. And you will use your sight in ways that other people don't use their sight and benefit from it. In your tongue, in your hand, in your foot, all of this is indicating that Allah Ta'ala has taken over that person's affairs. And this is why when someone becomes a wali, not just a general wali, that's protected by virtue of his or her faith, Allah is the wali of those who believe. But when you move up in the ranks of closest to him so that you become a higher degree of wali, now that you are close to Allah, is that the word wali comes from that this person tawalat ta'atuhu, is that they have that successively worshipped Allah until they've been accepted, fatawallahu umuruhu. In both versions of that tawala and tawalla relate to the word wali, waliya yali. And other words is that when someone becomes a wali, it's acquired in the sense that you have to put effort in. But then Allah takes over your affairs for you. And if Allah takes over your affairs, la ilaha illallah, is you focus on your relationship with Him and things work out in amazing ways. And when we were indicating the other day, and the Eid khutbah about our relationship with the means. Everyone has a relationship with the means. You will always have a relationship with the means. But some people will be engrossed in the means. Other people will kind of have like a middle way type of interaction with the means. And other people, their interaction with the means becomes much more subtle. Is that they actually place less eff effort in and because they're so preoccupied with their Lord, is that things work out in much better ways than those who actually plan because Allah has taken over their affairs. And if you've ever spent time with the people of Allah, you will experience that. You will experience that. And you will that see divine facilitation manifest in the world by virtue of these people. And you'll, you'll be in a state of awe because that if Allah Ta'ala wants something to happen, he will create the means for that thing to happen. And the principle states is that the more we direct our concern to our Lord, is that the more that he takes care of our affairs. And this is why they say that your sustenance, your physical sustenance is passed out after Salat al-Fajr. But to spend that time worshipping Allah in a state of dhikr or learning or something for the afterlife, it's one of the greatest things that you can do to facilitate your physical sustenance. That it brings about more facilitation in your physical sustenance for someone to quickly go out and be an early bird to the workplace and to do everything it is that they can do to earn money. It will be facilitated for people that are directing their attention to their Lord in the early part of the day in ways that won't be facilitated for those other people. And this is the had hadith in Bukhari. And so then he says, And you, dear seeker, will not be able to rise to carry out the commands of Allah Most High until you monitor your heart and limbs in your every moment and every breath from the time you wake up until the time you sleep. So, don't think that's going to be easy. He's saying now that, okay, 
carrying out the commands of Allah and doing what you can from the supererogatory, this is sounds simple. And from one perspective to understand it, it is simple. To make it a part of someone's life is not easy. And he says, in order to do this, you have to monitor your heart and limbs throughout your day. And this is the essence of what Ihsan is, according to the Prophet's definition. The lower of the two levels is to constantly monitor your heart and your limbs and to be in a state of vigilance. And that leads to the higher degree of divine witnessing. And so if you need to do this, then that there's a lot that we need to know about creating a schedule for ourselves and the various wala'if or duties that we can have to do from morning until evening. And so that he says here, Know that Allah Most High is closely observing your innermost heart. He beholds your inner and outer being. No thought, moment, or step of yours escapes his regard nor any of your moments of stillness or movement. And what does that do to us when we recognize that and realize that and are aware of that? It puts us in a state of muraqaba, of vigilance. And vigilance is something that everyone can do. And the reality of it is that we bring to heart and we are aware that Allah Ta'ala sees us in every single moment. Everything that we do, every step that we take, every decision we make, every thought that comes to our heart and the way that we react to it. Allah observes our innermost heart, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He sees us at all times. All sin stems from heedlessness. To the degree that we are heedless is to the degree that we will sin the more wakeful and aware, aware that we are, the less that we will sin. And one of my teachers was asked about something that someone can do that would gather all types of good for them. And he responded by saying, being in a state of muraqaba, being in a state of vigilance, being aware that Allah sees you at all times. Because if you are aware that Allah Ta'ala sees you at all times and you've done what it is that you need to do in terms of acquiring sacred knowledge and you're in the process of learning, you will know what is the best thing to do or at least something good to do in every given moment. And that's really what it's about. How can you and I respond to every moment, not just in a way that's permissible, but in a way that's pleasing to Allah, and the higher degrees of ihsan is that we want to respond to the moment that we're in in the way that's most pleasing to Allah. And that's really what we are striving towards. In every single moment where our Lord has put us, seeing everything being from Allah, is that you respond to that moment in the way that is most pleasing to Allah. And there are righteous people who are aware of that in every moment of their lives. That their Lord sees them and they are responding to that moment in a way that is pleasing to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what enables us to maximize our potential and this is what enables us to have exponential increase in the spiritual path. Both in the company of others and in the solitude of yourself, you are ever in His presence. He sees you at all times. In both the hidden and manifest dominions, nothing that is still is still and nothing that moves moves. But the compeller of the heavens and earth is aware of it. He knows the treachery of the eyes and what is concealed in the breasts. He knows the secret and what is still more hidden. Subhan. And that we should reflect upon this. The fact that Allah wa ta'ala knows everything. He knows what is concealed. And so outwardly, if I'm speaking right now in my heart, I could be saying things in my heart. Because our self speaks to our self. We have inner speech. 
And is it good? Is it bad? We could right now in this moment be having inner speech. That no one else can hear that outwardly. But Allah Ta'ala knows what it is that you are saying in your heart. And when you come to recognize that, you recognize that yes, you might not sin. And we just took this earlier in the fifth class in the previous period. Is that one of the seven things that if you make the intention to do in your heart, but then you actually don't do it unless that you say it on your tongue is in intending to say something bad about someone, intending to commit a sin with your tongue. And as long as you don't say it, and then you repent from it, is that it won't be written as a sin. But Allah Ta'ala, He sees that and knows and hears, subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything. And so, the righteous don't even like to have sins that committed with their inner speech in their heart. Let alone do something like commit ghibah outwardly. They don't even want to commit ghibah and backbite in their heart. And they stop themselves and repent from it. And when the heart becomes pure, that those thoughts never actually, actually ever even come to the heart. And then he says, therefore, ayyuhad miskeen, O destitute one, O impoverished one. When we really think about our state, we are miskeen. And all people are misakeen. Everyone around us is also in the same state. Therefore, O destitute one, cultivate a deep courtesy with the divine in your outer self as well in your inner self. He says, fata'addab. Have adab, have adab in courtesy with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala because that we are in His presence always, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, O destitute one, cultivate a deep courtesy with the divine in your outer self as well as in your inner self, the courtesy and bearing of a humble, erring slave in the presence of his supreme, all-powerful master. Make your greatest effort that he not find you present where he is forbidding you to be, nor find you absent for where he has commanded you to be. This is something I used to mention all the time in the place that I studied, is that we don't ever want to be where Allah Ta'ala has forbidden us from being. And we don't ever want to be absent where He has commanded us to be, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we're commanded to be somewhere, be there. When you're that prohibited from being somewhere, never ever be there. You will never be capable of this unless you manage your time and organize your routine of worship from morning to night. So pay attention to what is presented to you here concerning the commands that Allah Most High has laid upon you from the time you awake from your sleep until the time you return to your bed. So he's going to give us a beautiful map of the things that we should do from the time we wake up in the morning until the time that we go to sleep at night. And one of the good things that we can do, because this is in book form for those that have high aspiration, is that you can put them on a document and list them from the things that you should do in the morning to the things that you should do at night. You can number them if you wish. And that you could have one document that summarizes them and then another document that goes into more detail. And there might be things that you add that are not from Bidai to Hidai. And it helps as well because there might be things that you modify from Bidai to Hidai. And so to create like a list of things that you do from morning to evening and then on a daily basis, bi-weekly basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, you can take yourself to account to see, am I doing all of these things? What's called muhasaba. You take yourself to account to make sure that it is that you're doing what it is that he is laying out for us to do. Inshallah ta'ala, we will stop there and Imam Amin will pick up tomorrow, bi ta'ala, uh, from page 26, under the subtitle, The Etiquette of Waking from Sleep. May Allah to Baraka Ta'ala give us tawfiq and open up the doors of His mercy to us all. Ya Arhamar Rahimim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in these days. In the ayam at-tashriq. And that may Allah to Baraka Ta'ala bless us with 
the prayers of the people that performed Hajj and returned them to their families safely, Ya Arhamar Rahmin, after having benefited immensely. May Allah Ta'ala accept our prayers and give us tawfiq and to that bless us to be able to take a path that ultimately leads to the closest to Him, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that we've even given tawfiq to perform all of the obligations in the way most pleasing to Him. And we'll be people who that devote our lives to various types of super auditory deeds whereby which that it leads to the fruit that we become beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we seek the fruit of that in this world and in the barzakh and in the akhirah wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أسأل الله تبارك وتعالى أن يجعل نياتنا خالصة لوجه الكريم اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جاءته سهلا وأنت تجعل الهزن إذا شئت سهلا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم We are continuing in our study of the book Bidayatul Hidayah, authored by the great Imam and scholar Hujatul Islam, Imam Al Ghazali, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And we're in the section of obedience or acts of obedience. And it is important that when we think of acts of obedience, that we organize our lives so that we could take the most benefit from each moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in this life. And you should keep in mind that this world, it is a brief moment a brief moment and you should make this brief moment a moment of obedience and when you think of acts of obedience you should think of them in terms from the beginning of your day to the end of your day and you should keep in mind that you may not live to the end of your day. So every breath that you have is a precious gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you should take advantage of because it may very well be your last. You should keep this in front of you all the time. That every individual is going to taste death. And you want to make sure you end your life in the best way. So it is important for you to watch your time in your moments. And since that is the case, our religion, Al-Islam, has specified the most beneficial things we could be engaging in at each moment. Whether those actions are acts, what we do with our limbs, so at every moment you're watching your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, your tongue, your entire body, you're observing what you're doing and how can you maximize that moment with those limbs or with one statement. So what are the best things I could be saying at that time? What are the best words to use at that moment? And then watching your states, how should I be at that moment? 
And then in terms of those things, look at obligations and recommended matters. Because in the beginning of this, Imam al-Ghazali, he talked about the fard and the nafal, the obligation and the recommended matter. And he said that the obligation is the very essence of all your property. And that is the basis by which you make your transactions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your optional things are the extra profit you get. So we should consider at each moment what is obligatory upon me and what is a recommended thing I should do. So Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah after going into that he talked about the adab or the manners and the courtesies of waking up. But now consider yourself when you sleep not all your sleep is in the night, some is in the day. So you should know whether the sleep is in daytime or the nighttime and what is beneficial to do at each moment. So he said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when you wake up from sleep, try to be awake before dawn. So we're talking about the sleep at night. And the sleep at night, there are specific things that you should engage in. So you wake up before Fajr. And that time, waktu sahr, that is the time between the last third of the night and Fajr. So that's the time before you want to be up at this time. And that time is a very important time. And if one is not in the habit of doing a lot of Qiyam al-Layl, the night prayer, that this time you should definitely try to catch, just before Fajr. And you should always make some time before the coming of Fajr for Ibadah, for worship. It is a time where the assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is available for everyone who wants to seek it. And you should be looking for those times where you can get the most assistance and the most spiritual aid from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the night, that time is a good time. And that's why the pious people, they were diligent about this time of the night. Even when they saw, and we talked about in our previous class, we was talking about the obligation of removing injustice, right? Even when they wanted to go to the unjust people, they would say to them, stop your injustice or we will fight you with the arrows of the night. Subhanallah. What does this mean? That means during these precious times of the night, they're going to make dua against them. And those unjust people would immediately get nervous at this because they even knew in the benefit of the night what is there. So he mentioned, let the first words in your heart and on your tongue be the remembrance of Allah Most High. So, you should have it that when you make dhikr, that your tongue and your heart are both engaged. So if you're going to have this dhikr, you want both of them engaged at the same time, your heart and your tongue. So meaning you're uttering these adhkar and in your heart those meanings 
are being pondered upon and reflected. Learning to use your inward and outward states. If you're not able to do both, then have the meaning in your heart first and then follow it with your tongue. But nevertheless, give each of your organs in terms of your heart and your tongue its portion of the dhikr. Give it its portion. So he said, say at this time, Allah. And it is important to get those adhkar that are related from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Imam Al-Ghazali here with this series of prayers that you would say, he collected them from many books of hadith, not just one saying. So you're going to hear, have here what follows a collection of different narrations put together so that you maximize everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned or most of it in relation to this time. So he said, say at this time, praise be to Allah who has brought us back to life after causing us to die. And here you should think about something. That sleep is close to death. So it's like two types of death, the death of sleep and the death of the real losing the soul from the body or the soul going away from the body. And here you want the benefit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time he brings you awake from sleep, you can remember the resurrection. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after you sleep, he gives you awakeness. And after death, he gives you another life. Don't forget the hereafter. Don't forget the hereafter. Because in this dhikr, in this dua, Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi nushur. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us life after causing us to die and we will go to him, we will be resurrected. That's something to ponder on. Not just make the dhikr and just words going. No, what is the meaning of that? That we're going to have a questioning after our death, on the day of judgment. And we're going to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as soon as we wake up, we should be reminded the fact that we woke up, we need to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. We need to praise Allah. Because it's a na'mah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala woke us up and gave us a chance to do what? More ibadah. More istighfar. To make things better. So praise Allah for that na'mah. And sometimes we just wake up like that's what's supposed to happen. And we don't think. This is a gift from Allah that he gave us another opportunity to increase in our acts of obedience and to seek his forgiveness for our mistakes. Then he went on to say, and this narration is related by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. This part of it is related by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. So you can see how he gets from different aspects. Then he said, we have entered the morning as has the dominion belonging to Allah. Asbahna wa asbah al lillah This part of the narration related by Imam Muslim Related by Imam Muslim in the Sahih. So you have different parts of the narration. You should keep in mind these things. Then he said, 
grandeur and might belong to Allah. Magnificent and power belong to Allah. And this was related by At-Tabarani. This part of it by At-Tabarani. And there is in another narration from Imam Ahmed, which he mentions, Asbahna ala fitri al-Islam wa ala kalimat al-ikhlas. That we have entered the morning upon the natural faith of submission and upon the word of sincerity in the religion of our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the nation and the nation of our forefather Abraham a pure monotheist and one who submitted to Allah who was not of the uh, idolaters here you something reminded that we're on the fitrah of Islam. We're in the pure nature of Islam. Readiness for the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as you wake up, you think to yourself, I'm in the state of purity. I'm ready for the awamirillah. I'm ready for the commands of Allah to fulfill them. Allah gave me that ability. When you make that dua, and on the kalima of ikhlas, and that is safety. You woke up as a Muslim. La ilaha illallah is in your heart. That is safety. That is salvation in this world and the hereafter. And in every one of these lines, you should be thinking about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me. How am I blessed to be in that state? وَعَلَى دِينَ نَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَعَلَى مِلَةِ أَبِيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمِ هَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ You're on the deen of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. The religion of Sayyidina Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. خير قلق الله. The best of all the creations. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You think about that. That Allah favored you to be in this deen. And that's one of the things you should think when you wake up. Raditu billahi rabba wa bil islami deena wa bi muhammadan nabiyya wa rasoola. That I am pleased with Allah as my Lord. Islam as my deen. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the messenger and the prophet. And that is a gift from Allah. So if you wake up with this type of mentality, this type of thought, that's the state of one's heart, one's mind, one's tongue, what's going to follow next? One's actions. One will be able to have tawfiq in one's good deeds. Don't think that these things don't have an effect because they do. It's starting all in the state of your heart, how you feel about all these matters. Then you uttering them as a confirmation in your heart. And then you'll see the deeds will be easy for you. But you have to connect yourself to the way of the Prophet. The Prophet didn't legislate these things for his ummah for naught. He legislated them for a benefit. So you should reflect upon it. Then he continued, O oh Allah, by you we enter the morning, and by you we enter the evening. So you're going to say this in the morning and the evening, you'll have this supplication. And by you we live, and by you we die, and the resurrection is to you. Subhanallah. Wabika nahya, wabika namut, wa ilayka nushur. Is our life really for Allah? 
Do we live solely for the sake of Allah? Keep these dua, they're indicating something to us. And that's in the indication is a clear expression. This affair is about Allah. It is Allah who gives us life for a reason. He causes us to die for a reason. And he sends us back to him for a reason. That's what we say, right? When someone dies. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Inna lillahi. We belong to Allah. So if we belong to Allah, how should our life be? By way of Allah. Through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so should our death. And the one who has this mindset is going to have husnul khatimah. Going to have a good ending. Must have it. Here, then he continues. Oh Allah, we ask you to send us the good, send us to every good thing on this day. And we seek your protection from doing evil this day. From bringing it upon a Muslim or from anyone bringing it upon us. We ask you for the good of this day and the best of what it holds and we seek refuge with you from the evil of this day and the evil of what it holds. We ask you, O oh Allah, to give us the best of this day. Not only the best of this day, the best of the time, every moment of the day. Think about your time. Because moments change. That are good at one time and bad at another time. So we want every moment the good that is contained in it. And in every moment, we seek refuge from the evil that is contained in it. Whether it is in the night or whether it is in the day. And think about any evil you commit or transgressions to others, ponder on these things. Because in this, I was sitting back thinking about this dua. I was like, wow, so many fawaid, so many benefits in it. Sometimes we worry about ourselves, but what are we doing to others? What is happening to the other? Because the believer has this aspect of caring about others more than they are concerned about themselves. The believer is concerned about the other. So you don't not only want the best of the day for yourself and the protection of the evil for yourself, but for the others as well. Right? The Prophet ﷺ told us, لا يؤمن أحدكم None of you really truly have belief. And what do we mean by belief? Kamal al-Iman. Complete, excellent faith. Until you love for your Muslim what you, brother or sister, what you love for yourself, min al-khayr, among the good matters. That's a real believer. So even in your dua, first thing in the morning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding you. I mean, the Prophet sallallahu is reminding you. Think about the others as well. Sheikh Samir, he, he says this a lot. We are good when it comes to our own matters, but we are not so good when it comes to the matters of others. When it comes to our own matters, we're concerned. But for the other, we lack concern. And here's the Prophet wasallam telling us to be concerned about the other Muslim. To be concerned. So the first things you're waking up, Imam al-Ghazali is indicating you, don't just be thinking about yourself, but think about the rest of the Muslim ummah. Pray for their good too. Pray for their protection of evil too. And here, you start your day like that. SubhanAllah. You start your moon, first thing. Then, Imam al-Ghazali moves to the mannerism of getting dressed, putting on your clothing. 
adabu libas put it on your clothing so he said thereafter you make this dua when you get dressed you put it on your clothes make your intention obedience to Allah's command by covering yourself appropriately right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us with covering ourselves. And we learned in our classes about covering your aura from the human and the jinn. So you should be reminding because you're not just covering your aura from the humans but also from the jinn. And then you think about that. Since we're doing both, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah said, naka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Alameen here, the humans and the jinn. So be reminded you're not the only one in existence. And then you think about the all-encompassing nature of the prophetic message, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Then you thinking, Make your intention to fulfill the command of Allah in covering your aura. Emtithalin li amrillah. Fulfilling the command of Allah. And you notice Imam al Ghazali in that beginning of this section, he talked about your obligations. That's an obligation. So not only that you're getting dressed for to look nice, but you're really getting dressed because Allah orders you with that. He ordered you with it. And that's first. Keeping in your mind everything you're doing, lillah, for the sake of Allah. And that's the why to everything. We, we are in a constant to ask why, 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 why. Why? Because Allah ordered you to do it. And he is a Rabb and we are Ibad, servants. So if he commands, all our thing is we hear and we obey. Establishing your heart. Imam Ghazali is very wise in the way he words things. Establishing your heart, you're doing things for Allah. That's why you're doing it. And that's the priority in your life. That's why he's talked about the awamir. He talked about the orders and the prohibitions because that's the priority. Fulfilling what Allah wants you to do. That's what he created you for. And that's the most important thing that you have to do. Obey Allah. That's important. For no other reason except that he deserves it. That he deserves to be obeyed. He deserves to be remembered. He deserves to be thanked. This is important. And with these books, you cannot just breeze through them. You will not benefit. You, you have to take your time. And you have to think. And you have to give the works of Imam al-Ghazali, who spent years traveling the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, struggling with himself, to Allah illuminated the path to him. And made him a beacon of light for everyone else. So it takes us to ponder on his words. To really think about it. And then to put ourselves in a state where everything he says start to resonate in our life. It's really a part of us. So he said, covering your aura, fulfilling the command of Allah. And beware lest your intention in wearing your clothes be to, be to display before people 
and you suffer loss. Look at this statement. He said, Wahdar. Be in a state of Hadar. Be warned against this. Be aware. So if he's telling you, watch out. Watch your intention. Go back to that first thing in Al-Bukhari. The first thing we learned in Muqtar al-Hadith. Your intention. Make sure it's right. Make sure you intend Allah by this. Because sometimes, watch yourself when you get dressed. We, especially our sisters, men, some men do it, but not many. But the woman, she needs to be real careful. And watch. La ilaha illallah. Watch yourself to when you get dressed. Look at where your gaze goes when you get dressed. You'll know by that the state of your heart. You should watch. And that's why he said, be warned of it. Be warned of it. Be aware. This is something you need to pay attention to. That your intention, when you put on your clothes, is to be displaying yourself before the creation. You put on this clothes to please Allah. And wear the best clothes for the sake of Allah. Train yourself for that. You know if you have a guest, you put on your clothes, you make sure everything is nice, but when you're in your privacy, how do you dress before Allah? When you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should try to have on your best dress. Because actually he's not your guest, you are his guest. The fact that he let you in his dominion and let you walk on his earth, you are a guest to him and you should honor your host by coming in the appropriate attire. Inwardly and outwardly. Because the best dress in inwardly is a taqwa. So Imam al-Ghazali talked about a taqwa earlier, right? And the outward dress is that dress that shows the beauty of this religion. That shows Allah's favor upon you. Dress nice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To show the ni'mah of Allah upon you. Allah likes to see the traces of his favors on his servants. So dress accordingly. Even Some of our teachers, they said, dress in the clothing of the righteous. Why? You want to show veneration for those righteous people. To get people to have a longing and a love for the pious because the pious connect you to the, uh, to the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu They can take you to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet connect you to Allah. out of veneration and honor. So when you look at what you should wear, you should look at the clothes that the Prophet ﷺ wore, that the righteous wore, and fashion yourself in that model out of love for them. And hopefully, if you love them enough, you act like them, you dress like them, you will become like them. Insha'Allah Ta'ala. That's a step. Then, he talked about, but before I go to there, he said, beware of that because you will suffer loss. So he's mentioned a disease of the heart that happens called a riya, ostentation. Showing off. And he's mentioning it in your clothes. So before you go out the door, why are you dressed like this? Are you hoping someone looks at you and says, wow. 
لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله And we should think when someone looks at us, are we putting ourselves before the one whom they should keep their gaze at all the time? Allah. That's something to think about. We should be signs that manifest the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not ourselves, right? So beware of this disease. So it's something about you to put on your clothes and you should think about the disease of riya. Because they call it riya as shirk al-asgar, the minor shirk. Doesn't take you out of religion, but it's among the major sins, it's among the kabair. So he's not only encouraging you, giving you targheeb, encouragement to do the good deeds, but he's also giving you targheeb, telling you, watch yourself from the sins. And the sins, whether they are outward or inward, they are destroyers for your akhirah. They are things that's going to cause you to be a loser. And I want you to think deep about this issue. Because the sins, they are of levels. Right? And shaitan tricks you by these sins. Get you to do a lot of small sins. Those small sins start to lead you to the big sins. And if you get accustomed to those big sins, they lead you to the thing which will take away your Islam which is disbelief. So you have a sagair and you keep doing those, it becomes easy for you to do al kabair And then those kabair when you do too many of them, they lead you to al kufr So you should always be warned because the warning here is to watch subtle things that come to the heart that can lead to great things. That's why the believer always has to be present. Present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every moment. Allah. So consider your intention and consider if ostentation or showing off is entering because that's going to lead you to loss. And that's just in your dress. But imagine if you're conscious of your clothing and what you're putting on and why you're putting it on, what's that going to do for the rest of you for your day? Like if we wake up and we start waking up with pious intentions, putting on our clothes with righteous intentions, we're directing our heart and our body through the rest of our day to get the absolute good from it and to be protected from the evil of it. Then he's talking about adab dukhul al qala the manners and the behaviors and the etiquette of using the lavatory, going to the bathroom. Because usually when we get up, if we think about the human nature, we have to go to the bathroom usually. That's one of the first places we enter. So now there is adab. But keep of this. He started off, right? After telling us about the obligations. And then what is Imam Ghazali talking about? The ad, uh, the manners. Write this lesson. Write this point, rather. Dinuna, our religion, all of it is ad, uh, our religion. All of it. Every single aspect of this deen of Islam is your manners and behaviors. That's your deen. And every single thing you do, you have to observe the courtesies of the sacred law, of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
revealed and what the Prophet ﷺ conveyed. It's your manners. How you deal with Allah, how you deal with the creation, how you deal with yourself. So what are the mannerisms, those behaviors that relate to you going to the bathroom? So he said, when you go to the lavatory, enter with your left foot and leave with your right foot. So how your movements is. And likewise, the bathroom, any place where filth exists or sins are committed. So even when you go to the mall, don't go with your right foot. <laughs> go with your left foot. <laughs> because what happens in the mall? We talked about in the hadith. Lying, cheating, inflating prices. These places... They contain filth. So you go to the masjid with your right foot. To those places. And if you're entering with your left foot, that should tell you something. That's not a place you really want to be, right? Except by necessity. You know, in the early days, And, the, and, and they used to have, around Masjid Ba'a Alawi, around Ribat area, you know, that used to be enclosed. And they used to, didn't leave, let their children go out of that area until they were like pubescent and they knew all the rules and everything to their hair had grown as a protection. Even they didn't let them go to the marketplaces. They would frown on them to do that. Protecting the children. Right? Teaching them of the noble places. And even with the feet, there's an indication in that. If it's not recommended to go with your right foot, that means it's not a recommended place really that you should be attending. And when do you go to the bathroom? When there is a necessity, right? You don't just go anytime. You go when they have a necessity to relieve yourself. So likewise, when you go to those other blameworthy places, in terms of its uh, superiority, you should go to them for necessity. In the good places, you should go to them out of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. So the masjid be something you attend. Watch even your feet. There is indication where you move your feet. Do not take inside anything that has on it the names of Allah Most High or His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even if you got money and you should keep this man in the money they have in God we trust. Take the money out your pockets. Or don't like try to if you can when I say take it out your pockets meaning if you have a place outside that you can safely keep the money, don't take it in the bathroom. Because you have the name of Allah, no necessary to take it in. If you have to, you take it and you make sure it's covered. But don't expose money in the bathroom. It has the name of God on it. Don't you know, in God we trust. And speaking of money, when you see money on the ground, pick it. Why? Because people may walk on it. Even these pennies, they have the name of God. They're stepping on these things. And this is something with the name of God, even in any language, is to be venerated. So be observing of these things. Because as believers, we have ta'adheem for the name of Allah, for the name of God, for the name of the prophets. Alayhimu salatu wassalam. We have a, sort, a level of veneration for that. Or the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just his name or his attributes. Like so you don't take the Quran in the bathroom. 
in the name of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so you don't have the ring with muhammad on it or something written with muhammad or some people now they're putting these shirts and they go in the bathroom with muhammad be careful of these matters or the name of any of the prophets ibrahim isa musa or any of the angels Allah Remember it is our obligation to have veneration for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his messenger and for all things that are considered noble and honorable in this religion The venerations in the heart and expressed by what you do as you move about Allah And he said do not enter with a bare head or bare feet. Because you expose yourself to the jinn. And one of the things you expose yourself by going in the bathroom, some of the scholars said, is forgetfulness. Going with one's head uncovered in the bathroom is a means to expose you to forgiveness. So we study <laughs> knowledge then we go in the bathroom with our head uncovered and everything goes out subhanallah that's something to think about I never connect the two right but the because those places filthy places the jinn inhabit them and you expose yourself or getting even the bad smell in the hair, they say, are traces from that. But worse than all of that, in terms of our veneration for the Prophet is you lose part of the Sunnah. Because the Prophet وسلم, he would cover his head when he went into the lavatory. So just that alone, Never mind the other things, which are important. But you lost a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And if you love the Prophet ﷺ, the true sh exemplification of that love is you're following him. You're following the Prophet ﷺ. You want to show your love, follow him. The Prophet did it, sallallahu alayhi wa You know, some of the scholars, they would eat certain kind of fruits, and they, they didn't eat certain fruit. And that's why you didn't eat that. It's sunnah. He said, yeah, but I don't know how the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa did it. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Even to the point of how he did it, they were concerned. How he did it. And this is one of the benefits of those hadith that are musasal, that they are continuous from scholar to scholar, scholar back to the Prophet ﷺ. Many of the scholars, they had a great love for that because they actually learned the how of doing things, how it was conveyed. Very important. And one of the great scholars who passed, but he was in this era, Sheikh Muhammad Yasin Al Fadani, rahmatullahi he was known for collecting these type of musalsalat, having these hadith that are continuous for this area, for this issue, for this issue, for this, and that's all love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So think about those matters, and likewise for the feet. Because you don't want to step in najasa. You don't want yourself to be afflicted with filth. Allah. So when you enter, say, in the name of Allah, I seek refuge in, the, uh, in Allah from filth and impurity. And from the defiled one who defiles 
Satan the accursed. Allah. Bismillah. Wa a'udhu billah. Min al rijsi al najis al khabif al muqbith shaitan al rajim. There is a reminder there. And the ulama, they said, when you say Bismillah, you're seeking protection in the, of Allah. And they said, don't add Ar Rahman Ar Rahim because that wasn't narrated from the Prophet. Just Bismillah. Which gives us the indication that is also connected because it wasn't related. Bismillah Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. So they said, Bismillah. Allah. Then I seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. And you should seek refuge in Allah from every haram thing, every ugly thing, every punishment, every curse, and every act of disbelief. So those are protections. And every filthy act. Because that's all a reminder. Just going into the bathroom, remind of all these matters. That filthy thing in and of itself. Even those who assist shaitan. These are filthy matters. Subhanallah. Because how we learn these bad things and these ugly things from shaitan and his helpers. May Allah protect us from them. Just going in the bathroom, giving us that reminder. And if we think about all these things, and everyone who is like that, shaitan and all of his helpers and all the filthy things that come from them are distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they cause you to be distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is in your vicars and dua that you do in your daily practice. You see there a reminder there? You should think about them more as we do them. We're constantly reminded of the battle we're in. Because our battle is against, in this world, against shaitan and against his helpers that's trying to take us away from the straight path. So even in our entering the bathroom, we should be thinking about these matters. We should be reflecting on them. Then he mentioned, and upon leaving the lavatory, say your forgiveness. And here, Gufranak, it will repeat it three times recommended. Three times. Is recommended to repeat that. Right? And then continue. Your forgiveness or praise to the one who takes from me what harms me and leaves me what benefits me. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah alladhi adhab anni ma yu'adhini wa abqa alayya ma yanfa'uni. Subhanallah. And that's from your physical matters. Allah is taking you out. That's a ni'mah that you can go to the bathroom. That you can relieve yourself of those matters. So that's why you're saying alhamdulillah. Because imagine if you couldn't go to the bathroom. Ya Latif. Subhanallah. It will lead you to death. So the fact that you do that with ease and facility... You need to thank Allah. That's why I said he needs to be obeyed. He needs to be remembered. And he needs to be thanked. And that's something that we just do as a customary practice. And we don't think about the ni'mah inside of it. There's a favor from Allah. You know why? He don't have to do it for you. And he doesn't. 
that has no right on Allah in relation to you that is binding on him. Nothing. He does everything. Fadlun minhu. It's a generosity from him. It's a generosity from him. And since he is giving you so many generosities, you need to give him much more thanks. And if you give him more thanks, he will increase you from his generosities. So even when you're saying this supplication and this remembrance, you should be thinking that because of this, there's going to be a ziyadah for me from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An increase from Allah's generosity towards me. Just as you say these words. And remember that Allah is constantly blocking away from you harm and giving you benefit. Which should increase you in shukr. Insha'Allah will continue uh, tomorrow. But really, tonight, you got time to memorize these quickly. These adhkar, these adiyya, put them in your mind. And then when you use them, let your heart roam in reflecting on these favors from Allah. Inshallah. Let us make dua. Rabbana atmanuna nurana wa fillana inna kulu shayin qadir. Rabbana la tuzik kulubana ba'adith hadithana wa hablana min andunka rahma inna kantir wahab. لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له لا مكل الحمد يحيى ويميت وعلى كل شيء قدير لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم على صح رب اغفر لي وللمؤمنين ومن ذريها منهم الأموات رب اغفر لي وللمؤمنين ومن ذريها منهم الأموات رب اغفر لي وللمؤمنين ومن ذريها منهم الأموات سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يصفون والسلام المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين. After it gets in your clothes, you pray, you invalidate your prayer. So you should keep the issue of ensuring that you get out all of the urine from your private organ. If you are in a in the desert, go out of the view of people, and if you can find something to screen yourself, keep behind it. Do not uncover your nakedness until you reach the place where you will squat. And here, covering your aura is a very important matter. And protecting yourself from the human and from the jinn. Because even though you don't see the jinn in this world, they see you. So you should always cover your nakedness and be keen to do that. One case which is going to come is even in the shower when you're alone, you should not uncover yourself unnecessarily. You should wear some kind of cloth to cover your aura and then wash beneath it. But do not get in the habit of exposing your nakedness. So even to the point when you're squatting, you should move your clothes, lift them, to the necessity until you get lowest to the ground or to the place where you're going to squat and then lift only for that time and immediately cover yourself. This is extremely important and it's part of the manners of the believer and it's a part of the shyness to protect yourself from your unlawful nakedness being exposed. Even when one is with one's spouse, one should be careful in this issue not to look at one's unlawful nakedness without a necessity. Like, uh, then the author, he said, and do not face the sun or the moon and have them directly, nor have them directly to your back. Likewise, do not face the direction of prayer, nor have it directly to your back. Do not use a place where people are accustomed to gathering and talking, nor a place where people are accustomed to taking shade. Do not relieve yourself 
in standing water or beneath fruit bearing, a fruit-bearing tree, nor in the animal's burrow. Do not relieve yourself on hard earth or into the wind so as to avoid splashing and spraying. For he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, the punishment of the grave is from it. And here, there are several things mentioned that Islam teaches us manners for those sacred things and for those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used as signs for us, like the sun, like the moon, and things that is reverence, like the direction of the prayer. Out of our respect and reverence for these signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't urinate or defecate facing them or in this way. Likewise, our respect for human beings and their places of gathering so that we don't do nothing that harms others. And that is your transaction and your dealings with the creation. Islam is keen on respecting the rights of others. We are not people who harm, we are people who bring benefit. And we're just in this matter of how the courtesies and the etiquette of relieving oneself and where to do it and where not to do it and the way to do it. But you can see the Islam's observance of the rights of others. And just imagine you see sometimes where people don't, who don't follow Islam and they don't obey these rules, you would be in places where people gather and talk and you smell foul scents. It harms others. Islam forbids us from doing such things. And even to harm animals so you don't go to the bathroom or relieve yourself in holes in the ground because animals may be in there. And even the jinn may inhabit that. So even though we don't normally come in contact with jinn knowingly, but the jinn inhabit these holes. And one of uh, the companions, he had urinated near, as some of the scholars mentioned, and he was killed for that. The jinn killed him from going inside the hole in the ground. So these things we observe in our religion, but we notice that our religion has a connection with everything in the universe. Everything in existence, there's some kind of connection. And as a Muslim, we need to be keen, keen to observe our relationship with everything in the world. SubhanAllah. Not just we're here and not observing everything. But to fulfill all these things, you need to be in a state of what? Awareness. You need to be in a state of vigilance. Observing your surroundings and observing your rights on the creation and the creation's rights on you. It's the innermost secret in the prophetic guidance and how we deal with others and the creation, animate objects, inanimate objects, that things have a certain <coughs> manners that we must deal with them. And then we think about this hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that the punishment of the grave is mostly from the traces of the urine. So even in the life, in the intermediate world, you have the punishment of the grave for not protecting yourself from the traces of urine. So it's a reminder of not only the things we do in this world, but what is the effect in Al-Barzakh, in the intermediate world? What is the effect of what we do here? So then you should think about what state you want to be in the grave. It's constantly on your mind. And as we talked about earlier, when we talked about 
loving this world and how it is the essence from which sins emerge, we should be thinking about what's going to come after this world. What is my state in the grave? And constantly aware of the end of your affair, right? What's going to be my state in the hereafter? So I'm conscious in everything I do in this world. Then the author said, use your left foot to lean on and do not stand to yawn unless it is really necessary. And the ulama, they mentioned that it's dislike to stand unless there is more fear of a chance of getting the jasa by sitting. And that's what the scholars, they uh, gave interpretations of the narrations that the Prophet Sallallahu at a time stood while going, <coughs> relieving himself, and they mentioned these reasons. Among them was that, was the fear of, by sitting, being affected by the Najasa. And this can happen, like, especially if you go to, like, the public bathrooms on the highway. Sometimes it's just urine all over the place. And in sitting, you would get soiled. So in such case, it may be better, more safe to not uh, be in that position. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He said, use stones, or you can use toilet paper, as well as water. If you intend to use only one, then water is preferable. So the base is to use both, which is better. Because if you use toilet paper or some absorbent material, right, then it removes the iron or the essence of the najasa, and then you follow it water to clean it. But if both are not available, then water is more preferable because it can move the najasa. Uh, while we're talking about that, do not, be careful to not do like some people do who are not cautious and have not learned the matters of the religion, is that they wet the toilet paper and they use that. This is not valid to use for istinja. Why? Because the wet toilet paper is going to smear and move the najasa. And it is conditioned for, the legit, uh, for using other than water is that the najasa is not uh, moved from its location. So that the toilet paper must be dry. Likewise, I see sometimes those people, uh, we see people using um, wipes. You cannot use this for because it has moisture and the same concept. So if you want to think about the objects that you use besides water, they have several conditions that must be met. Among those conditions is that that thing is pure, right? That the thing is solid, that it is uprooting, that it has the ability to, to absorb, right? And it is not something that is honorable in the, in the religion. So you cannot use like religious papers or you know, f uh, other matters that religiously has a value to them or has a, an honor to them. Then the author, he said, In the case of defecation, if you want to use only stones, you must use three clean, dry stones, and this is toilet paper as well, we can say. Uh, wipe with them the unclean areas so as to prevent the spread of filth beyond the original area. So you must use, as an obligation, at least three uh, stones or three uh, pieces of paper to remove the najasa. And the what removes the mass of the najasa is counted as one wipe. So even if you use a lot, more than three, to remove the bulk of the najasa, you count that as one. And then you follow it with 
uh, two more. And then in the case of you ain't wiping yourself with three sides of a large stone or three small stones. If three stones are not sufficient to clean yourself with completely, use five or seven or more to complete your cleansing with an odd number. To use an odd number is preferable, but to completely, to complete the cleaning is obligatory. So here, when you use just toilet paper, it is sufficient to wipe to an extent that only a trace is left that can only be removed with water, right? So you could be wiping and wiping and wiping till you remove most of it, but only what is left would be needed, water would have to remove it. This is excusable. But since we're in our time, most of the time we're going to have water, so we should follow with both. Then he mentioned, use only your left hand to clean yourself. Because the right hand, it is used for eating and drinking and clean matter, so you don't use it for removing filth. And that means you would take the paper and everything with your left hand and you pour the water with your right hand. Upon finishing the process of cleaning, one says, Allahumma tahir kalbi min al-nifaq wa hassin farji min al-fawahish. Then you make this supplication, O oh Allah, O oh, oh my Lord, Allahumma, purify my heart from nifaq and keep my private parts from wrong action. So there is this connection with a physical act and a reminder of the obligation related to that physical act. Because as you're cleaning yourself, your body, you should think about the state of your heart. Right? Because the Prophet wasallam said in that hadith, أَلَا إِنَّ فِي الْجَسِدِ مُدْغَى إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسِدُ كُلُّ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسِدُ كُلُّ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ Right? That verily there is in the body, a piece of flesh, if it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. He said, Allah wa al kalb. Verily, it is the heart. <coughs> so even though you're purifying your organs, right? That's an outward manifestation of purity, right? What about the tahara of your heart? So the dua comes, Allahumma tahir kalbi min al nifaq and what is really hypocrisy? It is to manifest one thing and to actually believe its opposite. So here, as Imam al-Haddad said, try to make your inward better than your outward appearance of piety. Right? Make your inward state even more pure than the outward state you have. And if you can't do that, at least try to make them equal. Right? so that you perform equally in private and public. And, and that is to remove this aspect of hypocrisy from the heart. And then protect my private organs from vile deeds. So you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you from the sins. And you must realize in this that it is not you who protect yourself from sins or give yourself the ability to do acts of obedience. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you tawfiq to do the good deeds. And he protects you from the sins. And that's what is mentioned in one hadith for the meaning of la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And we say that. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. لا حول أن معصية الله إلا بإسمة الله ولا قوة على طاعة الله إلا بعون الله. That that is narrated that the meaning of that is that no one can get away from the sins except if Allah protect you. That's how you get away from the sins. Not because you're such a special person, 
that Allah gives you isma, Allah protects you. And no one has the ability or the strength to do acts of obedience except that Allah helps you, Allah assists you. So here in these dua, that's the indication. Oh Allah, help me to have a pure heart. And oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, protect me from vile deeds with my private organs. Then the author said, it scrub your hands with the dirt off the ground or wall or with soap, then rinse your hands with water. So after doing that, make sure you clean your hands. And, and one of the things about Islam is cleanliness. It's extremely important. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves those who purify themselves. And they have this saying, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, you know. Want to be a saintly type of person? Be clean. And in all inward and out. And just if you're constantly doing outward cleanliness, it should remind you about the state of your inward cleanliness. Because there's the outward and the inward. And every time you do something, you think about both. The outward and the inward. Right? Don't just think of the physical action. But what is the spiritual benefit and secret connected to their action. And really that is tasawwuf. In these books, books of spirituality, books of uh, tarbiyah or training, it's training both the outward and the inward. You notice this is the theme of Imam al-Ghazali's books. Imam al-Ghazali just doesn't talk about the outward act because you know Imam al-Ghazali was a faqih. He was a scholar of fiqh. He wrote books in fiqh. And his books used to be Reliable books in the Shafi'i school, right? And even today, some of his books are still studied, like Al-Wajiz of Imam Al-Ghazali. It is still studied today in some circles. Or Al-Khulasa, or Al-Wasid. These books are published and people read them and benefit from these are books of fiqh. As well, and they're dealing with the outward aspects of the religion, and he has books like Bidayat al-Hidayah, like Minhaj al-Abidin, like Al-Ihya, that deal with that inward state and that inward spiritual struggle. So we should keep both. Then Imam al-Ghazali mentioned the section of the manners or the etiquettes of ablution, al-wudu. And here you should keep in mind especially as a student of knowledge and as a seeker for the hereafter, that you should always be in the state of wudu. As soon as you break your wudu, immediately renew your wudu. This is one of your greatest weapons against the shaitan, that you're constantly in a state of purity. Whether that purity is outward, or an inward state. You're always in the state of purity because that's your weapon to fight the devil. So he mentioned having cleaned yourself after relieving yourself, do not neglect to use a tooth stick. Siwak. A siwak to use that piece of the branch to clean your mouth is a highly recommended sunnah. That all of the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions and all of the righteous after them, they made it a habit to use this. It was almost like a part of their body. And they had it with them and they used it. And we should, even though sometimes we fall short in these matters, we should start to practice them. Because they're, I'm talking about regularly, even though you do it, but be keen about it. And, and, and when we don't have it, we should say to ourselves, I'm really falling short. Like we should think about that. Like this is a part of the religion that's easy and sometimes we neglect easy things. And you know, we may deem it little sometimes because of our lack of understanding of how these things benefit us in the hereafter. But keep in your mind, as they say, little things mean a lot. 
little things mean a lot. And truly, this is not a little matter. It's a great matter. And the proof of its great matter, look at what it does. For it purifies the mouth. It purifies the mouth. And what is the mouth used for? The mouth is used for reciting Quran. The mouth is used for reading the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The mouth is used for dhikr. The mouth is used for a da'wah, calling people to Allah. And it is through this means that you have a clean, pure mouth. And it pleases the Lord. SubhanAllah. We want always to get the Ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the greatest thing we're looking for in paradise, right? The Ridwan of Allah. And that use of that siwak is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we want to return to Allah well pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with us. Right? So we should do things that's going to earn Allah's pleasure. Isn't that the call? Ya ayyatuhal nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbika radiyatin mardiya, right? That is the concept. To return to Allah tranquil, in a good state, with Allah being pleased with us and us being pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his jannah. This is the reality. So this is a means for that. And it displeases shaitan. The devil. And the devil is our enemy as we talked earlier. And we should take him as an enemy. So we should make him always be in a state of dissatisfaction. And to stay away from us. And we should have certainty in all of these matters. Because the Prophet Sallallahu told of his benefit. And the one who has certainty. Real strong certainty. Shaitan will flee from their very shadow. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu said about Umar. The shaitan flees from his very shadow. That Omar takes no way except shaitan takes another rope. And that's because of the strongness of his certainty. And if we have certainty that the Prophet ﷺ is true, وسلم, and he is truthful in everything he told about, then every mad he told about it, we know it has that benefit. It's going to please Allah it's going to displease shaitan. And shaitan is not going to stay close to someone he's displeased with. He's going to get away. And just like Allah will be close to the one he is pleased with. So do that which is going to please your Lord. Subhana. And that is related by Al-Bayhaqi. And we mentioned Al-Bayhaqi. Do anyone remember what we said that the scholar said about Al-Bayhaqi? What did they say? Of Imam Shafi. Of Imam Shafi is better to Imam Shafi. But Al Bayhaqi is different that Imam Shafi is better to MashaAllah. Why? Because he uh, established uh, like proof for the Madhab and made it established. MashaAllah. So he relates a prayer before which one has used a tooth stick, the siwak, is better than 70 prayers without having used the tooth stick. SubhanAllah. So there is a virtue in using a siwak, right? Salatun bi siwak afdalu min sab'ina salatin bi gayri siwak. The salat with that siwak, using it. Even when entering your house, use it. When waking up, use it. Making wudu, use it. Much usage of the siwak. It is related from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Were I not afraid that I would cause hardship on my community, I would have ordered them to use the two stick before every prayer. And this is related by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. It is also related that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, I was commanded to use the two stick until I feared it would be obligated on me. 
And we said this is related by Imam Ahmed in which book? In which book? Muslim of Imam Ahmed. Are y'all writing all these things down? We mentioned three books of Al-Bayhaqi. What are they? Not you. <laughs> Which, come on. Which three books? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. One more. Ma'arif. Okay, go back. Go back and check your notes. Ma'arif the Sunan wal Athar. Right? Wal Athar. Write that book. And in Aqidah, we mentioned one of his important books. What is it? Kitab al Asma wa Sifat. Right, okay. Tayyip. So that is related by Al Bayhaqi and Ahmed about the tooth stick in Bukhari and Muslim. So had Prophet didn't want to make difficulty on us, we would be doing siwak as an obligation. So to let you know it has a high value. Then the author said, then sit for the ablution facing the direction of the prayer in a raised place so the water does not splash on you. And say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Rabbi a'udhu bika min hamazati shayateen wa a'udhu bika rabbi an yahduroon. which is in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Oh my Lord, I take refuge in you from the incitement of devils and I seek your protection, oh my Lord, from their being present with me. And this uh, is among the well-established uh, dhikrs, dua, that you say related to al-wudu. And the ones that come after it, some of the ulama, they, they didn't prefer them because they said they were reached by weak chains of narration. But this one, and Sheikh told us when he was talking about this, he said, if you don't do anything else, make sure you do this one. So, and, and take them step by step. He, he mentioned that it's like that you don't try to do everything, right? Because they, they say, the one who seeks knowledge, all of, it, all of it in its entirety, will lose it all in its entirety. Like, مَنْ طَلَبَ الْعِلْمِ جُمْلَةً فَاتَهُ jumla. The one who tries to get knowledge all at once is going to lose that knowledge all at once. So step by step. Don't overwhelm yourself in your beginning. Like take portions. So the book should not be, because we mentioned that the book should be studied at least how many times? Three, right? So the first time you're going over it, you're grabbing some matters and you're putting some to use. Then the next one you add some more. Then the third one, to you become like a part, one with the book, inshallah ta'ala. So we should start with this first one. So by the next class, you will all have this memorized, right? Inshallah ta'ala. Tayyip. Then wash your hands three times before dipping them in the wash basin. So that means if you're going to put your hand in there, you want to ensure also that there is no najasa on your hands. Because if you have this small container of water and you have najasa on your hand, what happens to that water? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Right, it becomes najas, right? And the three types of water are that which is? Right, good. Inshallah. So, you wash them three, and this is sunnah. As you do so, you say, oh my Lord, truly I beg of you good portents and blessings, and I seek refuge in you from bad portents and loss. Then make the intention of lifting the state of impurity or of fulfilling the requirements to be able to pray. You must make the intention before washing your faith with this intention. The, without this intention, the ablution is not valid. And really here, the intention is made at the time of washing the face, not before. 
in the school of Imam Malik is valid to have the intention a little bit before washing the face. But in the school of a Shafi, the intention is at the time of washing the face. So if you make the intention when you're washing the hands, you must keep that intention and have it present at the time when the water first touches the first part of the face. Then take a handful of water and rinse your mouth three times, making sure the water reaches the back of your mouth, except if you are fasting, because in your fasting, when you're fasting, you should go lightly. Why? Because if the water goes in, you will fear of breaking your fast. Then say, O oh my Lord, help me with the reading of your book and much remembrance of you and establish me in strength with the word that stands firm in this life, in the life of this world and in the hereafter. And that firm word, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So as you're making wudu, what should be reminded, you should be reminded of, because this is your mouth, reciting the book of Allah and making dhikr of Allah, right? And, and, and make it our habit that every day we get our portion of Qur'an, right? Every day you have your portion of Qur'an. And, and, and put your all into it. So even when you're making wudu, and you wash out your mouth, think about the Qur'an, and think about the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time you make wudu, that should come. Because that's where, that's where those come from, your mouth. But also put your heart there inside that you make recite the Quran while reflecting on its meaning as well as reciting its words. And you make dhikr while we fight, reciting, uh, reflecting, excuse me, on the meaning of the one who is mentioned as you're reciting the words. Then take a handful of water for your nose. Draw it in and blow out the mucus from your nose. And do this three times. As you draw the water in, say, O oh Lord, let me smell the fragrance of paradise. And may you be pleased with me. As you blow the water out, say, O oh my Lord, I seek refuge in you from the foul odors of the fire and from the evil of that abode. You know, as I said, they said that these different uh, supplications are not confirmed from the Prophet Sallallahu but in them, there is a reminder. And even though they have weakness, the scholars have agreed that in fada'il a'mal, in virtuous deeds, it's permissible to act upon weak hadith. Whenever, and that's a rule. According to the majority of the scholars of hadith, they said, whenever you have things of virtuous deeds, or at targib or tarheeb, or encouraging you to do good, and or instilling fear in you from committing bad, you can use weak hadith for these things. And Imam al nawawi mentioned it in the beginning of his books, like the Arba'in al nawawiya and the Adhkar, he mentioned this issue. So don't be uh, so worried about that because the scholars made a, 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 a room for you in this issue. And the only ones who didn't take that are those who went to excess in their censoring matters that they deem not to be from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now there is another way to do that, because he mentions it separate, to take three in the mouth and then three in the nose. There is another way to take three handfuls, one for the mouth and the nose, then for the mouth and the nose, to the mouth and the nose like this, <coughs> this is valid too. So you can do it both ways. <coughs> then take a handful of water for your face and wash it lengthwise. But now remember that water when you hit the face, this is coming to the obligation, right? So that must be at the same time with the intention. Because even though we have the arkan of wudu, according to the shafi, are how many? Six. And the first two, 
intention and washing the face, they are at the same time, right? So keep that in your mind as you're going through this. And with it washed lengthwise from the beginning of the uppermost part of the forehead to the end of the point of the chin and across from ear to ear. Make the water reach the temples and the point from which women are accustomed to moving their hair from the part, the part between the top of the ear and the corner of the temple. That is the portion that constitutes part of the face. Make the water reach the four places where hair grows, the eyebrows, the mustache, the eyelashes, and the cheeks. That is what lies in front of the ears from the beginning of the beard. The water must also reach the roots of the hair of a thin beard, though not the thick beard. Because you know we said when you have hair on the face, if it is thin, you must make the water reach to its roots. If it is thick, then you can wipe over the surface of that, when you, uh, wash over the surface of it. So thin and thick is, can you see the skin from normal distance of conversation? Mm -hmm. But do not omit wetting a thick beard by passing your fingers through it. As you wash your face, say, oh my Lord, make radiant my face with your light on the day you make radiant the faces of your friends and do not shroud my face with darkness on the day you shroud the faces of your enemies with darkness. SubhanAllah. You know, Ibn Abbas, he explained this and it is narrated in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir that he said on the day when certain faces are whitened and certain are darkened, he said on that day is the day of judgment when the faces of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah will be lightened, subhanAllah. Mm -hmm. And that is something that one of the earliest narrations that we hear about talking about the term, the people of the Sunnah and the majority of the Muslims of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So a way to have your face illuminated is like you learned in your Aqidah class what Imam Al-Tahawi said, هذا ذكر بيان أقيدة أهل السنة والجماعة this is an explanation of the creed or an elucidation of the creed of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a. And to make sure that your convictions and your tenets of faith are in accord with the way of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a is a way to illuminate your face on the Day of Judgment. So, Alhamdulillah, we are happy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us among the people of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a. And wash your right hand and forearms up to including the elbow and half of the upper arm three times. Mm. Then do the same for the left, for the adornment in paradise encompasses the places touched in ablution. SubhanAllah. So you should extend even in your feet up, above your head, all the way up, so that you extend and you extend your illumination on the Day of Judgment as well. We want to be light, right? The Prophet Wasallam will recognize the people of his Ummah from these signs, from these traces of Al-Wudu. Allah. As you wash the right arm, say, Oh Allah, give me my book of deeds in my right hand and judge me with leniency. And as you wash the left arm, say, O oh Allah, verily I seek refuge from you, from you giving my, me my book of deeds in my left hand or from behind my back. So even when you're washing your arms, you should be thinking about what's in the books of deeds, right? What are the good deeds that are going in your book for your hasanat? And what are the bad deeds that are going in your book for your sayyat? And you should be thinking about that. Because if you get your book in your right hand, then you're a winner. If you get your book in your left hand from your back, you risk, the, you risk the chance of being among the losers. And that is mean you fell short in your deeds. So one should be, even when you're making wudu, thinking about the matters of the hereafter, right? Because that's going to be on the day of judgment, right? After your deeds are weighed and you give in your book, so you should be always, even in your wudu, you're thinking about Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's something to think about. 
Because we don't normally think we're making wudu, we're just thinking about washing up. But actually, you should be conscious of this world of purification in this world and being in the state of uprightness on the day of judgment. So the wudu should be constantly reminding you of you being in a state of rectitude all the time while you're making wudu. And you're reminded, if you imagine if you every prayer you start to make your wudu with these supplications and these adhkar, like, subhanAllah, what, is you going, what are you going to be like in your practice? If you really, really pondered on these things. Then wetting, wetting your hands, wipe your head, touching the fingertips of the right and left hands together, placing them in the forelock and moving them back to the nape of the neck and forward again. Do this three times and do similarly with other parts of the body. Say, O oh Allah, shower over me your mercy. Rain down on me your blessings and shade me in the shade of your throne on the day, of, on the day when there will be no shade but your, say, your shade. O oh Allah, make my hair and the skin of my face forbidden to the fire. But you think about the day of judgment. When the sun is going to be a mile away from the servants, some people are going to drown on their sweat and some people are going to be protected under the shade of Al-Arsh when there's no other shade. And among those is those people who love each other for the sake of Allah. The one whose heart is attached to the masjid. These people, they're going to be under the protection and shade of Al-Arsh. Allah. Then the author said, then wipe your ears outside and inside with fresh water. And place your forefingers inside your ears and wipe the outside of your ears with the middle parts of your thumbs. Say, O oh Allah, make me of those who listen to the word of Allah and take it in the best way. O oh Allah, let me, with the obedient ones, hear the caller to heaven. SubhanAllah. What about your ears? Are we hearing obeying? Are we listening to the Quran? Are we listening to the words of the Prophet Sallallahu and applying them, in, applying them in our lives? Very important. So you think about this when you're washing your ears. Then wipe your neck and say, Oh my Lord, free my neck from the fire and save me from the chains and shackles of punishment. Here, wiping the neck according to Imam al-Nawawi, that that's not from the Sunnah. It is an innovation. So the reliable opinion in the Shafi'i school is not to wipe the neck. So this is considered a weak position. Though there are narrations in relation to it, but Imam al-Nawawi, he said they are fabricated and some mention that they are weak, like Hafiz the Iraqi. So this is not you may see it, but in the more reliable books of the Shafi'i Madhab, you won't see that. Wash your right foot and then your left, including the ankles. With the little finger of your left hand, wash between your toes, beginning with the little toe on the right foot and finish with the little toe on the left foot, approaching the toes from below. As you wash the toes of the right foot, pray, O oh my Lord, make my feet firm on the sirat on the day that feet slip and fall into the fire. While washing the left foot, pray, O oh my Lord, I seek refuge in you from my foot slipping on the sirat on the day that, this, that slip the feet of the hypocrites. Bring the water halfway up your shins and be sure to repeat all the actions three times. So remember, washing three times is a separate sunnah, so intend to thereby the sunnah as well. When you do those three washings, Intend that as a sunnah to get complete uh, reward. And when you complete, when you have completed the ablution, say, I bear witness there is no God save Allah alone who has no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad wasallam, is his servant and his messenger. Glory and praise be to you, O Allah. 
I bear witness that there is no God save you. I have done evil and I have wronged my soul. I seek your forgiveness. I turn to you in repentance. Forgive me and accept my repentance for you are the one who accepts repentance. The merciful, O oh Allah, make me of those who frequently repent and make me of those who purify themselves. Make me one of your pious servants. Make me always patient and grateful. Make me remember you frequently and praise you at the each at each day's beginning and at its end so you end your wudu with that inshallah tabaraka wa ta'ala we'll stop here and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us have a complete wudu that after that wudu we come out pure and clean forgiven and accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in سبحان ربك رب العزة يوم يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته الأكرمين تابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين once again, I will be filling in for Imam Amin. He is preoccupied with the summit that he has arranged. He had a, a large weekend program held at his masjid in Atlantic City. A successful program that I understand went very well. May Allah Ta'ala accept from all of those who presented and attended and all those who arranged it. And may it be a means and source of great good for the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu here in the United States of America and abroad, inshaAllah Ta'ala. And that, alhamdulillah, as we progress through these texts, is that the way that it's been turning out is that we have different teachers covering different sections. And there is a benefit in that, to get different insights from different people. And this is the way that these texts are, is that, yes, it's set in terms of the words that are on the paper, but different people are granted different understandings. This is something that you find when there's multiple commentaries on one particular text is that different benefits come out of different perspectives that different onlookers to the text. And one of the things that you'll find as well in terms of your own self, in terms of you accessing the meanings of the text, what you understand from it now might not be what you understand from it in five years or in 10 years or even in 20 years. And our teachers who taught us these texts have studied them maybe 40 to 50, sometimes 60 years ago was the first time they first studied it. But you'll find them in their 40s, in their 50s, in their 60s, and sometimes into their 70s and the 80s, and maybe even after that, still teaching these same texts. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like, oh, I know all of that, that's fine. No, that's not the way they approach it. They actually that see themselves as falling short in everything that it is that they are reading, taste themselves to task, for what they have yet to implement or haven't implemented to the fullest degree. And so these texts are like that. There's a renewal, a tajaddud of the meanings every time that we read them. And you can't read them enough. You really, really can't read them enough. And um, even were you to focus on Bidayat al-Hidayah, if you chose to do so for the next two, three years of your life and read it once, read it twice and over and over again with the intention of putting it into practice, you would find wonders in that because these are texts ultimately of implementation. These are texts that are, are there to see whether or not that we are sincere in our approach to this affair, the affair of seeking knowledge and in general that living the realities of the deen. So we left off, as I understand it, at the dua of the ablutions of, the, of wudu and that Imam Ghazali radiallahu anhu that he mentions that one of the du'as of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we know that whoever makes these supplications as he then goes on to say is that will have all his sins depart from his limbs he will have all his sins depart from his limbs, limbs. and this is something that we know the reality of that making wudu is that when we make wudu, is that it is a means to have 
the various sins that we committed with the various parts of our body be forgiven. And that we know as well as that our Prophet <coughs> he spoke of this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where <coughs> he says about the removal of sins, Hatta تَخْرُجَ مِنْ And they will, all, they will even that come out of his fingertips, out of his fingernails. And it's interesting to note that there is an opinion in the Hanafi school attributed to Imam Abu Hanifa, although, as I understand it, it is not the dominant opinion of the school. It says that the water that you use after performing your ablutions is najis, it's actually impure. And that were it to get on, you'd have to wash yourself. And although that's not the dominant opinion, it is recommended in the Shafi school and perhaps others to avoid the water coming back onto your clothes when it falls off after performing your wudu. But one of the interesting things that Imam Sha'arani points out about this position of Imam Abu Hanifa was he said that Imam Abu Hanifa was a person of kashf. He was a person of unveiling. And he was a person who saw that the sins of people were unveiled to him. He saw it in the water that was used for purification. So he could actually see that what people did. And so if someone is witnessing that, how could you possibly use that water for another ablution? And, and, and so um, this is what is called ma' musta'mal, used water. And the Shafi has their own opinion about that in the, in the Shafi school that it's not permissible to use used water, ma' musta'mal, for another purification. And um, the Madaki school, it's mukru, it's disliked, but it's valid. And so, it's interesting to note that opinion. And this is the reality, that when we perform wudu, what a blessing! It is purifying us. Wudu is extremely important. And what Imam Ghazali does in the Ihya, in great detail, is teach us the various etiquettes of performing the wudu, limb by limb, so that we can be conscious of what he calls the asrar, the secrets or the mysteries, the inner dimensions of the wudu. And it is as if that he is teaching us that all of the outward forms of worship that we have, we never neglect the outward, but they all are pointing to inner realities. In other words, is that he wants us to connect the outward form of worship with the internal realities. And in the process of doing so is that we are then living the realities of the deen and opening ourselves up for, to receive the mercy of Allah and then protecting us from some of the negative tendencies that come from habituating ourselves to acts of worship and falling heedless therein. And so he says, whoever makes this, these supplications in his ablution will have all his sins depart from his limbs. His ablution will be stamped with a seal of approval and will ascend to beneath the throne where it will stay glorifying Allah most high and exalting Him. The reward of this will continue to be written for Him until the Day of Judgment. MashaAllah. And this is per from performing one wudu. So you can imagine if you continually are purifying yourself, continually purifying yourself. And all of this also points to how that wudu is an ibadah mustaqillah. It is an independent form of worship. Yes, it is a prerequisite that for someone to pray and for the validity of their prayer, someone has to be in a state of ritual purity. They have to have made their wudu or if need, if need be a ghusl. Right? However, it also in and of itself is an independent form of worship. And so we should treat it as such. And we should try our best to be that aware when, when we make our wudu. And this is why Imam al-Ghazali includes uh, many of these du'as that we can say, and even though that th the scholars have put into question the authenticity of the narrations, and um, Imam Manawi states about this, as for the supplications to be read when washing different parts of the body in ablution, none has been transmitted of them from the Prophet So the narrations have been put into question. The jurors, however, have considered it preferable to read the supplications that have been transmitted from the pious predecessors. This is what Imam Nawi says in his Kitab al Adhkar. So then he's going to that warn us about a few things about our ablution, things we want to be aware of. There are seven things you must avoid in your ablution. Do not shake your hands in a way that will make 
the water splash. Okay, and so that the we it's it's we want to be careful and deliberate that when we make wudu, but we don't want to just splash water. Okay, and a lot of times when we when we see people, is that we go into the wudu facilities, the waters. Whoosh, coming out super fast and it's you know, people as if they're just splashing water on themselves and that's not really what we want to do and for obvious reasons because that tends to indicate that this is not really that worship if you're just splashing as along with some of the other wisdoms in that and then secondly do not strike the water against your head and face and so that we don't want to splash water around nor do we want to take that water and like strike it against our face, like that. Okay, you want to carefully that put water between your hands. Start from the top when you wash your face and convey it as such. Put water in your arms like this, right? And wash your arms like this. Okay, and if you are they're putting your arm under the faucet, that's fine, but it's done so in a very nice and careful manner. Like this, very slowly. He also says, do not indulge in worldly talk during the ablution. So even though it is not haram to do so, that what he's saying is that this is something that we want to avoid. Because wudu is a time to prepare to stand before Allah. And that is the essence of what we want to be aware of. When we are purifying ourselves, is that you bring to heart, I am purifying myself to stand before Allah. But you were supposed to be aware of that. That this act that I'm doing right now is there to purify me outwardly, but also inwardly. And there is a connection between the outward and the inward. And it is a very subtle connection. But this is why it is so important that we both have ilm and amal. Because we need to have knowledge and practice to do both what is upon us outwardly and what is upon us inwardly and then that very subtle connection will that lead to the results that we want so it's important that we follow that these etiquettes inwardly and outwardly so do not speak and indulge in a worldly talk during the ablution the best thing that we can preoccupy ourselves with is the dhikr of Allah and he says, do not wash any limb more than three times. Because the sunnah is three. And the sunnah is restricted to three. Now the sunnah could have been five or seven or nine. But the sunnah is to do it three times. So you shouldn't do it more than, you th th than the sunnah just because you think more is better. More is not always better. Is that, what we, that when the sharia has delimited a quantity is that more is not better. Quality is better. And then there are times where that more, when there's not at the expense of quantity, could be better. Okay, but if the sharia has delimited, del del delimited the quantity, then what's better is quality as opposed to quantity. And so he says here, do not wash any limb more than three times. And now if someone doubts, hmm, have I washed myself a second, two or three times? If you doubt, you build upon certainty. So, okay, I washed myself twice, now I'm going to do a third. Okay, unless the doubt becomes excessive. And then he says here, number five, do not pour more water over yourself than necessary, simply out of mere doubt. For there is a devil called Welhan, who mocks and plays with those who are given to obsessive doubt. And so there's a special shaitan who tries to give us waswasa in our wudu. And what we really want is balance. Is that outwardly you do what's upon you, and inwardly that you realize that the whole point of this is to that stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the text and the context. And when you that spend time with rightly guided scholars and you see the way that they put the text that they study into practice is it gives you a nice balance to understand. 
that the outward is, has, is the outward and the inward is the inward. And then he says, do not perform your ablution with water that has been sitting in the sun. And there was a discussion, this is called mat mushammas, water that has become heated or hot because of the sun. And the s scholars that have different opinions in relation to that water. But this is his that advice, do not perform your ablution with water that has been sitting in the sun and thus has become exceedingly hot. So in general, we should avoid exceedingly hot and some would point out as well exceedingly cold if we're able to. And the reason is that if the water is extremely cold or extremely hot, you're going to be, have much less of an ability to concentrate on what it is that you're doing. Now, you might be in certain circumstances where, hey, that's all you have. Okay, and then in that circumstance that you can't not perform wudu or ghusl just because of the lack of warm water. Um, and um, it's easier with hot water because you can just let it cool down. But it's much more difficult if you don't have the facilities to warm up cold water. And so um, in, in that circumstance is that unless that you are in a situation where you know that that water will make you sick or if you're already sick increase you in your sickness or delay your um, delay your sickness and delay your healing then that you have to use you have to use uh, or it's happened to you before it's been tajriba that you've that there's cold water you have to make wudu or ghusl uh, before fajr prayer and b before you've done that and gotten sick the second time that you just have to do tayammum and you don't have to do that or that if a doctor has told you that okay and that the scholars get more detailed in terms okay well what happens if you've made tayammum anyway when you thought it was probable that's a detailed scholarly discussion but the basis is that you have to use the water and in general, unless that you think that it really could harm you. If you think that it could harm you, um, just by it merely being cold, then you would, um, uh, th then, then uh, if, it, if, it's, if, if, you're, if you're certain that it would harm you based upon experience or doctors told you that, there's no doubt about that in that situation, you wouldn't. And then um, uh, in the, the general position is, is that you should make that also, or will do with that water if you have doubt. And anyone who's lived overseas in places where that warm water is not as readily available, that will know what how it is. Um, that we have in most places, in like where we're living in the United States of America, is that you have central heating systems that anywhere you turn on a faucet throughout the house the water will become warm, uh, usually after a short period of time. Um, overseas, oftentimes, is that they might have an individual water heater for a particular bathroom. Or that in Mauritania, when we were there, and it actually got very cold, even though it's in the desert. And desert cold is a very different type of cold. This is in the middle of the Saharan Desert in North Africa. It gets very cold there. And they would warm up their water by the fire. So they actually put their, what they call a makaraj, which is like a teapot, uh, on or near the fire and have the water warm up and then use it for ablutions. But you didn't always have that luxury. There's many times that you'd wake up and there would be no fire or you woke up too late or whatever and you'd have to perform wudu with cold water, which wudu is manageable, but ghusl with cold water is a little bit more difficult. And uh, there's stories about that, mashallah. So, um, then he goes on to say that, so do not perform your ablution with water that has been sitting in the sun or with water from copper vessels. Okay, or water from copper vessels. And he includes a note uh, with this uh, in the back uh, where he says, this dislike is for health reasons as such water is considered damaging to the health. Okay. A narration states that if a person remembers Allah Most High in his ablution, Allah purifies his whole body. And if a person does not remember Allah, only the parts of him that the water reaches are pure.
purified. And then he's going to move on to a slightly different subject, where now is that not only that treating the minor ritual impurity, he wants us to know what we need to know about major ritual impurity. So these are the adab, the various etiquettes of the ghusl, which is translated here as the ritual bath. You could also say purificatory bath, but ghusl, where you have to wash your body completely. Min al janaba. And that janaba literally is a word that connotes distance. And the idea here is that you're in a state of major ritual impurity, and as a result, that distant. There's certain things that you can't do when you're in a state of major ritual impurity. And from the blessing of our deen, is that when there's minor things that affect our being, Allah Ta'ala has blessed us with wudu. Think about the blessing of wudu. And yes, someone could say, oh, you just feel like that because you're used to it. But there's also, if you really tune your heart in a spiritual dimension to it, how good do you feel? For instance, when you fall into sleep, you wake up and you feel a certain way and you make wudu. Yes, there's a, a physical feeling that comes from putting water on yourself, but there also, if you pay attention closely, is a spiritual dimension. It also that nourishes you and purifies you spiritually. And now you can read Quran. Now you can pray. Now you can do things that you couldn't do previously. And the same thing when some of you do some of the things that would break your wudu. When you renew your wudu that you find is that it is that it, it, it helps you. It, it creates this sense in you that now that I'm ready for worship. And so that he says here, if you have entered a state of ritual impurity by having that nocturnal emission or that relations with your spouse carry the basin of water to the wash place. Before washing anything, wash your hands three times. So now he's just going to they give us a description of ghusl, of the purificatory bath. And that there are what are called the means whereby which that it necessitates, these things that necessitate ghusl. And there are various things that do this, that a menstrual cycle for a woman, her postpartum bleeding, and then that also uh, for the male is that that emanation of that sexual fluid from them, um, in particular uh, that semen, seminal fluid. And so he's going to give us now the etiquettes from the beginning to the end exactly on how to perform this ghusl. So he says, wash your hands three times, then remove any impurities from your body. And so you can imagine back in the days that people would, generally speaking, that have something like a bucket or something like that a bottle that they would then be our water pot or something that they would then be pouring over themselves. Um, and this is the first thing that you would want to do. And oftentimes that container could be open. But before you put your hand in it, if it is an open container, so you can imagine a bucket. And let's say you don't have a cup or something to pour on yourself you want to tip the bucket over, wash your hands three times, and then if you want, you can put your hands in and then pour the water over yourself. Or if you have like a cup or something like that to pour it on you, then you can do that as well. And so he, he, he says here, perform the regular ablution for the prayer as described above with all the supplications and prayers, postponing only the washing of your feet so as not to waste water. And um, there is a difference of opinion about that when you would perform the wudu, and um, that he, and according to some schools, and this is what the footnote says, this is if one is taking a bath in a place where the water collects and does not immediately drain away, otherwise the washing of the feet should not be laid, delayed. And different schools will have different positions on that, so it's not something that we, uh, that, uh, you know, force on someone one way or another. Both ways uh, are valid. And that you can perform the ablution at this point. You can perform the ablution at the middle point, or you could perform the ablution at the end. And that all three times are permissible to perform the ablution. And then that you're going to start that the ghusl itself. Okay, but this wudu is a sunnah wudu. 
And in the Shafi school, the obligations of ghusl are very simple. There are two. You, one, make the intention, which is to perform the fard of ghusl in this case. Or if it's a sunnah ghusl, the sunnah of ghusl. And then you convey water to your entire body. It's as simple as that. And that many of the things that he's mentioning here, because this is not a book of fiqh per se, but he's giving us what we need to know from fiqh for the spiritual path. And so we have to see this text as such. The next thing you want to do, it's actually not mentioned here, is to pour water on your head and to wash your head. And that includes your hair, and pouring water on the head is recommended three times, and making sure that you get in that to the root of your hair, whether you have long hair or short hair. And for also, it has to, even if you have a thick beard, all of the hair on your head that you have to get water to its root. And then pour water over your right side of your body three times, making the intention of, of lifting the state of impurity. And uh, this is the way he's describing here. And um, that uh, you actually should make the intention of lifting, uh, lifting the state of greater ritual impurity when you first start washing your private region. Okay? And then he says, rub the front and back part of your body. Use your fingers to make the water penetrate the hair of your head. Make sure the water gets into the folds of the body as well as to the roots of the hair. So it's especially recommended to make sure the places that's a little bit harder to get water, like under your arms, between your legs, to that make sure that water gets there. That is recommended to do that. He says, avoid touching your private parts for both male and females that after that you perform the ablution. And really it's after that you that wash your private region. Okay, so that you can still be in a state of wudu. That were you to touch your private region, that during this process of performing the ghusl, it would be required then to make wudu after you finish the ghusl. If your hand comes into contact with your private region, repeat the ablution. Okay, and again he has a note here. And let's look what his note says. In the Hanafi school, that ablution is not broken by touching the male organ. Okay. And so that is, a, that is the Hanafi opinion. And depending upon one school of thought, is that you follow what you know from your school. And then he says, in all of this, the things that are obligatory are the intention, removing impurity, encompassing the whole body while washing. And so even though that he mentions three things here, we mention two, is that the ghusl itself, the obligation is, is two things. And that is to make the intention and to that cover yourself completely with water. Um, as for the, um, as for the, uh, that removing the impurities, um, that's in order to that make your ghusl valid. So you have to remove the impurity. So it's more of a condition as opposed to being considered one of the obligations. Now, there's details that relate to those impurities, um, that if it's impurity that comes off easily, or that it's an impurity that it doesn't have a substance, that one washing will that suffice for both of them. But if it's, for instance, something you need to pour more and more water on to first remove it, then you have to remove that first before washing yourself. Okay, and then he says, the rest of the actions in the ablution and ritual bath are confirmed sunnas. Their benefits many and their reward great. Whoever dismisses them loses out. In fact, he puts his obligatory acts at risk for the, un involuntary, for the voluntary acts make up for deficiencies in the obligatory. So this is an important way that we understand the recommended acts, is that they're, they're there for us to that increase us in closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also is that they repair, that they are what's called jawabar, in that they repair the shortcomings that we have in the obligations. And then the hadith that Imam uh, al Ghazali started with was the hadith what stated to us is that the way that we draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by performing the obligations. And then that increasing in supererogatory devotions. And the more that we do that, the more that we get closer to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we heard our teachers say, is that afdal al-ibadati tark al-ma'asi. 
the very best of worship is actually to leave sins. The best of worship is to leave sins. And what happens when you leave sins, it's like having a container that has no holes in it, is that you start to put a little bit of water and it retains, that you retain that water in your container. Whereas the likes of someone who's doing good deeds and then sins is like someone who has that various sizes, various holes of different sizes depending upon the nature of that sin in their bucket or in their container. That water comes in but it comes out. And so that this is the best of all worship. And then when you perform the obligations that they'll have a strong impact on you. And then when you start to increase in devotions, they will even have a stronger impact on you after that as a result. And so may Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq and that bless us to be able to perform wudu and ghusl in all of our forms of worship uh, the way that the righteous did. May we follow in their footsteps, resemble them, inshallah ta'ala, and that may all of these forms of worship, may we realize their asrar and their secrets and mysteries, and that may we that attach them to that, a, that motivation in the heart that is pushing us forward that forever, that striving on a path to draw near to our Lord. Tabarak wa ta'ala. May Allah tabarak wa ta'ala purify us inwardly and outwardly. Give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil. الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين والصحابته الأكرمين وتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين إمام غزالي systematically goes through the various duties that are upon the Muslim every day. And after speaking about the etiquettes of wudu and ghusl, that he moves on to now speak about the dry ablution, tayammum. And given that this is not a book of fiqh, many of the rulings of tayammum that he leaves for them to be studied in the books of fiqh. But he gives us some of the basic principles of Tamil, some of the basic rulings of Tamil, and some of the etiquettes that go along with it. And so he says, and this is at the top of page 38, if you are unable to find any water after looking for it, or some obstacle prevents you from reaching it, like the imprisonment of or a wild like imprisonment or a wild animal or the water you have <coughs> is only enough for your or your own companion's drinking needs, or the water available is the property of someone who wants to sell it for more than the market rate, or you have an illness or a wound that, if it comes into contact with water, could be life-threatening, you must wait until the time the obligatory prayer arrives. Then find clean earth. So he just briefly goes through the various reasons that make Tayyamun permissible. He doesn't go into any detail about how far you have to search for water and where you have to look for water, and that's discussed in the books of fiqh. But in general, if you can't find any water and you're unable to that come across water that you can use for Tayyamun, or an obstacle comes in your way, and so if someone happens to be imprisoned and there's no way for them to make wudu, <coughs> they can then make tamum, or he says a wild animal. Now, for us city dwellers, that might seem like that's something that is far-fetched, but in traditional societies, it wasn't at all. In traditional societies, 
that this was possible and this could happen. We hear stories of the likes of the son of Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar, when a stray lion comes into the city and that people are scared to go outside because there's a lion in the streets, is that he goes up to it and grabs it by the ear and escorts it out the city. Based upon the principle, if someone fears Allah, everything fears him. And these are people that weren't that scared of lions. There's another story about Thabit al that he was praying one time in the wilderness. And while he's praying, that a lion approaches. And he's standing still, erect, praying. And the lion starts to lick his feet. And he finishes his prayer, and the lion eventually goes on his way. And later when he was telling the story to someone, that person said, what were you thinking when the lion was licking your feet? And he said, I was going through my mind the various opinions of the fuqaha, of the jurists, about whether the lion's saliva was pure or not. Whereas most people would be worried for their lives. This is someone that was detached in that sense. And he, as a result, did not have a fear of the lion, nor did the lion do anything to him. He was thinking about, rather, that whether the lion's saliva is a pure substance or not. Anyhow, that still, people that live in villages and that are in that territories where there are lions, that could have lions that come into their village. And um, uh, I remember reading an article about a village in Tanzania that had an increased amount of lion attacks because that the lions didn't have as much food as they normally had. And so that they would actually, these people would go out at night to use the bathroom and there were several lion attacks right, as a result because that they that were so desperate <coughs> that they were even hunting people. And so it's not just a lion, any type of animal. If you're at uh, Yosemite and that you need to go to use the bathroom and to make wudu and there's a bear in your way that you're obviously not going to confront the bear that here is where you'd perform Tamil and um, I remember some time ago I was at Yosemite with my mother and um, there was 27 bear break-ins to cars the night before we arrived and they had signs up saying do not leave food in your car and we were in one of these tents. It was like a tent cabin, but the walls were canvas. It wasn't like wood or anything like that. And you'd hear bears, you know, ruffling around all throughout the night. And um, apparently that when, you know, you see bears, I think you're supposed to make noises and things like that. But if they run at you and they attack you, you don't run from a bear because they can run you know, at a good pace in short distances. Nor can you climb a tree, because they can climb trees too. Suppose you're supposed to play dead, and that's supposed to save you if, if you are in threat of being attacked by a bear. Um, anyhow, that whatever the animal is, if that is a fear, then this is one of the reasons that makes Tamil permissible. Or if you're wa the water you have is only enough for your own, your, or your own companion's drinking needs you actually have to save the water if you fear that you or your companions or even your riding beast that back in the day when they used to ride on animals is that if you need the water for drinking need you have to perform tamil <coughs> or you have an illness that if you come into contact with that water it could be life-threatening or there's other rulings that relate to that that's studied in the books of fiqh and all of these instances you would perform tayammum and tayammum is according to the shafi school a tahara da'ifa it is a weak form of purification and it is one of the khususiyat the special properties of the deen of our prophet sallallahu and al-hakim al-tirmidhi says the secret of tayammum being that valid for the ummah of our prophet sallallahu is that the secret of the prophet himself touching the earth and as a result of the Prophet himself coming into contact with the earth is that that earth now became permissible to be used for purification. And even if we say that it is a tahara da'ifa, a weak form of purification, still is that if someone is in, has done tiamum 
in the proper way, what was permissible for them previously is also permissible for them as a result of the tayammum. And it's also a blessing that we can, that always pray in all circumstances, even if we don't have access to water. And even if you don't have access to anything that you can make tayammum with, and you're not in a state of wudu in the Shafi school, you pray the prayer of the one who's not able to perform any form of that purity or purification. And then you make up your prayer later. As long as you have intellect that you have to pray. So what do you do? You have to wait till the prayer time enters. You don't perform tayammum before the prayer time enters. <coughs> and you perform it for every obligatory prayer. Then find clean earth on which there is soft, pure dust. So there has to be some type of dust in the Shafi school where you to hit, hit it that hubar, that some type of dust comes up. And <coughs> in the Maliki school, that it's w the, in terms of what you can use for tamum, it's more vast than the Shafi school. Even things like rocks are permissible. And in the Hanafi school, they are even more vast as far as I know. And so strike your palms on it, keeping your fingers together with the intention of making the prayer lawful for you. Because tayammum doesn't lift the hadith, it doesn't lift the state of lesser ritual impurity or greater ritual impurity. It makes prayer permissible for you. And by making the intention for prayer, all of the other things that you can do, tawaf, reading the Quran and so forth, become permissible. And wipe your entire face with your hands once. You need not make the dust reach the roots of your facial hair thick or thin. And so with tayammum, there's no rubbing. You're not rubbing the dirt into your face. Okay, is that you hit the dirt, right? or if you're a madaki, you rub the rock on your hands, and then you convey it right, to your face as such, making sure that you get everything. Yes. Just one wipe over the face like this, making sure you get your nose. Done. <laughs> Then take off your ring <coughs> and strike the earth a second time with your fingers spread out. Now wipe your arms, including the elbows, with your hands. If you do not go over the whole area the first time, strike the earth one more time and wipe the arms until you have gone over the entire area. Next, wipe each of your palms with the other and wipe the spaces between your fingers. Okay, so if someone is wearing a ring, the first strike, as he said about he said, keep your fingers together because you're wiping your face. Now, you're doing your hands. So you strike one more time, okay? And then you start as such. You come down the arm and you go this way like this. You come down the arm and go this way like this. He said, rub your palms together and then go between the fingers. <coughs> and you're finished. And so that on the way down, that you use the inside part of your hand as such. And you get the outside part of your arm. You turn it back around like this, and when you come back, is that the inner part of your thumb on the palm area gets the back part of your thumb, and then you wipe like that. Okay? Like that. And then hands together and wipe between <coughs> your fingers. <coughs> he says, Now perform one obligatory prayer with this tayammum along with any voluntary prayers you wish to perform after it. So in the Shafi school, after you perform the obligatory prayer, that as long as you don't do anything that would nullify your wudu, you remain in a state of, that, of being able to do what it is that you would normally do if you had made wudu. Or, in this case, even if you're in a state of greater ritual impurity. <coughs> if you want to perform another obligatory prayer, even if it be qada, that is, that you're doing a makeup prayer, you must perform a new tayammum. Okay, and he does have a note here. And he says here, <coughs> in the Hanafi school, a new tayammum is not required to perform additional obligatory prayers, just as waiting for the time to arrive is also not a condition. It is permitted to do tayammum before the entry of the prayer time and to perform more than one prayer with it. So, as we see that the the differences in opinion that they are a mercy. 
the difference of opinion. The Ummah of our Prophet are a mercy. So that's all he says about Tayyamun. There's a lot more details that we would learn in a book of fiqh. And this would also be what we do um, if that we are unable to perform that wudu for some reason due to health or that if we have, for instance, that we're unable to put water on our limbs uh, because of a severe injury and so forth. So now that he's going to speak about the etiquette of setting out for the mosque. Because if you think about what he's discussed already, he's talked about ablution, he's talked about waking from sleep, he's talked about that using the lavatory, he's talked about the etiquette of ablution, he's talked about the etiquette of that greater, removing the greater ritual impurity, he's spoken a little bit about Tayyumum. And now that someone is presumably ready to go to the masjid at this point. So that these are the adab of the al-khuruj ila al-masjid. The etiquettes of setting out, going <coughs> to the masjid. And he says, when you have finished your purification, pray the two sunnah rakats of fajr in your home if dawn has broken. This is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa used to do. It's better to pray those two sunnah rakats in your home, although it's permissible to pray them in the mosque. And just as we that pray in congregation, in public places, preferably in mosques or musallas, prayer spaces, that we should also have prayers that we do at home. We want our house to be alive, spiritually, religiously. Is that we want our house to be a place that ang angels frequent. We want it to be munawwar. We want it to be filled with light and goodness. We want it to be a place that lives up to the very name of our house in Arabic, which is meskin which is the place of sukun. There's tranquility there. The more worship that is done in the house, the more recitation of the Qur'an, the more invocations and supplications and prayers, the better the house will be spiritually. And the more the people will feel it when they enter into it. So he says, this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi used to do. Then make your way to the mosque. Do not fail to pray with the congregation, especially the morning prayer. So we should especially be concerned to pray Fajr and Isha in Jama'ah. Especially Fajr and Isha. If not all five daily prayers. And for those of us that are very busy, and we find it difficult because Fajr comes in early or that our sleep pattern would be upset or we find it difficult to go back to sleep after we wake up and we only got a limited amount of hours of sleep and then we know we have to work all day the next day. There's no doubt that it's difficult for some people. Do the best you can. If you can't pray two prayers a day, then pray one. But try your best to arrange your life so that you can at least pray Fajr and Isha in congregation at a mosque or at a place where people are praying the congregational prayer. If you can't do that, definitely try to pray in Jama'a in congregation at home with your family. And that we really shouldn't just be waking up praying by ourselves and going back to sleep. Now, that's permissible to do, you've done the obligation, but this is a book of suluk, this is a book of spiritual wayfaring. And that the bar is higher for the one that is taking their religious life seriously. <coughs> so we should do our best to arrange our lives, get to bed a little bit early, find ways to maybe take naps during the day, somehow, some way, we should give priority that two, praying Fajr and Isha, that in congregation. A prayer in congregation is 27 times better than a prayer alone. And he says, if you are negligent of such a profitable act, then what benefit is there for you in the pursuit of knowledge? And look at the way that Imam Ghazali is connecting that a pursuit of knowledge to worship in your spiritual state. They're directly related. There is a deep correlation between the two. Even in terms of your intellectual pursuits, your intellectual abilities, is that the more worshipful you are, the stronger that your mind will be, the more piercing your insights will be. The more light that Allah will place in your heart, which will then assist you in your quest for knowledge. There is no doubt about this. And so he's putting this question to us. 
If you are negligent of such a profitable act, then what benefit is there for you in the pursuit of knowledge? You cannot divorce the two in Islam. And if you do, is that it will lead to the group of people called the ulama asu, the evil scholars. And these are people who do not put their knowledge into practice and they call to Allah with their tongues, but they call to distance from Allah with their states. And this is one of the fitness of our time in the Muslim community and beyond. And this is the nature of the Dajjalic world is that it appears like it's Jannah. It appears like it's a garden and it's paradisical and it's easy and it's soothing to the nafs, yes. But the reality is, is that there's that, that misery behind it where people only to know. And what people, some people think is misery in reality is it paradise in the garden is behind it. <coughs> After all, the fruit of knowledge is in acting upon it. And this is something that our teachers that really, really emphasize the importance of praying prayers in congregation. And it is one of those things that we should really strive to make it to be one of our main mujahadat, that is, that are places of spiritual struggle. There might be a lot of things that we can't do because of our work schedule and a number of other things. But let's make praying in congregation that one of those things that we do everything we can to do. And that we make our life revolve around that. And that I've heard my teacher speak about this on multiple occasions, even in certain situations where it would seem to me from what I know from them is that they tend to be easy with people, especially if they have special circumstances. But still, they emphasize the importance of praying in congregation. And what I understood from that is, is that there's something about hanging on to prayer in this time. If you look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he spoke, spoke about the rungs of the ladder of Islam and the first one to break would be governance and the last one to break would be prayer is that perhaps this is the time that we live in, that we're living in, is that we have to really adhere to the prayer. In all times, but especially in our time, that's the number one thing that we need to focus on and make our lives revolve around that. And oftentimes we don't have that perspective. And one of the great blessings of praying in congregation is that even if no one's prayer is worthy of being accepted in the congregation, from the blessing of coming together, your prayer will be accepted. So this is very, very important. We should take this seriously and strive to make that a reality in our lives. And you will find that it's not easy to pray the five daily prayers in congregation consistently. You have to make sacrifices. You have to make sacrifices. And then he's going to give us a da'a for walking to the mosque. When you walk to the mosque, walk with tranquility. Walk with tranquility and do not rush. It's not from the sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ to rush. Even though that he did walk swiftly, that was his natural gait. He wasn't walking fast such that he would, وسلم, that be like someone who's rushing and thus be huffing and puffing just before prayer and not able to concentrate as a result. When you walk to the mosque, walk with tranquility and do not rush on your way, say. And he's going to give us the dua. O my Lord, I beseech you by the right of those who beseech you, and the right of those who long for you, and the right of this walk of mine toward you. I have not left my home intending insolence, nor in arrogance, nor seeking to make a show of my actions, nor seeking prestige. Look how he's teaching us ikhlas and sincerity, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that we're negating all of these things. Is that we're not doing this out of insolence or arrogance. We're not doing this out of that showing off or ostentation. No riyat or no sum'a, that we don't want a reputation. Rather, I have come forth from my home in fear of your wrath, and in search of your satisfaction. And these intentions work together, as that we simultaneously fear punishment and we hope that for reward, is that we fear Allah's wrath and we hope for His divine pleasure. And then the dua comes, فَأَسْأَلُكَ that I ask you to save me from the fire, to let me enter paradise, and I ask you that you forgive my sins for truly, 
there is none who forgives sins but you. And so at this point that someone is now in the mosque, they're praying in congregation, and after they perform the prayer, that Imam al-Ghazali is going to mention to us the etiquette of staying in the mosque until sunrise. And this is again one of these abandoned sunnahs that there are people, that many people have forgotten. And he's going to give us a number of prayers and supplications and invocations that we can say that radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And after speaking about that, he's going to speak about then the time that we spend between sunrise and midday. And so that insha'Allah ta'ala, that um, I think what we are going to do is um, that just stop there because I want uh, Imam Amin to pick up insha'Allah ta'ala tomorrow that where we just left off. This was a brief session today and that we will start from the subchapter, the etiquette of staying in the mosque until sunrise, that on page 40, bithni lai ta'ala tomorrow with Imam Amin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these etiquettes a reality in our lives. May Allah ta'ala bring life to our hearts with the sunnah, through the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam completely purify us outwardly and inwardly. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Connect our hearts to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the Rasul al-A'zam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam wa sallam to have a close connection with him ever following his sunnah inwardly and outwardly. And may the last words be when we exit this world be la ilaha illallah. Muhammad al-Rasulullah. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا Wazidna ilma. So we reached up <coughs> in the book Bidayatul Hidayah, the beginning of guidance, to the section Adabul Kuruj Ilal Masjid, which are the etiquettes of going out, leaving one's home to the masjid. And here we should remember our text is the path or the beginning of the path should I say to get guidance from Allah and some of the scholars they mention whoever wants al-hidayah fa'alayhi al-bidayah the one who wants to find guidance let him read the book the beginning, meaning the beginning of guidance. So inshallah, we'll start with that section of those manners of going out to the masjid. Now. From the book, Beginning of Guidance by the great Imam al-Ghazali, Rahimahullahi Ta'ala, wa sallam, 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 the etiquette of setting out for the mosque. When you have finished your purification, pray the two sunnah rakats of fajr in your home if dawn has broken. This is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do. Now, when you go out, you should make it your habit that you never leave your house except that you are in the state of tahara from the two types of hadith, from the minor ritual impurity and from the major ritual impurity. Never leave your home in a state of ritual impurity. So this is something that Imam al-Ghazali is warning us to remain in the state of purity because this is a protection of yourself from all evil matters. And if you are able, you pray in your house the two sunnah rakas before al-fajr, before you go out if the Fajr has come in before you leave. Because praying in the house has great merit to it. One should not make one's home like a graveyard. You should keep your home alive with prayers in it. 
So, pray if Fajr has come in, the time of Fajr has come in, before you leave your home to go to the masjid, pray your sunnah rakahs there. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to, day, used to do. He would perform those two rakah of Fajr in his house. And in those two rakah, you should recite Al-Kafirun and Al-Ikhlas. So Al-Kafirun and Al-Ikhlas in the two rakah. It is also mentioned by some of the scholars that one should recite Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak that you recite the surah of expansion and Alam Tara Kaifa did you not see what your Lord did with the people of Feel or the campaigns of the elephant? So Surah Feel, Surah Inshirah, those two surahs, they are, as some scholars mentioned, a protection from anyone who wants to harm you. So that if you recited those two chapters, then that would be a protection for you. And it is recommended that between the two sunnas and the obligatory of al-fajr, the obligatory prayer of al-fajr, that you lie down on your right or your left side. That you take, lie down while you're waiting for the prayer. On the right side, of course, is more superior. And this should be reminding you you should think when you're in that situation of you're laying in the grave. It should be a reminder for you. And because if you lay on your side and you think about being in the grave, that should be something that pushes you to do the works for the Akira. Because your mind is thinking about the hereafter. So you should have an urge to do those good works that will make you a winner in the hereafter. Continue, Ishaq. Then make your way to the mosque. Do not fail to pray with the congregation, especially the morning prayer. A prayer in congregation is 27 times better than a prayer alone. Now, and here, you should remember when you're going to the masjid, you're going to Baytullah, that which is the place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased to see his servant. So you are a visitor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's house and you should have the courtesies related to that. You should have veneration for the masjid and veneration for the one whom the masjid was built for. So you should go with a certain state. And that the one who goes to the masjid would be honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as his guest. So you should be having in your heart the veneration of the one who is honoring you by giving you the ability and the admission to his worship. Naam. Consider the prayer, I should talk, about the prayer being more superior in congregation, it is 27 times higher rank than praying alone. And it is related that the Prophet Sallallahu he would never pray those obligatory prayers alone. And that is something that even if he would be carried to the prayer, he would come. So we should not get in the habit of praying alone. And if you cannot make it to the masjid, do not pray alone at home. Pray in the congregation. Because, especially the Fajr, because praying in congregation in the morning prayer is superior than the congregation at the Isha prayer, for instance. And the Isha prayer is superior in congregation than the other prayers. It is related in a narration that whoever prays the Isha prayer in congregation, it is as if they stood half the night, half of the night. 
and whoever prays uh, the Fajr prayer in congregation as, is as if they pray the whole night. And of course, it is related that among the most superior of all the prayers is Salatu Asr. Naam. If you are negligent of such a profitable act, profitable act, then what benefit is there for you in the pursuit of knowledge? After all, the fruit of knowledge is in acting upon it. Yeah, so you would think that one should be diligent in this congregational prayer because it's a big profit for you to pray in jama'ah. Ah. One should not lose it. And if you're not taking advantage of all these beneficial things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing you to do and has been encouraged on the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then how are you going to get much benefit out of seeking knowledge? Because seeking knowledge, its purpose is to practice, to act according to what you learn. They said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ amal." Verily, knowledge is to practice, to implement. So in every one of these things that Imam Ghazali mentions in this book, it's all practical, right? It is knowledge that you can perform, and you should perform it. One by one, step by step, you should implement everything in the book so that by the time you finish the book, most of these beneficial deeds that I mentioned are part of your daily activity. So if you look at this book, it is talking about from your morning to your night. And if you take each action, each dhikr, each dua, each amal that he gives you, and you put it in your life and start to practice it, you find that your whole life is in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you arrive at the station of at-taqwa to be at the level of a pious person, insha'Allah ta'ala. Naam. When you walk to the mosque, walk with tranquility and do not rush. On your way say, O oh my Lord, I beseech you by the right of those who beseech you and the right of those who long for you, and the right of this walk of mine toward you. I have not left my home in tending insolence, nor in arrogance, nor seeking to make a show of my actions, nor seeking prestige. Rather, I have come forth from my home in fear of your wrath and in search of your satisfaction. I ask you to save me from the fire, to let me enter paradise, and I ask that you forgive my sins. For truly there is none who forgives sins but you. And here these dua, you look in, into them and you see some things. That there is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by those who request of them, of him. Those who long for him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even by your journey into the masjid, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the status of these virtuous things to accept from you. Right? And then telling you how you should go to the masjid really in a state of humbleness, in a state of humility, in a state of longing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's acceptance. And you should remember that in everything you do, you're seeking protection from Allah's displeasure with you and you're seeking his pleasure. Because ultimately for all your deeds, you want the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he enters you in Jannah and protects you from the hellfire. Forgives your sins and really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the only one who can forgive your shortcomings, whether small or great. And all of us should remember we have shortcomings and we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always in every moment. So as you make in this supplication, you should be thinking about what is being said, the reality of it, what you're asking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is going to the masjid from the beginning of your morning. Before the actual prayer of the Fajr, you're always reminding of what you're on this earth for. Now, go ahead. The etiquette of staying in the mosque until sunrise. Or when you enter the masjid, how should you be? Now, 
when you are going to enter the mosque, do, do so right foot first and mm. say, Oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and give them peace. Oh Allah, forgive my sins and open to me the doors of your mercy. Because here, when the masjid is a place of honor and a place where forgiveness exists for those who call on Allah. So you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you mercy when you enter this place, which is a noble place and a place of mercy. So you ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, waftah li abwaab rahmatik. Open for me the doors of your mercy. And going in with the right foot, as we mentioned, because going into noble places, you should enter with the right. Now, if you see someone selling things in the mosque, say, may Allah make your transaction unprofitable. And if you see someone calling out to people about something that has gone missing, say, may Allah not restore to you what you have lost. And these are narrations from the Prophet wasallam for those who are in the masjid doing business transactions and searching for lost things instead of concentrating on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a sign that this one is not giving success for good action. Naam. This is as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded, commanded. When you have entered the mosque, do not sit down until performing the turaka prayer of greeting the mosque. If you have not already performed the two sunnahs raka al fajr in your home, performing them will take the place of the greeting prayer. And here, so this is a separate sunnah of performing the greeting uh, tayyatul masjid. And that is something you should do whenever you enter a masjid. That you pray as a greeting to the mosque. But if you didn't pray those sunnahs at home that we mentioned, maybe you left before the fajr time, then when you come in the masjid, you can pray those sunnah uh, prayers. Now, and that sunnah prayers is a recom or confirmed sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ never left them out. So you make sure you pray them. And even if you miss them, for some odd reason, maybe you get to the masjid and the jama'ah has started in the congregation, even afterward, you can pray those prayers. So these prayers before and after, they should be made up. Mm. Now, Upon completing the surah Make the intention for a spiritual retreat. Uh, itikaf in the masjid. And the scholars say that you should make the intention of uh, seclusion in the masjid, even if it's for one moment. Every time you enter, make the niyyah of itikaf. And you give the barakah or the blessing of being in the state of itikaf so long as you are in the masjid. And it is a confirmed sunnah in every time. No. Make the supplication that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam made after the two sunnah rakas of fajr. O oh Allah, I ask you for, for mercy through which you guide my heart, by which you compose my state of disarray, by which you order my disorder, by which you return to me to return me to my state of harmony, through which you reform me in my religion, by which you preserve my inner state and elevate my outer state, through which you purify my deeds, illuminate my face, instill in me my guidance, and protect me from all evil. O oh Allah, I ask you for everlasting faith felt intimately in my heart. I ask you for true certainty, Allah. so that I may know that nothing will befall me except what you have written for me and make me pleased with what you have allotted for me. O oh Allah, bless me with sincere faith and certainty, after which there is no unbelief and mercy whereby I may receive the honor of your favor in this world and the next. O oh Allah, I beseech you for my for patience with the decree, for success in the encounter on the day of judgment, for the stations of the martyrs, and for the life of the fortunate for assistance against enemies and for the companionship of the prophets. Here you will notice in these du uh, this dua many beneficial matters that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encourages us to pray for. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the one who grants us mercy. And that is from his generosity and 
from his fadl for us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by through him that we're getting the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should want all of our matters to be gathered in one, which is that our focus is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to be scattered in our pursuits. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us salah, rectitude, uprightness in our deen. That we are steadfast in our religion. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies our deeds. Give us an increase in our reward of those deeds. And protect us from showing off or self-admiration in our deeds. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lightens our face. Give us illumination on the day of judgment. Because on the day of judgment, some faces are going to be illuminated. These are the people of Sunnah. And some people, they're going to be darkened. The faces of people of innovations and leaving away from the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill our needs and to protect us from every evil. Constantly we need the protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the way we get away from sinning, that Allah protects us. And the way we're able to do obedience, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us. So in these dua, you find all of these matters that you should be requesting. And you should ponder on them. Even as you learn them, you should be thinking about how they're needed throughout your life. But even this is the beginning of your morning, how you're starting out your day. Mm. Now. Oh Allah, I lay before you my needs, even though my perception be weak, my actions insufficient, and I am in dear need of your mercy. I beg of you, O oh accomplisher of all things, O oh healer of hearts, as you rescue from the midst of the seas, rescue me from the punishment of the fire, mm. the call for destruction, and the torment of the grave. O oh Allah, I ask you for any good of which my perception has fallen short and my actions have been too weak to achieve, and which my intentions and hopes have failed to reach. Any Here you got in this mentioning that Allah is the one who takes care of all matters, fulfills them. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heals the illnesses that are inside the chest. And you want to seek protection from Allah from the hellfire, from the punishment of the grave. And on the day of judgment, from being called among the losers. That you will be called among the righteous, not among those who will be wretched before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. Any good you have promised to any of your servants or have given to any of your creatures. For truly I desire this good from you and beg you for it, O Lord of all the world. O Allah, make us guide and be guided. And do not make us lead astray or be led astray. Showing enmity toward your enemies and at peace with your friends. That we love people with your love and are hostile with your hostility towards any of your creatures who have opposed you. And here you should think about this. When he says, Allahumma ja'alna hadina muhtadeen. Muhtadeen. That may Allah make us guiders. Those who guide people. And the Prophet wasallam said to Sayyidina Ali that if Allah guides one person for you to Islam, through you to Islam, one person, it will be better for you than having the red camel. One person. Imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at your hands guides many. They said about Al-Habib Ahmed Mashhur Al-Haddad that he was in Africa and over 300,000 people took Shahada at his hands. It's a person who was guiding others. And that's the benefit of going working in da'wah, that we're calling people to Allah and people are being guided by us. And we should ensure not to be won by our statements or our deeds or our states misguide others. Right? That we should, and even when we study, to put extra effort so that we won't make mistakes when we convey. And that our mistake may cause someone to go astray. 
So we should be even more diligent in our studies to preserve the information and to be steadfast. And all these dua, they can remind us of these things when we reflect on what is being said. Naam. Oh Allah, this is my prayer and its answer is yours to give. This is my effort and upon you is all reliance. And we belong to Allah and to Him we are, are we returning. And there is no ability to ward off evil or strength to do good except through Allah, the High, the Mighty. Oh Allah. And I mention you here, Walla hawla walla quwwata illa billahi al-yadim. The no one really has the ability to avoid the sins except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection. And no one can do acts of obedience except that Allah helps them. Keep that in your mind. This tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're able to do what you do. Even you're entering the masjid by the tawfiq of Allah. And the reason you're not someone else because Allah gave you protection. And in that, you should always show gratitude for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, O oh Allah, O oh owner of the firm handhold and the guiding command, I ask you for safety and The firm, of, uh, firm handhold here, the Quran. And we want to be steadfast on our religion, meaning that Allah gives us istiqama to be upright and always practicing. After believing in Allah, we should want istiqamah. The Prophet said, Kul amantu billahi He said, I believe in Allah, then have steadfastness. Naam. I ask you for safety on the day of punishment and paradise on the day of eternity with those who are close to you, who have beheld the truth, who bow and prostrate themselves before you, and who fulfill their company. Here you think about these qualities. al muqarrabin al shuhud Those who constant gaze is at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who have drawn near to Allah. That means their attention is always focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ruka sujood Those who do a lot of prayer in this dunya. A lot of ruku, a lot of sujood. They are constantly in the prayer. And remember, the prostration, as we mentioned, is what? The closest the servant will be to his Lord. So have a lot of that prostration. And those who fulfill their covenants. Whenever you make a covenant, that's a covenant with Allah. You work hard to fulfill it. And we made the covenant to acquire knowledge and to convey it to the people. So we should be diligent in that. And we should set our aim to fulfill that covenant. And to be resurrected with those who are like that. Now. Truly you are merciful and loving and you do, and you do what you will. Glory be to the one who is characterized by might and who has declared it. Exalted is the one who is clothed in glory and who has shown generosity in it. Allah. Glory be the one. Glory be to the one who alone is worthy of glorification. Glory be to the owner of favor and blessing. Glory be to the owner of power and generosity. Glory be to the one whose knowledge encompasses all things. Allah. O oh Allah, grant me light in my heart and light in my grave, light in my hearing and light in my seeing, light in my hair and light in my skin, light in my flesh. Lighten my blood and lighten my bones. Light before me, light behind me, light to the right, to my right side, light to my left side, light above me, light below me. Oh Allah, increase me in light and give me life and make me light. Amen. Amen. When you finish something, Bi rahmatika ya arham al rahimin. Here, when one seeks light in one's limbs, in one's body, in one's movements, in one's states, in all of one's essence, from every direction, this is so that no part of your body goes astray, deviates from the straight path. So you should be thinking of your whole reality. And the light is guidance. Allah is Al-Hadi, 
and Noor, these things should remind you that this is the path to guidance and the way you get on that path is by the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Quran and the light of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you should have that light before you all the time. It guides you on the straight path. As we say, يَهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ mustaqim, Guide us to the Sirat al mustaqim, And how are we guided? It? Through Allah, through the Book of Allah, through the Messenger, and through the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah give us complete light in all of our, all of our reality. Naam. When you finish supplicating, do not occupy yourself with anything except the remembrance of Allah, glorification or the recitation of the Qur'an until the time comes for the obligatory prayer. Now, so even you don't want to do worship and then go into distraction. So from the time you start out your house, going to the masjid and making those supplications toward the masjid, stay in the state of Vigilance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're making dhikr or you're making tasbih or you're reciting the Quran, waiting to the adhan. Waiting to the, until the adhan is called. All of this should be in the state of worship. And you notice this is times not for sleeping. You know, once you get up, you should start to engage yourself in worship. Now, then when you hear the call to prayer, Stop what you are doing and devote yourself to, respond to responding to the Mu'addin. When the Mu'addin says, Allah is great, Allah is great, repeat it after him. And likewise with all the phrases. When he comes, when he says, come to prayer and come to prosperity, say after each of them, there is no ability nor strength except through Allah the High and Mighty. And when he says for the morning prayer, prayer is better than sleep. Say, you have spoken truly and done well. When you hear the call to commence, again, repeat what he says, except for the pray, for the pray, the prayer is established, to which you should respond, may Allah establish it and continue it as long as the heavens and the earth continue to exist. Yeah. And these are the responding for the adhan and the mu'adhan, uh, for the adhan and the ikama, excuse me. Also, we do it here, and you should be reminded that is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he mentioned that when you stand for the prayer, he told one of the companions, Um Rafi', when you stand for the prayer, say Subhanallah ten times before the prayer. Say Subhanallah ten times. Say La ilaha illallah ten times. Say Alhamdulillah ten times. Say Allahu Akbar. 10 times, say astaghfirullah 10 times. So when you say subhanallah, Allah says this is for me. When you say la ilaha illallah, Allah says this is for me. When you say alhamdulillah, Allah says this is for me. When you say Allahu Akbar, Allah says this is for me. When you say astaghfirullah, Allah says I have done it. Subhanallah. MashaAllah. Now. When you have completed the responses to the Mu'adlin, say, O oh Allah, I ask you at the advent of your prayer and the voices engaged in calling on you by the retreat of your night and the advance of, of your day to grant Muhammad وسلم, a place near to you, an excellent rank and the exalted degree, and to raise him to the praise station which you have promised him. Which Allah says, Asa an yaba'athaka rabbuka maqam in mahmuda. That perhaps your Lord would raise you to that high lofty station. Now, Truly you do not break your promise by your mercy, O most merciful of the merciful. In this dua, after the adhan, is something specific in the time of Al Fajr. As for the dua that is sunnah for the mu'adhan and the one who caused the uh, iqama. Uh, and those who hear him in every salat, it is the famous dua, Allahumma rabbi hadhi da'wa tatamma wa salatu qa'ima, ati Muhammadin wasila wa fadila wa ba'athu makana mahmud al wa atta. This is what you say at the regular other prayers. But this one that Imam al-Ghazali mentioned is specific for Fajr. 
Mm. Also, when you finish the adhan and the karma for the mu'adhan and the one who hears and the one who listens, uh, they make this dua after making a salah as salam ala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it is, and you'll find it overseas, that they call the adhan, then after they finish the adhan, it's as salatu wa salamu alayka ya sayyidi ya rasulullah. And this is something from Ahl Sunnah that they have always, even after the dan, in the loud voice, Salah ala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Naam. If there is a call to prayer while you are engaged in prayer, complete what you're praying, then catch up with the responses to the call to prayer in the usual way. When the Imam starts... So even though you don't, you're occupied at the time, you still catch it up after the time. Likewise, if one is in other situations where one cannot answer the call, one does it after one finishes. Naam. When the Imam starts the obligatory prayer, do not occupy yourself with anything except following him and perform the two rakats of the obligatory prayer in the way that will shortly be explained to you in the method of prayer and its etiquette. Mm -hmm. When you have completed the prayer, say, O oh Allah, Bless Muhammad and the family of Well, this after you make istighfar first. So you say istighfar three times before that. And then you go into this dua. So after you finish, astaghfirullah, 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 Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad to the end. Mm. Oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Oh Allah, you are peace. And from you comes peace. And to you, peace returns. So protect us from all calamities with your greeting, O our Lord, and let us enter the abode of peace. Blessed and oh. exalted you are, you are you, O possessor of majesty and bounty. Glory be to my Lord, the High, most, most exalted, the bestower. There is no God but Allah alone, who has no partner. His is the dominion, and to him is all praise. He gives life, and he gives death. And he is the living who never dies. In his hand is all goodness. Yani, in his hand, as an attribute, meaning in his power and under his management. Because when we're talking about the attributes of Allah, we don't want one, one to become literal and ascribe to Allah literal attributes. So the ulama, they mention what is indicated by that. Now. In his hand is all goodness, and he has power over all things. There is no God but Allah, the possessor of every bounty, gift, favor, and excellent praise. There is no God but Allah, and we worship none but him, making our religion sincerely his, in spite of the aversions of those who disbelieve. And there is, this is what Imam al-Ghazali mentioned in al-Ihya, in the Ihya al din Imam al nawi mentioned in his adhkar, and from Sahih Muslim, from the role of Abdullah ibn Zubair, that the Prophet sallallahu used to say at the end of every prayer after when he was salam, La ilaha illallah wa hadhu la sharika la, la al-mulk wa la al-hamd wa wa kulli shay'in qadir, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, la ilaha illallah, la na'budu illa iya, illa iya, lahu na'ma wa lahu fadl, wa lahu thana'u hasan, la ilaha illallah, muklisina lahu deen, wa lahu kariya al-kafirin. Then after that, Supplicate with the comprehensive, complete supplication. Those that those the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught Aisha radiallahu anha. And Aisha as Siddiqiyya, among those pious people that are below the ranks of the Prophets. So Abu Bakr as Siddiq, Aisha as Siddiqiyya. MashaAllah. Naam. O oh Allah, I ask of you for all good. Whether it comes sooner or later, that which I know and that which I know not, I seek refuge with you from all evil. Whether it comes sooner or later, that which I know and that which I know not, I ask you for paradise and for those words and actions and beliefs that will bring me closer to it. And I thank you. Because they're asking for the paradise, and then you think, وَمَا يُقَرْبُ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ كَوْلٍ وَعَمَلًا وَنِيَّةٍ وَإِتِّقَادٍ You think about all of these things. What's going to get you close to Jannah? What you say, what you do, what you intend, 
and what you believe. So always say good things, do righteous things, intend noble things, and believe what Allah and his messenger وسلم, ordered you to believe. So always check your statements, always check your actions, always look out for your intentions, because sometimes the intentions are better than the deeds. And watch the state of your heart. Mm. I ask of you the good which your slave and prophet Muhammad وسلم, asked of you, and I seek refuge in you from everything from which your slave and prophet Muhammad وسلم, sought refuge in you. Which is comprehensive because the Prophet وسلم, knew of everything good to ask for mm -hmm. and everything bad to seek refuge in from. So if you're asking by what the Prophet Sallallahu asks among the good, and you're seeking protection by which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought protection from, then you are safe because you've covered everything. Now. Oh my Lord, whatever matter you have decreed for me, make its end one thing. Mm. And, and, and this too is the acceptance of the decree of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And hoping for the good of whatever Allah decree. Because something outward could seem bad, but it leads to a good state, you know? As sometimes, as it's mentioned in the Hikmah of Ibn Ta'ala, that sometimes the sin that leads to brokenness and humiliation before Allah is better than acts of obedience that leads for one to become arrogant and haughty. Sometimes it is a sin that you're afflicted with that leads you to piety. And the opposite could happen. You have acts of righteousness that leads you to sinfulness. Mm. Now. Then make the supplications that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised Fatima radiallahu anha to make. O ever living, O self subsistent. Ya hayu ya qayyum. It is mentioned that these may be among the great names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al Hayy al-Qayyum. Mm. By your mercy I beseech your help, lead me not to myself, nor to any of your creations, even for the blink of an eye, set right for me all my affairs. Then say what Jesus said, alayhi uh, salam, O Allah, I enter this morning unable to repel what I dislike and powerless to attain the benefit of what I seek. All matters this morning are in hands other than mine. I enter the morning at the mercy of my actions. Allah. There is no power poorer than I. O my Lord, do not give my enemy cause, do not give my enemy cause to blow over me nor my friend caused to lament over me. Here, that he mentioned, فَلَا فَكِيرَ أَفْكَرُ مِنِّي إِلَيْكِ And you should have that state. No one is more destitute in need of you than me. Right? You are poor before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are in need of Allah. Keep that in your mind all the time. And the one who is in knows and realizes that they're in need of Allah, they're always going to rely on Allah. They're always going to turn to Allah. Because you go to the one you need and feel like no one needs Allah more than me. No one. I am the most poor before Allah, impoverished. That should be your state. Mm. Do not cause calamity to occur in my religious affairs. And there is no musibah greater than, or calamity, greater than the calamity in your religion. Our teachers used to say, if you lose everything in the world and your deen remains sally man, whole, complete, safe, don't you worry about nothing else. If you lose everything and your religion is still intact, alhamdulillah. There is no loss greater than the loss of your religious state. So long as you have deen, say alhamdulillah. And then you would have feel, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Just don't die unless you die in the state of Islam. That's a victory. Now. 
let not this world be the greatest of my concerns, nor the extent of my knowledge, nor place in power over me one who will show me no mercy. Then pray, using whichever of the translated supplications seem good to you. You may memorize them from those we have compiled in the book of invocations and supplications from the revival of the religious sciences. Also, you can and you should all get the book Al Athkar of Imam Al Nawi. The scholars they said about that, Bi'ad Da wa Al Athkar. Sell your house and buy the Athkar of Imam Al Nawi. And the books of Anawi, they have light on them. Al Habib Ahmed ibn Hassan al Atas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was one of the great scholars of Al Bayt from the Ba'alawi, he had a certain attraction in unveiling for the books of Imam Anawi that he used to say that light would emerge from the books of Anawi. So if he could walk down the street, he would know from that light every house that had the book of Imam al Nawi in it. May Allah make us have such spiritual insight. The benefits there. So the Adhkar, Imam al Haddad, said this is a book that you should keep, you should have with you, and you should act according to what is in it. Mm. Now, your time from after the morning prayer until the sunrise should be divided between four types of spiritual work. One, supplication. Two, remembrance of glorification, which you can repeat on prayer reads. Three, recitation of the Quran. So here, you have the first one. You make different dua. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to start his dua with dhikr. And he would open it with Subhana Rabbi al Ali al A'la al Wahhab. And you should begin also with Salah al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then ask for your need. And then end your dua and your request with Salah al Nabi. So anytime you have Salah al Nabi in the beginning, and the salah ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the end, what is in between it will, answer, will be answered. That Allah will never reject things that are packaged with the salah ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to make your second weird, because you have a weird of du'at, I mean da'wat, you have a weird of du'as that you do, you have a weird of adhkar and tasbihat, that you do, and to use the subha, here you see Imam al-Ghazali mentioned this, that some may say it's an innovation, but it is a good innovation that will aid you in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you should keep that the innovations are those that are hasana and those that are sayya, those that are good and recommended, and those that are unlawful or bad innovations. Now, reflect upon your mistakes and sins. Did you hear? Oh, and you're weird of the Quran. And among those things that you should recite from the Quran, Al Fatiha, Ayatul Kursi, the end of Al Baqarah, you should have these as regu regular things you reflect, you recite from the Quran and reflect on their meanings. And you should have a weird of at tafakkur, pondering, reflecting on the greatness of Allah's attribute and his power and how he deals with his creation, you should reflect on those things. Now, Reflect upon your mistakes and sins and the shortcomings and deficiencies in your worship, in, in your worship of your master and how you have exposed yourself to Allah's painful punishment and his great anger. And you should think about that. Spend some time thinking about your mistakes and your sins and making a stick far for them and how you fall short in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we don't worship Allah the way we're supposed to we're not doing enough so we should reflect on that and by not doing enough 
and by committing sins, our bad deeds may be outweighing our good deeds. And by that, we're exposing ourselves to Allah's severe punishment and his anger and displeasure with us. So we should reflect with the thought of removing ourselves to diminishing the sins and increasing our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. Now go ahead. Organize your regular duties of worship for the entire day by means of careful planning in the hope of redeeming your past failings and shortcomings mm. and in the hope of guarding yourself by this means from exposure to the anger of Allah Almighty, most majestic during the day. So here, organize your time well, organize your acts of worship well, put yourself in a schedule so your time is not wasted because it is from not being organized that you get distracted. And every distraction you should consider a distancing yourself from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a drawing you closer to his punishment. So organize your time well. Look at your day and don't waste your time. Time is like a sword. If you do not cut with it, it will cut you. Don't waste your time. It's your most precious gift that you have for doing your acts of worship, for drawing closer to Allah is your time. One of those great scholars, someone came to him. They said, can I have a moment of your time? He said, can you stop the sun? <laughs> can you stop the sun? Meaning, I don't have time to waste. You know, that's how serious he was. Can you stop the sun? No, don't waste my time. As Sheikh Sam used to say to us all the time, we don't have plenty of time. We don't. We don't have plenty of time. And, and many people, there will be losers in the hereafter because they wasted their time. They didn't organize their time well. Now, go ahead. Make the intention of having good will, good will toward all Muslims and resolve that your entire day will be occupied only with obedience to Allah Muqai. Detail in your heart the acts of obedience of which you are capable. Then choose the best of them. Consider how to prepare the conditions to bring about such acts. And here, thinking about it, know what you're able to do. Know your abilities. And select from all of these different supplications and invocations and types of remembrance and acts of worship, that which is the most superior. So that you maximize your time with the best thing for that time. So you should know the acts of worship for each time. And hence, that's why books like Ihya, books like uh, Al-Adhkar al-Imam al nawawi they help you with these to know what you should be doing at each time. Uh, and these are books of practice for the day and the night. And have a great portion of your time for Al-Dhikr and Al-Fikr. For remembering and reflecting, remembering and reflecting. This will help you organize your acts of obedience. Now, inshallah, read this last paragraph or section. Go ahead. So you can occupy yourself with them. Do not neglect to reflect upon the nearness of your end, upon the approach of death that cuts short all hopes, upon the removal of matters from the domain of your free will and the possibility of reaching a state of sorrow and deep regret due to prolonged delusion. Here, keep in your mind, your death is close, it's coming. Your lifespan is going to end. Death is going to cut off all your hopes and desires. And you're not going to be under your own choice. So start to reflect on that. Because when you reflect on that, you'll maximize your time. Because I only have a little bit. And if I don't do good, I'm going to be in a state of regret on the day of judgment. So let me now work. Al-Yawm wa ghadan al Today's work, tomorrow's reckoning. Be prepared. Prepare yourself. And the way you prepare yourself the most is that you make your life about this deen. 
make Islam the most important thing in your life. Don't make this world your greatest concern. Make your religion your greatest concern. And make your world for your religion. So even if you're in your field, that time is not wasted. Right? If you read these types of books and you memorize these, uh, these different du'as and these forms of remembrance, even when you're working, your heart can be occupied while you're doing something. Right? So you're doing your work, but your heart is occupied with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Your mind is reflecting. You got to do something with your limbs, but your mind is reflecting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reflecting on beneficial things. And you would be a winner. Even in your work or in your career, you will find great benefit. It will be a source of drawing you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah tabarak wa ta'ala give us his mercy, grant us his forgiveness, Give us the deeds that will draw us closer to us and remove us from the deeds that will earn his displeasure. Rabbana atimna na nur na waqfilana inna kal kuri shayin qadir wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammadan wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'i. Tell me where. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. له النعمة وله فضل وله الثناء الحسن وصلوات الله بر الرحيم والملائكة المقربين على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Insha'Allah Ta'ala, we will continue with our study of this very beneficial text in Islamic spirituality written by Al-Imam Abu Hamid, Muhammad ibn Muhammad Al-Ghazali, Rahmatullah Alayh. And we're in the section of At-Ta'at, of Acts of Obedience. And we reached up to where the author, Rahimahullah, he said, there are 10 prayers that should be part of your litany of glorification and remembrance. So as we recall that Imam al-Ghazali was telling us to arrange our time. And one of the best ways to arrange your time is with a rod, with series of devotions. And among those devotions, which are easy, is to do a dhikr to do a series of adhkar with specific numbers that would benefit you. So Imam al-Ghazali, he mentions one of them, of these ten, and it is, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. لَهُ الْمُقْ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدِ يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتِ وَهُوَ حَيُّ لَا يَمُوتِ بِيَدِهِ الْخَيْرِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Which means there is no God but Allah alone who has no partner. His is the dominion and to him belong all praise. He gives life and gives death. And he is ever living. He is the ever living who never dies. And his yet is all good, and he has power over all things. And we mention this because when we say about the attributes of Allah, even though sometimes they are translated to say the hand, we should remember that the attributes of Allah Taala are never to take to be taken literal, in a way that ascribes Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to any of his creations. So some of the scholars, they gave the explanation that that means that all the good is under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second dhikr that he mentioned was la ilaha illallahu al-malikul haqqul mubin, 
which means there is no God but Allah, the sovereign, the true, the clarifier. Here, the meaning of al-Malik, meaning the one who possesses the dominion, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who has the power to bring everything into existence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who makes clear, as he is al-Mubin, he makes clear and manifests the sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path for whomever he wills for their guidance. And this is something we should always remember. So when we think about this dua, this dhikr, la ilaha illallah al-malik al-haq al-mubin, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make clear for us the sirat al-mustaqim. If Allah wants guidance for us, it is Him who is going to guide us to Sirat al Mustaqim. And we always pray in Al Fatiha, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. We ask Allah Ta'ala to guide us to the straight path. Then He mentions the third dhikr, which is La ilaha illallah al Wahid al Kahar. رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفَّارِ Which means, there is no God but Allah, the one, the conqueror, Lord of the heavens and the earth, and all that is in between, the magnificent, the forgiving. Al-Wahid, when we say about Allah, Al-Wahid, He is the one who cannot be divided. Why? Because as Imam al-Ghazali mentioned that Allah lays to be jisman, that Allah is not a body, so Allah cannot be divided. And there is no similitude, no likeness between him and anything else. As you were studying in your book Al-Aqidah Tahawiyah, you start to hear some of these things. And when we talk about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can see those names they indicate those attributes that you talked about. And Al-Kahar, it refers that nothing exists except that it is under the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Aziz is the one who overtakes everything. And Al-Ghafar, he's the one who covers all of our ugly deeds and sins. He puts a covering over us in this dunya. And it's something we should do for the others. That the one who covers the thoughts of his brother or sister Muslim in this dunya, Allah wa ta'ala would cover their thoughts on the day of judgment. Not only that, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers us and forgives us, He also will not take us to account in the hereafter. He would overlook and pardon. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to constantly overlook our thoughts and cover us and protect us from our own shortcomings. Then the fourth dhikr that Imam al-Ghazali mentions Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar, wa la hawla, wa la quwata illa billahi la liyul azim. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned about this, that to say subhanallah, and alhamdulillah, and la ilaha illallah, and allahu akbar, it is more beloved to him than everything on which the sun rises upon. It's much more beloved to him. And that is to say, glory be to Allah, all praise is to Allah, there is no God but Allah, and Allah is the great, and there is no power, no might, except by Allah, the high, the mighty. These are very intense adhkar, that if we use them, there would be great benefit. And the fifth dhikr uh, that he mentioned, Subuhun Quddusun Rabbul Malaikati Wal Ruh. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, that Allah, he said about Allah, all glorious, all holy, Lord of the angels and of the spirit. And the sixth uh, dhikr that he mentioned, Subhanallah al-Azim wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah al-Azim wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah al-Azim. Al-Azim, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has the highest level of magnificent. One cannot imagine him with one's intellect, nor one's inward sight can get the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one who says, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, it is mentioned that there would be a tree planted for him in paradise. So one should be planting, right? Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah wa bihamdi. Constantly having a big garden in Al Jannah. And the seventh uh, dhikr Astaghfirullah al Azim, Alladhi la ilaha illa wa al Hayyul Qayyum, wa as'alahu tawbata wal ma'rifa. That is, to say, I seek forgiveness of Allah, the mighty, apart from whom there is no God, the ever-living, the self-subsistent, and I ask him to accept my repentance and grant me forgiveness. And that is to seek forgiveness and protection from the sins. Here's something that you should remember. We are constantly, knowingly, and sometimes unknowingly, falling into sins. Just by the custom in our country, sins are so prevalent. And you should be constantly asking Allah to forgive you for the sins. And you should put those sins in categories. Sins of the eye, sins of the ear, sins of the hand, sins of the feet, sins of the tongue. So that you start to recognize what limb is committing what sin. And a lot of the scholars, they wrote about the sins of the body and the different organs so that you would focus in on that. And then you would put a protection on each one of your limbs and ultimately over your whole body. So even when one gaze, one is conscious, what are the sins of the eye? What am I looking at? What am I ordered to refrain from looking at? And what am I looking at? And then seek stick far for that. Seek forgiveness for the unlawful things that I looked at my eyes. Or what I heard with my ears or what I said with my tongue, for example. Or where my feet walked. Or where my hand extended to. Then he put the eighth dhikr. اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معطي لما لما منعت ولا رد لما قضيت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد. And this is an important dhikr, and we do it every time after the prayer. So you should have these adhkar that we have after the prayer here in Maqasid. He said, O oh Allah, none can withhold what you bestow, and none can bestow with, with what you withhold. And there is none to repel what you ordained, and the fortunate of, and the fortune of any one, any who possesses fortune, will in no way avail them against you. The tenth one, which is Salah ala Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad which is, O oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. And you should remember this every time you make salah on the Prophet from that one salah, 
the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah will send on you 10. So every time. And the one who would be closest to the Prophet Sallallahu on the day of judgment is the one who sends the most salah on him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned that hadith, the one who is a miser is the one whom the Prophet Sallallahu is mentioned in front of him and he doesn't make salah or salam on him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the last of the ten, Bismillah alladhi la yadhuru ma asmihi shayun fi al-ardi wa la fi al-samai wa huwa al-samiyu al-alim. Which is, in the name of Allah, by whose name nothing on earth and nothing in heaven can cause him harm, can cause harm, and he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. And here, one should know that with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is complete protection. And you should constantly have the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a protection for yourself. Even it is related about Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu that one time they had a, an, a place around it and they were behind a fortress and they would not let the Muslims enter that city. And they said, you cannot enter the city until your leader drinks poison. Just want to kill him. That poison was brought to Sayyiduna Khalid ibn Walid. And he said, Bismillah. And he drank it. It didn't harm him. And they entered and they took the city. So the ulama, they said that if you use Bismillah, with something that is unlawful, with the intention of being protected from the harm of that thing, then this is permissible and this would happen with Khalid ibn Walid. Other than that, it would be wrong to do, to seek blessings and do something that is harmful from Bismillah. But to seek protection was what he was doing. So Imam al-Ghazali, he said, repeat each of these prayers on your prayer beads a hundred times or seventy times or ten times this being the minimum, so that the total will be 100. Here, making these up to 100, is a great benefit and to do him to it adds up to 100 there is a blessing in that because each word of those of car in and of itself has its own merit but you have the option to do them frequently as Imam al-Ghazali mentioned then Imam al-Ghazali he said read this lanty regularly and do not talk before the sun rises. In other words, you should stick to these adhkar. And the important thing is to do them consistently. As our teachers mentioned, to do a deed, even if it's little, consistently, is better to do that deed in abundance, inconsistently. So don't break, right? Don't interrupt these adhkar, but keep it as a habit for yourself. Because over time, the adhkar have its spiritual benefit. Uh, it states in a narration, it is superior to freeing 80 slaves of the descendants of Ismail. This refers to occupying oneself with remembrance until sun rises without speaking between them. Then the author, no, we go forward. 
He said, know this well, and you will be divinely guided if Allah most high wills. Tell you. Then the author, he talks about the manners that comes after sunrise until midday, zawal, when the sun is at its highest point, which is before dhuhr. So you have your morning activities, and this is an important aspect of your act of worship, what you do in the morning. Once the morning comes, you've made your wudu, you've made your uh, voluntary prayers before al-fajr, the sunnah, raka al-fajr, you've went to the masjid, you've done all those adhkar, you've prayed the prayer of the imam, and now, what should you engage in after that? The sun is coming up. What should you engage in? He says, when the sun rises and is a spear's length above the horizon, pray two rakas. And these two rakas, Siratul Ishraq. And Imam uh, Muhammad al-Jawi said, you can make this with the niyyah of Salatul Ishraq, Ishraq or the intention of Salatul Duha. But you can pray it as Ishraq and then another of Duha, and as he's going to mention, this is when the dislike time for the prayer expires. For it is dislike to perform voluntary prayers after the obligatory prayers of the, min, of the morning prayer until the sun reaches this height. So there's two raka you can pray there. Then when the sun is high and about a quarter of the day has elapsed, perform the forenoon prayer, which is Salatul Duha, right? Four or six, or eight rakats in twos. And the Salat Duha is an extremely important prayer. To pray it in eight rakats is the most superior and the maximum amount that should be prayed according to the Sunnah, to pray that. Meaning after every two raka, you salam out. And what is recited in it, in the first raka after you recite al-Fatiha, you do washams, washamsi wa duhaha, right? The complete surah. And then in the second, after al-Fatiha, you recite surah al-duha. So surah al-shams in the first, and surah al-duha in the second. It is also saying that you can recite Al-Kafirun in the first and Al-Ikhlas in the second. Allah. As-Salatul Duha, the student of knowledge, or the servant who's really striving towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should never leave them out. You should make them, these are Important prayers. So yesterday we mentioned some, right? For the morning, Salatul Duha. Do not miss it. When you have your break, make sure you pray it. And start out small before you try to do the maximum. Because whatever you want to do, you want to maintain it, right? If you have high energy and you can maintain the complete amount or the maximum amount or the optimal amount, then do it. But our teachers should say, if you don't perform two of these uh, sunnah confirmed prayers, they said, like, don't show your face in the morning, right? If you didn't pray the Qiyam al-Layl, 
and you don't do Salat al-Duha, so don't consider yourself student of knowledge. Almost be, almost like, he said, be ashamed of yourself, even ashamed to show your face, because the sign of that will be written on your face. That the knowers of Allah, they say this one didn't pray for Qiyam uh, al or Al-Duha. Those who have kashf unveiling, they can see that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to perform all of those things which are recommended by the sunnah. He said, all of these numbers have been related on the authority from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa All prayer is good. If one wants, he may perform more. If one wants, he may perform less. So, you prayed your prayers. He said, other than this, there is no other daily sunnah prayer between sunrise and midday. So, your, your catch is to stick to the sunnah. So you had Salatul Ishraq, Salatul Duha, you've made your prayers. Now what else can you engage in? He said, whatever time you have left after it, you should spend it in one of four ways. So the first is in seeking knowledge. Allah, seeking knowledge. That's the first thing. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, طَلِبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim. And whoever Allah wills good for them, is going to give them the understanding of the deen. So this is something you should engage in. He said, number one, seeking useful knowledge. The first way and the best is to spend your time seeking beneficial knowledge in religion. Ilm al nafi Ilm al nafi beneficial knowledge. And we should seek, because the memory made the dua, the Prophet made the dua. Oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge and deeds that are accepted and lawful sustenance. Three things, right? So here, what is beneficial knowledge. So Imam al-Ghazali, he's going to tell us. Not, he said, seeking beneficial knowledge in religion, not marriage of second, not matters of secondary importance to which many people devote themselves and call knowledge. Useful knowledge, beneficial knowledge, and that sh is more important than doing regular acts of worship. So if you have to do different types of ibadah, seeking knowledge is more superior. It has priority over that, right? Seeking beneficial knowledge comes first. He said that it is that which is increases your fear of Allah most high. Number one, it is that which increases your fear of Allah and increases your insight into your own defects. And we should consider by evaluating ourselves. Learning the religion will make you realize where you're falling short. So you start to count your own defects. And Al Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir mentioned about that because sometimes we don't realize we are deficient. He said, the true perfected person. Right, is the one who sees within himself nothing but defects and sees in everyone else nothing but perfect attributes, perfections. And the one who is deficient is the one who sees all states of perfection within himself and all flaws in other people. SubhanAllah. So we should see ourselves as naqis, falling short, and then work to remove all our blameworthy aspects. And beneficial knowledge will help you with that. And increases your knowledge of how to worship Allah Almighty, most majestic. Increase your knowledge 
of how to worship Allah. Inwardly and outwardly. What is not only the outward way you should worship Allah properly by fulfilling conditions related to acts of worship and, and maintaining the integrals and avoiding the invalidators, but also what is the state of the heart in the act of worship. So you notice when you read the books of Ibn Ghazali, he's talking about the courtesies and manners and the etiquette of your act of worship. Not just how to perform it, but the states that you should have when you're doing it. It reduces your yearning for this world. Right? How many hadith have we studied so far to tell us that this dunya is not worth so much? That other things are much more superior to that. And the one who doesn't yearn so much for the world, it is hoped that the opposite will be from that his yearning would be for the akhirah. Right? And the akhirah is better and more abiding. And he said, increasing your yearning for the hereafter and opens your eyes to the things that spoil you your worship so you may guard against them. And it lays bare to you the schemes of shaitan, his deceit and his misleading of the evil scholars until he succeeds in exposing them to the aversion and wrath of Allah Almighty, most majestic, through their use of religion for worldly gains, their employment of knowledge to acquire wealth from the powers that be, their consumption of the wealth of endowments and of the orphans and the poor, and they're directing all their energy throughout the day to attaining prestige and a place in the hearts of people. This forces them into a state of ostentation, disputation, rivalry, and boastfulness. Here, Imam al-Ghazali talks about evil scholars, which are scholars of this world. And he didn't consider a real scholar except that he was talking about the scholar of the hereafter. The scholar whose knowledge is used as a means to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you see in yourself, even as a student, these qualities that you're learning and you wonder how the learning is going to benefit you in the dunya, and this is a sign that it's not good for you. And you should know it's a trick from the shaitan. But among the tricks of shaitan that you should watch is that shaitan works on you by levels. And for instance, one of the things that shaitan does is to get you to be lazy in performing the optional deeds, the extra sunnah things. Like one of the things you should keep, keep a barrier between yourself and your obligations by doing the voluntary deeds. Because the human being will naturally get lazy, right? This is human nature. We get tired. We get bored. But if you're in the habit of always doing extra acts of worship, when you get tired, when you get a little lazy, it won't go into your obligations. But if you don't have this barrier, he comes straight to your obligations. Be careful from doing too much excess of the merely licit things, the permissible things. Because if he can get you to do a lot of that, it's easy to get you to do the dislike things. And if he gets you in the habit of doing dislike things, the next step is to get you to do unlawful things. So always watch how shaitan is tricking you through those matters. And here, he mentions things that the scholars go to when they start, the evil scholars, we the scholars of this world, when they start to engage too much in seeking knowledge for the world, it produces diseases like ostentation. So we should watch this, showing off for others. And try your best to conceal your good deeds, unless you intend by that to benefit someone else. But in general, keep your deeds between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And don't fall into a lot of arguing and disputation. Because a lot of people, they learn to argue. They want to go refute. That's not the purpose of learning knowledge. And this is, students often fall into that. Many, 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 we know they're going overseas. Like, what are you going overseas for? I want to study this, I want to study this, and I'm going to be. And then to here, I'm going to better myself. I'm going to work on my heart. I'm going to learn to come back and benefit the creation. I want to be said about such and such. I'm going to be such. And this is what Imam Ghazali is pointing to. Be careful about that. The sincere person, knowledge is abundant everywhere you go. Wherever you at, if you want to learn, it's available. Be diligent and you will learn the same thing. Knowledge is not in one location, right? So be careful why you're going to seek certain things. If it is knowledge, they used to say that one should not travel to learn in another place to they have exhausted the knowledge that is available in their location. Imagine if we did that. Like we would stay to where we have teachers. We exhaust them. They say, I have nothing else to give you. You have to go find another teacher. They ex we exhaust from them. And this is a part of your sincerity in seeking knowledge. Unless there's a specific benefit that one is going from, to seek from a specific teacher. But be careful of your intention and while you're learning, why, you're, why you are learning. Then he said, we have compiled the details of this category on beneficial knowledge in the revival of the religious sciences. And you have the Ihya al of Imam al-Ghazali and the book of knowledge is translated. Uh, noun available in English. You should have it as your beneficial reading material. Because especially as a student, you want to know the pitfalls of knowledge as well as its, as well as its benefits. Because you're in the aspect of seeking knowledge. And you're spending a lot of time and you don't want to lose the value of that time or the benefit of that time or the reward that is related to the time you're spending seeking knowledge. Then he continued, he said, if you are of those worthy of it, go seek it and act by it. Then teach it and invite others to it. For whoever realizes this, acts upon it and invites others to it, will be called great in the dominion of the heavens, according to the testimony of Jesus, alayhi salam. Allah. Here, this if you are among his people, meaning the people of beneficial knowledge, seek it. How do you seek it? By learning it from its people. Very important. Knowledge is taken from its people. As Allah said, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Knowledge is taken, and, and this benefit I mentioned to you, sitting at the feet of a teacher, learning from his statements and his states, or her statements or her states. Then act according to it. Act on your knowledge. Then teach it to people, and then go give da'wah. So you have, first of all, make yourself worthy of seeking knowledge. Put yourself in the state that you're sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then go acquire it. Then act according. Then teach it to others.
So the person who learns that knowledge, beneficial knowledge, and acts according to it. Why? Because we said knowledge is to do what? Yes, we're talking to me. Yes, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Knowledge is to, no, to practice. In the al-ilmu lil amal, right? To practice it. So you should act according to it, right? And the person who does that, that person will be called great in the dominion of the heavens, the upper worlds. Great Avim. And that's what it said. Man alima wa amila wa alama fa dhalik yud'a azimin fi malakut as-samawat. That is the narration from Jesus. Whoever learns, practices, teaches, that person is called great in the dominion of the heavens. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever teaches a section of knowledge or learns rather a section of knowledge and teaches it to the people, that person would be given the reward of 70 of the sincere people. SubhanAllah. You learn the knowledge, you teach it, right? You'll get the reward of 70 of the sincere Siddiq people, MashaAllah. Then the author said, if you achieve this all and complete the reformation of yourself outwardly and inwardly and sometimes to you, remains to you, then you may occupy yourself in the study of a school of jurisprudence. So that in this way, you may learn the less common rulings concerning worship and how to mediate between conflicting parties when they are occupied with their lowly desires. These duties are the completion of all the essential mentioned, all the essentials mentioned, are also among the communal obligations. So here you have levels. You have your level of knowledge that you need for yourself, your personal obligatory knowledge, and that's first. That knowledge which is far ayn upon you, you must learn that first. Do not occupy yourself with something that is not obligatory for yourself while neglecting that which is obligatory for yourself. So as Imam al-Ghazali mentions, the learning about the knowledge that's refining the heart and correcting your outward and inward, but also you must learn the outward aspects of the sacred law through a school of jurisprudence, learning the halal and the haram. And then once you learn your personal obligations, then you step in to fulfilling or aiding in fulfilling communal obligations. The scholars, they said, whoever is occupied with the obligations in such a way that they cannot do the optional deeds, then this person is excused, right? So the person is occupied with obligations, and then it cannot do all of the recommended matters, then this person is excused. But the one who is occupied with optional matters while neglecting the obligatory matters upon them, that person is sinful. So make sure you take care of your obligations. Learn what is far upon you, what you have to do. Then add to that the optional deeds. Remember the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that was mentioned uh, as the hadith Qudsi where the, Allah subhanahu, the Prophet said that Allah said, my servant will not draw closer to me with anything more beloved to me than that which I made an obligation upon him. Then they will keep doing the optional deeds to I love him. So this is something that you should keep in your mind. He said, however, if your lower self asks you to leave off the lanties and remembrances, we have detailed earlier, due to your occupation with these duties, then know that Satan, the accursed, has injected into your heart the hidden illness 
love of prestige and wealth. And what will help you with doing that is to keep doing things diligently, even if little, and keep it every day. That's the part of a weird, is to keep you doing something every day, every day, every day. Keep your weird. Be aware of being deceived by this, becoming a laughing stock for him and being brought to destruction after which he will mock you. Insha'Allah, we will stop here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us success in all of our acts of worship. And may Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala make us winners in this world and the hereafter. ربنا اتمن لنا نورنا وقف لنا انك كل شيء قدير ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد تهديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب صلى الله عليه وسلم